Okay, I think we should be streaming live again. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the interruption. Um, we're very happy to be streaming now on our partner platform, partners platforms. Um, we apologize for the slow, bumpy start to this conference. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and on again very quickly. On and I organized this conference. Um, for this year, following up after last year's virtual conference at Save Ancient Studies Alliance. Anne earned her PharmD from the University of Connecticut in 2010 and her master's in Egyptology from the University of Manchester in 2021. She's been a part of SASA since 2021. I myself, um, my name is David Danzig. I earned my PhD from the Institute of the Study of the Angel World just two, three months ago. Wonderful feeling. And I started SAS about two and a half years ago and Things have been going really, really well. Um, now I'll turn it over to Anne for a minute, and then I'll just give a little introduction to how this conference is supposed to work. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the issues with the live streaming earlier, but I want to thank everyone for joining us this weekend for our second annual virtual conference, Opening the Ancient World. Um, the topic of this year's conference is Who Has the Power? Leaders and Leadership in the Ancient World. And since we have all experienced the increased attention focused on leadership positions around the world, this weekend's conference will examine this subject in ancient times to shed uh, light on the present. And over the next two days, we're excited to welcome, in addition to our three keynote speakers, 13 presenters who would talk about leaders and leadership in different areas of the ancient world. And I just also wanted to announce that we are having an upcoming publication of the proceedings of last year's conference. And you can check out the title page and table of contents on our virtual conference page below the conference chat box today. And back to you, David. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, I just wanna give everybody a rundown of how the conference is going to work. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see um, the schedule and I'll explain how things are going to run. There are three types of sessions at our virtual conference. One is our regular presenters sessions where presenters give academic presentations on the ancient world, um, all related to the theme of leadership. Um, we're in the middle of one right now and we're sorry for interrupting. Um, the other type of session are keynote sessions where we have an accomplished um, scholar in a field of ancient studies who's also going to present specifically on their work related to leaders and leadership. And then we have special sessions. Um, we have two later today and one tomorrow that are going to be discussions about specific issues in ancient studies. One is about um, community building, that's a round table where people in the Zoom will join us in, in their, the Zoom that we're currently in. And we're all gonna have a conversation about how we can help build our community of ancient studies scholars in all directions. And then there will be one later about um, inspirational um, independent scholars, and we'll be learning about how they've managed to balance their life, work, and scholarship all together. And then there will be a third tomorrow that will be a discussion about different publishers, and they'll be telling us how people can publish in all different types of forum at different levels. Um, we're going to get back right back to the conference now. I'm going to ask John to say hello. And John Haberstrow, who's our moderator, he just received his doctorate from the University of Riverside, University of California at Riverside, and he is now starting a position at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Thank you, John. All right. Thanks so much, David. And uh, welcome back, everyone. And uh, we are here in our first panel of our SASA virtual conference on community leadership. And we just heard a presentation from George Longley on ancient Greek political theory. And now we're going to turn to our second presentation uh, by Barbara Alexandra Anisepto. And um, uh, Barbara uh, has always been passionate about history and has a deep desire to understand women's roles throughout historical ages uh, and specifically in, uh, in Greek antiquity. As a result of this passion, she has decided to work uh, on research and teaching uh, once uh, she recognized the importance of both. 
She is looking forward to uh, this presentation today and uh, is going to enlighten us all on her paper entitled, Did Greek Women Have a Leading Voice? A Gender Discussion on Female Roles in Classical Athens. And uh, the floor is now yours, Barbara. Thank you so much, John, for the presentation. I'm really happy to be here. I'd like to thank all SASA members as well for this amazing opportunity. I'm really happy to be here to be able to share my research whilst learning from all the amazing uh, talks and roundtables that will be presented. Uh, everybody's seen my screen, I believe. So uh, the presentation that I prepared today, one second, let me see if I'm seeing it properly. The presentation that I prepared let me do it like this. Okay, now it's, it's good. Uh, whose title is, Did Greek Women Have a Leading Voice? A Gender Discussion on Female Roles in Classical Athens is a part of my doctorate research. I'm currently finishing my PhD. So what I'm about to share with you all is a partial result of my work, which I have been conducting for the past three years and a half at Sao Paulo State University, under the supervision of Professor Margarida Maria de Carvalho. Today, I chose to address the female roles in classical Athens with close attention to that of the Guiné or Gamete, what we translate as the citizen's wife, as you can see from here. Let me see if I can share properly one second. Yeah, no, let me do it like this. There we go. So here we have both terms, guiné or gamete. I have been working on gender issues in the classical Athenian society since my master's, during which I examined Aristophanes' depiction of married women, married Greek women. Back then, I aimed to understand the political and social reasons that led the comic writer to depict in his plots women in such an active position. The explanation I came upon the most held by the Greek historiography from the 19th century until the mid 20th claimed that Aristophanes positioned powerful women in a leading role exclusively to cause laughter in the male audience. Not only do I differ from this perspective, but I also perceive a positive portrayal of legitimate wives in Aristophanic comedies. So by analyzing three of his plays from a gender angle, a gender perspective, and here we have the, the female plays written by Aristophanes. So Lysistrata, Thesmophoria Susai, and Assembly Women. I was able to comprehend the close connections among married women, the polis, and the Athenian democracy. In pursuance of expanding our frames of reference regarding the possibilities of women's leadership, and most precisely what this leadership could actually mean, especially towards their own bodies, in my PhD, I'm connecting Aristophanic textual evidence with the Hippocratic medical treatises. So here, we can take a look at the female treatises, or as we call gynecological ones. Let me do it like this so you can see. Of the nearly 60 treatises which compose the so-called Corpus Hippocraticum, 10 focus on female issues, which means that a quarter, I want to call attention to that, a quarter of the collection involves women's affairs. The texts are, as you can see, on generation, on nature of the child, on diseases of women one and two, on nature of women on barrenness, on diseases of girls or on the virgins, on superfetation, on the seven-month infant, on the eight-month infant, and on excision of the fetus. These treatises offer us a detailed account of women's bodies, nature, and lives. Alongside medical theorizations and treatments, 
I identify through physicians' descriptions, as we shall see soon, social situations in which we find the presence of wives, sexual appetite during intercourse. So I mean, they, they are here, as we can see the main points. And um, the wisdom they shared regarding the physiological processes experienced by their bodies. This is very interesting to see in our uh, documental corpus, such as menstruation and the conception of children and also the domain over certain gender expectations cast to their role as women, namely the will or not to become pregnant. Investigating both testimonies, my purpose is to set how the female body was physiologically and culturally conceived in Athens in the fifth and fourth centuries BC particularly in its relation to women's sexual experiences. Thus, I argue, married women could, in fact, have had a much more significant impact on society than we might have expected at first sight. They were capable of perceiving the intimate relation among their bodily wisdom, sexual reproduction, and their civic status as married women and could have used the social combination to their advantage, along with the policies, by subverting the meaning of bearing a child. So, before diving into the textual evidence, I'm going to proceed with a brief background on Aristophanes and Hippocrates. Although my primary concern lies in Athens, it is important to remember, as we shall see, here on the maps. So here in red, we have all the Greek colonies. And I'm calling attention to Kos and Kinidus. So it's important to remember, to bear in mind, that ancient medicine did not start in Athens. Hippocrates was born on the ancient island of Kos, where medicine first came to be. Along with another Greek colony, Nidos, or in ancient Greek, Kinidos, he and other physicians gave life to the movement of teaching and broadcasting medicine through other ancient Greek cities, such as Athens. As we can see on the maps, these cities were quite distant. So we can see them here, Kos, Kiridos, and Athens is here. They were quite uh, distant, but Hippocratic physicians managed to spread medicine because a large part of them traveled through the Mediterranean. Born at the, at the time of democratic consolidation as a political system in 450 BC, Aristophanes witnessed several historical shifts in the Athenian polis. In 443 BC, seven years after the birth of the comic writer, Pericles became a strategos, a state leader. At the age of 19, the young poet witnessed the beginning of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, which would later form the backdrop to Lysistrata. A keen observer and a rather outspoken critic, Aristophanes documented the troubled political landscape that formed Athens during the classical age. By assembling philosophical, religious, legal, public, and private information close to Athenian political, social, and cultural life, I understand Aristophanic references as a comic and historical allegory of daily situations. The fictional circumstances displayed by Aristophanes in his female comedies are based on concrete exchanges of everyday life in the city exchanges carried out between Greek married women and their husbands. His female characters correspond to a greater or lesser extent, of course, to wives, slaves, concubine, prostitutes, mothers and daughters, that is, to collectives that were part of the civic relations in Athens, as well as in other polis. Thus, 
when I consider that Aristophanic work as a part of my documentary corpus. I conceive his theatrical propositions as, his, as historical testimony. I certainly do not consider his female plots as a faithful depiction of the social reality he was embedded in, but as a theatrical and critical view of the ongoing gender relations in which he was simultaneously a spectator himself and a central figure, both as an Athenian man and as a playwright. Moving on to the Hippocratic collection, I also find important to note, so here as we can see the, the cities together, Athens, Cos, and Cnidus, and here Cos and Cnidus. Actually, Cnidus or Nidus is not an island, it is a peninsula, right? As we can see from here. So I find it important to note that Hippocratic collection represents the combined effort of many authors who dedicated themselves to registering and broadcasting their methodological, nosological, and pharmacological discoveries, as well as formulating and establishing what medicine was, especially from the point of view of an expanding medical community in the Greek cities of the fifth and fourth centuries BC. These Hippocratic discoveries were at the core of political, economical, and cultural changes the polis and colonies were facing, thus contributing to creating new perspectives on Hellenic culture. One example of these significant changes, which directly correlate with married women, is precisely the leading representation of them by Aristophanes and Hippo Hippocrates, as we shall see. Based on these considerations, I believe that one of the main crossroads between Aristophanic comedy and Hippocratic treatises lies in women's sexual behavior, specifically of married women, which were grounded in a specific bodily wisdom and desires that they share at different times. The physicians and the comic writer were able to capture and represent such behaviors. So, although I recognize the existence of a very well-established female pattern that pervaded women's social lives, what scholars call the good wife model, rooted in Simonides de Amorgos' iambic poetry from the seventh century BC, I also perceive how, Arist how Aristophanes and the Hippocratic physicians show us women who were an exception to the rule. More importantly, not only could these women be an exception, but also there could have been actual gaps between this female pattern and daily activities concerning how wives conducted their personal yet communal affairs. As we can see from this slide. So there is a distance here which I wanna grasp. In her well-known work, Women's Bodies in Classical Greek Science, Leslie Dean Jones states that the fulfillment of becoming a mother entirely shaped Greek women's experiences, since it was what society demanded from them. And again, although this statement is perfectly accurate, we, as women of nowadays and as scholars, must do the historical exercise of transporting ourselves to that age to grasp the importance of childbearing due to our social and political achievements in the past years. The idea of bearing a child and getting married as the highest accomplishment of our lives, accomplishment of our lives may seem reductionist or even oppressive. But we must note that being a mother in ancient Athens was not just about motherhood itself, nor was it about the private and intimate feeling of discovering a new self-identity. It was mainly about sustaining the community and the polis. I believe legitimate wives were fully aware of the public and political power they held, as we can verify from this Lysistrata passage. So for the sake of the time, I'm not gonna read the whole passage, but I highlighted the main points here. 
The first comedy in ancient Greek theater to show a female lead character, Liz Strata addresses women's unhappiness with the continuity of the military conflict between Athens and Sparta with the Peloponnesian War, which, according to the wives in the play, stemmed from the city's mismanagement, mismanagement from this male mismanagement, based on sexual renunciation and on taking off the Acropolis, where men kept the public treasury, they demanded an end to the Peloponnesian War. In this, pa in this passage, she turns, she, like the, the whole uh, group of women, women's chorus, turns their speech straight to all the Athenian citizens. So they say, cities of Athens. In ancient Greek, we have the expression, Pantes astoi. So you can see here, Pantes astoi. And in doing so, the character is actually speaking to the male audience who were attending the Lenaia festival, who were at the theater. It is the poet himself who is addressing his public. And he consciously decided to speak his mind about the war theme through women namely married women. Why did he do so? It seems to me that Aristophanes, Aristophanes chose to enunciate women's positive and essential role in the city rather than corroborate their supposed inferiority. We visualize those women placing themselves as counselors because they say, let's see. We begin by offering the city valuable advice. When they state this, and so they, they place themselves as counselors. And we can also see that the legitimacy to make their statement lies chiefly on motherhood. After announcing she will advise both men and the police, she concludes her thought, she, women's girls, with the ultimate reason. I have a stake in our community. My contribution is men. In ancient Greek, we have the sentence, as we can see here, kai gar andras esfero, with the verb esfero in, it, in its active use, which indicates put forward for consideration. A political meaning underlies the verb, which correlates to Lysistrata's public display. She is responsible for bringing a new citizen into the world. Equally important, important for advising men on crucial topics regarding police maintenance. Pericles proposed the law of citizenship transmission. And one year later, this law was approved. As a consequence of the law, women became a critical element in the definition of citizenship alongside men. Applicable since the middle of the 15th century BC, the decree established that only those born to Athenian fathers and mothers would be citizens, would be considered citizens. Thus, the comic wives depicted by Aristophanes are those who, in everyday life, also held the responsibility for this proper reproduction, this political reproduction. Hence, although the primary motivation of the law was not to appraise women. I believe its application contributed over time to create a favorable view of women's participation in the citizenship granting process. When we consider the temporal distance between the decree and the Aristophanic place, we can see in this hiatus, the construction and consolidation of a political logic that started to include wives as a key element of a man's civic identity. The little boy who was just born would be an Athenian, would be considered an Athenian only if his mother was too. It is not far-fetched to assume that the law was conducive to, even if unintentionally, social importance to legitimate wives. In analyzing the comic heroism of 
all Aristophanes' plays, Cedric Whitman explain, explains that the female characters' actions come from their feminine universe. I share the author's idea when he argues that the heroine tactically uses her feminine attributes and her social place to mobilize women and end the war, because this is what subverting motherhood means. They draw their leading voice from the social experience of maternity. When we turn to the Hippocratic evidence, the existence of a shared and safe space where women could build their bodily wisdom and use it when necessary becomes even clearer. So let me show you another passage. In the treatise on generation, the author is discussing the effects of pleasure on men and women's bodies. At one point, he describes how, in his medical perspective, conception physio physio physiologically works. Again, I'm not going to read everything, only the main points. The author says that the women, or the woman here, will become pregnant if this is what she intends. And the terminology here comes from the ancient Greek, Ethelo. Seek a closer look, Ethelo, which presents an idea of wanting, desiring, being willing to, consenting to. Thus, it points to the manifestation of women's desire from which we can infer the presence or not of the female's will to conceive. This passage shows us the woman's intention to conceive a child at the moment of intercourse and leads us to understand that this decision dependent on her will, if not exclusive, at least a little. Also, according to the medical explanation, the uterus, would possess the ability to close itself after receiving the seeds of the man and the woman for the sake of conception, as we can see here. He states, for the uterus on receiving the seed and closing holds it inside itself as its mouth contracts in response to the moisture. In my point of view, the belief in this uterine movement would be directly connected to the plausibility of women's choices regarding pregnancy. In addition, the passage also points out the women's wisdom concerning their own body and their explicit knowledge about the menstruation cycle once, as we can also see, and if the woman is experienced in giving birth and notices when the seed does not come out, but remains inside her, she will know on which day she has conceived. It is important to mark that although the Hippocratic collection was written by men, and they often display their male perspectives on the female body, they were also based on female oral tradition. Both scholars, Aline Husserl and Anne Ellis Hansen, draw attention to the presence of what they call the experienced woman, as we have just seen in the gynecological texts, which we, just have, we have just seen from one of the, the passages here. Both scholars suggest that this aspect, among many others, of course, may indicate medical deference towards women's authority on their bodies. Aristophanes and Hippocrates lived in the same historical period and on the same cultural grounds. I believe the playwright drew many of his comic propositions from actual married women's lives, and the same did the Hippocratics with regard to the knowledge, knowledge they shared and taught throughout Greece. Alongside this, women could choose whether to have a child depending on their, will, on their will or when to have a child. Although the comic characters are not real, they were built from common women 
who were a fundamental part of the city. Ultimately, without legitimate wives, there would not be a police because they held the responsibility of bearing not only a male child, but a future citizen. On the other hand, this power could have led them to display a leading voice, perhaps politically, by speaking their minds regarding city's affairs among each other, perhaps with their husbands, and perhaps sexually, so a leading voice towards sexuality, by gaining experience from childbirth and by recognizing the power they had in their hands. That's it. Thank you so much for listening to me. All right, a, a virtual round of applause for, for Barbara. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to um, pose any questions that you might have uh, on your, on your uh, streaming uh, location of choice. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'll ask a question to get us started. Um, so Aristophanes' Lysistrata is one of my favorites, and, and it's just such a, it's such a farce, the whole thing, right? Because of the, and especially with regard to the way that the men are portrayed, right? They are portrayed as like slaves to their desires and they, and they can't help but have these sexual urges and things like that. So, you know, arguably Aristophanes is making fun of men for that. On the flip side, women are, are seen as the kind of the leaders um, and they're, they've organized this sex strike against the men. Um, and so in many ways, their role in society can be seen as inverted, right? So the men are being inverted and the, men, the women are being inverted. So how much of the, do you think in your, in your scholarly opinion, how much do you think that Aristophanes is simply playing with the idea of, of inverting social roles and, um, and, and using that as a critique on the kind of uh, leadership in the city and whatnot? Um, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense. It makes. Thank you so much for the question, John. Uh, so I believe he's definitely reinforcing the social boundaries, you know. He, he, he doesn't, it's not his intention to deeply question uh, Athenian society um, regarding women. And that's precisely why he positioned women as uh, childbearing, you know, like th their main role is to bear a child, is to politically and publicly contribute with men. But I argue, and, and you mentioned something very important, he, he represents men as slaves to their own desire. And we know that, or at least as historians, we would expect that this would not happen because men would have um, relationships with their concubine or their like or prostitutes. So the sexual strike, um, it's not about sexual relationships per se, you know, it's about what women rep represent. If they do not conceive, there will be not a police. Right, especially because of uh, uh, Pericles' law. So I believe he's portraying women in a positive way, but not in such a positive way that could lead Athenian society or the Greeks to um, a revolution, for example, you know, something like this. Right. But definitely um, calls attention to women's positive impact. In my, in my point of view. I don't know if I answered you properly. No, no, you, you did wonderfully. Um, yeah, it just, it makes me think of um, uh, in Herodotus's histories uh, where Xerxes says that uh, in response to uh, Artemisia, uh, that, that, his, that his women have become men and his men have become women. And it's just this, again, this inversion. Um, uh, but the inversion is not criticizing the female, it's criticizing the male. Do you know what I mean? So exactly. it, it, mm -hmm. that's it. And, and he, he consciously um, 
chooses to do this with women, you know, this is very precious because as historians, I feel that we have been um, actually reinforcing Greek women's inferiority, you know, by saying, oh, women were inferior, they were considered inferior. So the only plausible, plausible motive for him to add leading women would be to make men laugh, you know, would be the, but actually he's criticizing the men. We have several passages in Liz Estrada, for Assembly Women, where the, the female characters explicitly say, if we rule the city, things would be much better. You know, they, they say this. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And I just want to also <laughs> convey the, the thanks to our viewers who are saying thank you so much uh, all over the chat. So, um, so thank you very much, Barbara. And next, we will turn to our third and final presenter of this panel, uh, Ronald Clark. Uh, and uh, Ron, feel free to, to join uh, the screen here. I'm here. OK. That's the wrong thing. I'll need to share screen. Yeah. Barbara, if you could. Um, Stop sharing your screen. Of course, just one second, because one second. I don't have access anymore. One second. Ah, there we go. Ah, okay, great. All right, thank mm -hmm. you so much. All right, so um, again, our third and final speaker is uh, Ron Clark. Ron is the executive director for Kairos Church Planting Support. Um, he has been in ministry for over 35 years and has planted two churches and developed leaders throughout the country. He is an adjunct instructor for uh, George Fox University and Portland Seminary and is uh, the co-chair of the Pacific Northwest Society of Biblical Literature's World of Early Christianity and New Testament Scriptures section. He has authored books and articles concerning uh, intimate partner violence and theology, biblical studies and ministry, and marriage and family ministry. Uh, Ron has an, an MDiv and a, and a, a DMIN uh, from Harding School of Theology in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and he is going to be presenting today on power in leading flocks faith and family in the early Christian community. Go ahead, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, a lot of my PhD colleagues ask, what's a demon? It's a doctor of ministry, or I just tell them I have a demon. So <laughs> um, thank you, Barbara. What a great uh, talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm thankful to be able to present here with uh, Saving Ancient Studies. I'm all in. I've got my mug but I'm not wearing my COVID mask, so for obvious reasons. So I am excited about this and thankful for the opportunity to share. I would like to share a little bit about uh, uh, elders in the ancient world as leaders, and then as we do with SAS, uh, the Saving Ancient Studies, uh, how does that apply to what we see today in working and, and as I train and mentor uh, younger uh, planters and church planters and men and women in ministry? We call this power in leading flocks. The one question that I often get is who were the elders? And we know the uh, the Hebrew word uh, for uh, elder, older person, zakin. Uh, as we always say when we teach a Hebrew, uh, when you get old, you use zakin, right? So that's how we remember uh, elders, uh, gray beard, uh, heads of clans. Elders were important uh uh, people, uh, but also it was an office. It was a leadership position. And in most cases, it began with uh, how you led your home, how the bayat ab, how, how did you lead your family? How did you lead your clan? And so heads of families, heads of clans began to rise up and would step into this role of uh, leadership. Hanak Raviv, a great book on elders, uh, mentions that in Israelite uh, communities, especially during the monarchy, elders had a little more authority and a little more power than in the rest of the ancient uh, Near Eastern world. And we will see this when the monarchy, uh, of course, uh, crashes, they go into captivity. 
when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, the elders take on a really uh, a, a very important role because all you have are elders and priests and then, of course, uh, a few scribes. But elders uh, play this important role in Israelite community much more than in other places in the ancient world. Uh, when we come, come into back from captivity, of course, uh, you see uh, the word um, bekar, uh, bakor. Uh, it's used in reference to an overseer. Uh, we, this is used for Ezra. It's also the Greek is, is episkopos, uh, episkopeo. Uh, it's the same word we get uh, episcopal or bishop from. But these uh, elders uh, become an important role in that kind of leadership. And of course, at Qumran, you have uh, a bakar who is the superintendent, and then the elders support that individual. Uh, elders were not just older men, uh, older women in the sense, but they were a position of authority, position of leadership, position of influence. Now, um, how did they get their authority? How did they get their influence? Well, when, when you read Job 29, uh, it's a great story about a man who has this position of leadership, and he shares uh, being at the, the gate, the city gates, and everybody listens to him, older people, younger people, nobles, uh, and so forth. Uh, the elder is a person who is highly influential. Uh, they are members of the community, and so their authority comes from their membership role in the community. They aren't people appointed to a position just because they need someone to fill the position. They are people who have earned this level of respect. They are highly influential. They are uh, they show a level of flexibility, uh, unlike a king who simply uh, tells people this is what we're going to do. And if you remember with um, uh, Rehoboam, uh, Solomon's son, you know, he asked the older older uh, people, what do, older leaders, what do I do? And he asked the younger leaders and then he chooses to go with the younger advice and he splits uh, the kingdom. Uh, they are high. They are negotiable. They, their, their role is to negotiate to dialogue, to sit at the gates and discuss uh, uh, hakim, hakokmah, hakam, amishpat, ju justice. And we see this again with, with um, Job as he describes sharing this wisdom, sharing this, uh, uh, this justice. And then they, they reflect Yahweh's leadership. That's another important part. At the end of Job's dialogue, he talks about being like a king among uh, his people, uh, I comforted the mourners. It was this idea that as a leader, I was not really over the people. I was actually with the people, among the people. And in this sense, their role was to reflect uh, Yahweh's leadership. How, how did they do that? Well, I, uh, in my dissertation work uh, years ago on, on developing elders and congregations, I spent a lot of time talking about the Hebrew Bible texts, where uh, Yahweh's leadership has kind of two components, um, and, you know, and that's not a hard rule, but just kind of this idea that, first of all, there was this organizational model of leadership. You see the word pakad, uh, oversight, uh, visitation, appointing, it shows care, it shows concern. It's all over uh, the Hebrew Bible, definitely in the prophets where Yahweh uh, Pakad, it just shows this level of care and concern. Yahweh knows the people. Yahweh sees, sight. Uh, Yahweh hears what's going on. And Yahweh uh, keeps stressing, I know what's going on. I'm among you. Yahweh sending and appointing and developing. And there, you know, a bakar, uh, bokar, uh, care and concern. Uh, so we call this an organizational style of leadership where Yahweh understands the process, understands the people, is intricately uh, involved in leading and appointing and sending and delegating, but you also see a relational component to, to God's care for the people. And so a barit, covenant, you know, relationship, highly relational. And, and even with Abraham, the animal cut in pieces and the smoking pot passing through there, uh, basically saying, uh, as you would in a covenant ceremony. Let this be done to me if I'm not faithful to my promise. Uh, Yahweh, with through covenant, is relational with uh, the the uh, the people of Israel. And then, of course, uh, Roe is used often. Yahweh is a shepherd, a friend. is very similar to the word friend. Uh, Yahweh is intricately involved relationally with uh, the the men and women, the children of the community. So we see these two components of Yahweh's leadership. 
And that in turn is one way that uh, people or are, are leaders or elders are supposed to reflect Yahweh's covenant. And I, I have a, you know, I, I focus on what we would call uh, bad shepherds. Uh, although I would point out when I was teaching in Malawi or Mexico, that doesn't translate because they, they believe that sheep, uh, their language for how sheep respond is different. But it, it's kind of the idea of what happens when you get these really bad shepherds. And it's important as we read through, especially here in the prophets, uh, what was going on in Israel was not just that the people were rebelling, uh, every single person, but what was going on was the leadership was rebelling. The leader, they had corrupt leadership. And how, how do we see that? Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4 in the, in the paper, I, I, I break down how you see the terms of shepherd and pacad as you they don't they don't give attention they don't pacad the sheep and 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 uh, they, the sheep struggle and the sheep are neglected because no one cares for them in Zechariah 10 and Isaiah 56 they desert they neglect they run away from the sheep they don't care about the sheep in Ezekiel 34 there's that long section where uh, the shepherds uh, ignore the sheep. They abuse the sheep. They they eat the sheep in the sense they they take advantage of sheep. They don't bind up the sheep that are weak and that are sick. And you see this theme running through the prophets that 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 God and God and the prophet are not confronting all the people in the sense that everybody's done something wrong. They're confronting the leadership because the leadership has failed to take care of the sheep because the leadership is taking care of themselves. And then you have these beautiful passages, uh, Isaiah 40, 11, 49, 10, where Yahweh just says, I'm going to take care of my sheep myself. Uh, Ezekiel 34, I'm going to confront these shepherds. I'm, I'm the one who owns the flock. And as every shepherd is accountable to, their, to, to the flock owner, that's me. And I'm going to call them to account. But I love the, those passages, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, where God says, I'll do it myself. And Yahweh is the great shepherd. If you won't take care of my sheep, if you're going to abuse and mis mistreat my sheep, I'll hold you accountable, but I will intervene so that my sheep, uh, and, and there's passages about coming back from captivity where they leap like calves out of the stalls. And I'm, I'm from Missouri, and my brother-in-law lives on a farm, and whenever I go back, I love uh, helping uh, him uh, bring the cattle in. And it's always interesting when they let him out of the pen or the or the, you know, the calves uh, kind of are, are in that early stage of running, you can just see them jump and leap. And it's, it's that idea, you're going to have all of this pasture, and you're going to be happy because I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to provide for you. So there's this, this interesting point where leaders, including elders, fail to shepherd the people of God. They fail to take care of the people of God. And Yahweh intervenes and says, I'll do it myself. When we move into the what, what's called uh, the Christian scriptures, uh, commonly called the New Testament, but the Christian scriptures, the Gospels, the letters of the early church, uh, you, you see this, what we would call incarnational leadership, where Jesus claims to be the, the great shepherd. You know, Jesus is among the people. Jesus lives among the people. Jesus uh, gets dirty with the people, touches people with highly communicable diseases. In John 10, there's this wonderful, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not like the hirelings who are very similar to the people uh, in, in the ancient world who, who had abused the sheep. Uh, I think Jesus wasn't, wasn't simply confronting um, uh, the Pharisees in the sense. The issue was Jesus was confronting corrupt leadership, which is something we all deal with. It's not he was confronting a religion or he was confronting a race. Uh, you know, he is confronting corrupt leadership. And so as he's incarnationally leading, you begin to see the same thing. He leads organizationally as Pakad, or we begin to see Episcopal uh, Bishop, but he also leads relationally as a shepherd. And so we see these two kind of begin to flesh out in the Greek language, the uh, organizational side, uh, where we call it uh, Bishop, and then the relational side, shepherd. And so as we move into then the uh, the Gospels and the early Christian leader writer, uh, leaders writing, you begin to see this model of leadership that is grounded in Jesus, but it's also grounded in family. For instance, I wrote an article years ago, uh, 2002, on um, when Jesus takes the children. And uh, I believe that there was a Creai, 
there uh, where Jesus uh, took children, uh, took a child or took children. And in there, basically, Jesus touches the child. Jesus holds the child. Jesus rebukes people for keeping children away. Because in the ancient world, uh, you know, rabbis and teachers didn't waste time with little children because they were marginalized populations. But in these six uh, stories with Jesus and the child, Jesus holds a child. In fact, Jesus makes a statement uh, that I think we often translate as anyone who uh, doesn't receive the kingdom as a child receives the kingdom, when it really uh, hosts, uh, can also be anybody who uh, uh, isn't willing to receive the kingdom like they would a child. And so it has to do with how I treat children it has something to do with my status in the kingdom. How I treat children has something to do with how I treat Jesus. And that kreai is there to say that leadership involves this intimate relationship with marginalized populations. Mar and that's going to be important as we uh, move on to the end of this. Marginalized uh, people who are in need. That leadership is not about power. It's actually about embracing the powerless. Uh, a second point is it's interesting to me that in 1 Timothy 3, Paul seems to intentionally choose, at least in my studies, Paul seems to intentionally choose a different word for uh, bishops or elders managing their household. The typical word is oikonomos, oikonomeo, which uh, is what the Greek philosophers tended to use. Uh, you manage your household, which meant, uh, in, at least in Crete, for example, your wife uh, managed the household for you. In other cultures, you hired out a, a slave, oikonomos, uh, as we read in the Gospels, to manage your household affairs, and then you're out in public uh, doing what uh, wealthy people do with others managing your household. Paul uses the word proestemi, which means involved. Uh, care, uh, it also means a patron being caring for uh, people who are in need. But Paul intentionally uses this word, and he uses it three times. You know how how can a person uh, you know be involved in a church if they're not involved in their family? And Paul seems to be moving, I believe, in, in 1 Timothy 3, that leaders have to, again, be the ones who lead their Beit Ab, but they're people who are intimately involved in the Beit Ab. And from what we, uh, again, another, I, I did an article on that uh, um, back in 2006 on um, how Paul uses that word, uh, because in the ancient world, typically dads did not get involved with their families. Uh, and we have these, these, uh, writings from those raised by slaves or childminders who felt more affection for their 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 uh their childminders than they did for their parents uh they hired out wet nurses to to nurse their children and so you begin to see that paul is saying that's really not the kind of leadership we need we need leadership from people who are involved in their families and then of course the third point paul does often make distinctions between pedagogues or pedagogy uh, and be in parenting. In, in Ephesians 4, he talks about uh, fathers, you know, bring your children up in the discipline uh, and instruction of the Lord. Uh, he, he uses a, a term of nurturing there, like he does for husbands loving their wives. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he talks about, you know, do I come to you with a stick or do I come to you with love? You know, that's in reference, you know, you have many pedagogues, but you only have one father. There's this idea that Paul is pointing out that, that a true parent or a parent uh, that I think the Christian community was to look to is one who operates out of love, out of compassion, out of nurturing, out of caring. Uh, and then again, of course, First uh, Thessalonians, we as apostles, we were like a nursing, a nursemaid among you, a, a wet nurse uh, may be another term for you. And then later on, he says, we were like fathers, we were encouraging uh, and, and strengthening you. So there seems to be, as the Christian movement begins, this this modeling of leadership being family-oriented, involved in family, connecting with people, embracing what we would call marginalized or outcasts. And so as we move into today, one of the things that in my book, uh, I, I, I talked a lot about uh, many of the leadership models that I see in church growth and in, in uh, you know, training leaders for churches. In many cases, they're, we're still using stuff that's based on a military model where you have we have to have a hierarchy and there has to be command. And you know, even when I was in uh, Columbia, South America, a lot of the churches there were really hung up on this authority. You know, we need to have authority and we need to get authority in and then we need to submit to authority. And you know, one 
you know, this was a couple, uh, 2019. And so I kept being asked, uh, America has a problem with authority. And I said, no, America doesn't have a problem with authority. America has failed authority. We have authority that has uh, hurt us in working in domestic violence, uh, child sexual assault, working with houselessness, uh, you know, and teaching students who share with me a lot of intimate details about their experiences in churches. We live in a country where authority has ruined people. I would say we're probably much like the prophets where Yahweh is saying, um, you know, if you're not going to do it right, I'll do it myself because you're hurting people. So we have uh, military models in, in some situations of hierarchy, uh, and it's a command and respect. Uh, we've moved to business models. And many of our churches operate with a CEO and the elders or a board of directors or the deacons or whoever. And so leadership just basically is making decisions, and you have one person in a position of power. Uh, sometimes this works. Often, if you're aware, if you've read many of the situations that have come on in uh, many um, uh, mega churches where we've had uh, CEO type pastors, rock star uh, pastors, as Alan Hirsch uses, uh, they have violated sexual ethics, they've hurt their family, and they've taken advantage of, of the flock. And so we've begun to see that there's been all of this breakdown and struggle. If you haven't listened to um, uh, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast, I would suggest that's a that's a perfect one about that sense of power in uh, uh, some of some of the mega churches and how it's it's hurt a lot of individuals and traumatized many. Uh, and, but it, you know, a lot of the churches are using this growth, profit, success. Let's see how big we are, how much money are we making, and so there's a a different type of management. It's not a pro esteeming management. It's an oikonomos management. You know get the best for, for the, the leader. Uh, we, we, we've seen churches and leadership move to consensus, which is helpful in some ways. But one of the issues I know in the, in the domestic violence type of world is that many of, of the lead, when you get a corrupt leader in, they can manipulate a whole group of leaders. Uh, you know, and so there's this, well, we all got to have consensus. We all got to agree together. And sometimes there's a, um, uh, to quote Robert Sutton in his book, uh, a great book on business leaders called the no, the no Asshole Rule. Uh, it's offensive, but he uses that term so we know who you're talking about. You know, we cannot let bullies stay in a position of leadership. And sometimes these consensus forms do not confront those who are manipulating and corrupting power. Why is this so important today? I think you know, I've, I've made some illustrations of what we see. But I know in ministry, we're reaching people, first of all, who are dealing with parent wounds. Uh, you know, we have young men and women in our churches, uh, older men and women, kids in youth ministries, campus ministries. You're reaching out to people who, who have, we would say, father wounds, who fathers have been distant or fathers have, have been abusive or fathers have been controlling or mothers have been controlling. And so many of these younger individuals come into these congregations with uh, parent wounds. And when we do leadership trainings, we talk about if, if you're not intimately involved in your family, if you're not working in your family, if you're not well-respected by your community, you're going to further open these parent wounds that, that so many young men, older men and women struggle with, uh, or they're going to take advantage of them. There are individuals who would say uh, a big part of how you get the job done is you find somebody with a father wound and you drive, you know, you drive them, you drive them hard. Uh, survivors of abuse and so forth are coming in. We're seeing a high rate of uh, internet pornography and addiction coming into a lot of younger people in colleges, sexual assault and so forth. We have uh, survivors of many of these. They're coming into our faith communities. How do leaders lead? It involves relational, uh, organizational guidance. How do we guide them to spiritually grow? How do we guide them to become healthy people? And so these are big issues that we want to, we want to address in our, uh, our models of leadership. We can go back through the history of leadership in the ancient world of elders, and we can see, you know, they need to represent Yahweh. They need to be intimately involved. They need to be uh, helping people. They need to be people who are uh, part of family, but if they're not, you know, not uh, in a sense parents or spouses, how can they be involved in a family-type 
setting. We also want to see the abuses. You know, whenever someone begins to see, this is my right, this is what I do, I've earned this, and they take advantage of others. So these are modern models of leadership that we're trying to address, but we do believe that understanding the history of ancient elders, where they receive their leadership, how they reflect God's authority is something that helps us as we're training others uh, to continue in the faith communities to lead. And finally, as a person who works in community organizations with nonprofits, that's just as necessary there is to have people who listen, can work together as teams, and can actually help nurture that group to deal with some of their struggles that they're facing. So that's kind of my the end. I think it leaves some time for question and answer. Yes, Thank great. Thank you so much, Ron. And um, here's your virtual clap, too. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, I haven't seen I haven't seen any uh, any uh, questions on the, the thread. So um, I will ask you a question. So I was curious about um, this kind of early Christian model of leadership in terms of the kind of the, the church, right? Being a shepherd of, of your kind of constituents in your kind of faith community. I'm wondering how that, how, how did folks in the early church balance kind of leadership in the kind of uh, their faith community, but also their kind of political community that was separate? Uh, and, I, and I'm guessing, you know, kind of Roman, uh, Roman rule. So how did, how did, how did those, how did you put on the different hats? Uh, of of leadership uh, when when crossing those two arenas, I I, I felt that um, there's been a lot of good work on how the the Christian community became a community of resistance, and kind of became you know whether it's association or a uh, colleague, yeah. uh, and, and so if the faith community, if, if I would say we are a form of resistance, then in many cases we're looking out to patterns of leadership, and we're saying, you know, that's not how it's going to be here. Or as Jesus says, you know, the, uh, the, the Gentiles lord it over others, not so among you. What we, we would always try to do is create, we, we want faith communities to be a place where people can come in from the outside world and feel like this is different. And one way is to see a type of leadership where there's caring, where there's compassion, where there's involvement, where you're invited into, the, you know, we invite you into the home and you just kind of see us. But you also, uh, we have a level of accountability with our families, uh, you know, and, and, and I think in, in many agencies, if I have an affair with my wife, I still keep my job. But in the faith community, we take that seriously, you know, or, or my, I have an affair with my husband or, or I mistreat my children. You know, we take that seriously uh, because that's important. I hope I'm answering your question, I think. No, that was great. Yeah, I think um, the idea that uh, being a community of resistance through through the kind of faith uh, uh, community, I think is an interesting way to, to see that uh, as a response to kind of Roman, uh, Roman dominance. Yeah. Um, I like that very much. Now, for instance, like when, when I've worked with domestic violence agencies, and sometimes I'll sit down with someone and say, hey... <laughs> You know, we're fighting powers of oppression here, but this leadership structure is reinforcing powers of oppression. And so I saw that as um, that's my role as a faith leader to bring into the community. Now, they can tell me, well, that's how it is. You know, we are appointed here by the attorney of this. Uh, but I, I think that as a faith leader in the community, I feel an obligation to say, you know, can't we explore that this may be repeating the same pattern we're trying mm -hmm. to avoid? And that, that would be, that's a calling, that's a responsibility. And they may say, this is how this system works and that's just how it is. Okay, but I, I think we need to have that conversation that this might be a better model of leadership. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, I'd like to take a moment here to also thank all of our other panelists, uh, George and Barbara, uh, for their contributions and uh, to the audience for sticking with us uh, as we kind of had the little bit of a bumpy start. Um, but we are uh, we are going to close now our first session on community leadership. So again, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, George. So here's another virtual clap for you all. Thank you so much. Uh, it is now uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Amanda Podany.
And so uh, I'm going to give everyone just a second to breathe uh, before we uh, before we jump into the first keynote here. Um, oh, okay. And uh, uh, Amanda's here. Very good. Okay. All right. So uh, Amanda Potany is a professor emeritus of history at the California State Polytechnic University Pomona. She specializes in the study of Syria and Mesopotamia in the Middle and Late Bronze Age with a particular focus on chronology and social history, and is the author of the forthcoming book, Weavers, Scribes, and Kings, A New History of the Ancient Near East um, through Oxford University Press. She has authored several other books and many articles and is the, uh, and is the instructor in a series of 24 video and audio lectures for Wondrium, the great courses uh, called Ancient Mesopotamia, Life in the Cradle of Civilization. Uh, and uh, Dr. Potany is going to um, give our first keynote here uh, entitled Looking for Leaders, the People Missing from Mesopotamian Royal Inscriptions, 2500 to 1500 BCE. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Potany, and the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it and um, really delighted to be part of this uh, Congress and um, really interested in the topic in general. I'm going to share my screen and... Uh, just need a second um, need to go to bear with me. All right. So I was really pleased to, to be invited to talk because I've been working on um, looking at people who are not leaders in the book that I'm writing right now, I'm looking at looking not just at the leaders, but also at people who were supporting leadership, um, people who were in positions of power that are kind of missing from many narratives. And uh, so this, this fit in really nicely with some of the work that I've been doing. Just, there we go. This mace head is inscribed with one of the earliest royal inscriptions in the world. It was commissioned by one of the earliest known kings anywhere, King Mesalim of Kish. He ruled sometime around 2600 BCE during the early dynastic period in Mesopotamia. The mace is shaped into interwoven figures of lions. Across their bodies, the artisan has inscribed what you see there. Mesalim, King of Kish, temple builder for the god Ningirsu, set up this mace for the god Ningirsu. Lugal Shah Engor is the ruler of Lagash. We get just the tiniest glimpse of political history here. Not only was Mesalin the king of Kish, but he constructed a temple for the god Ningirsu, to whom the mace was also dedicated. But there's an interesting postscript to this inscription. He also names another ruler, Lugal Shah Engor, ruler of another city, Lagash. They don't have the same title. Mesalim used the title Lugal, meaning big man in Sumerian, which came to be the standard Sumerian word for king. Lugal Shah Engor was the local leader of Lagash. He had the title of Ensi, which later came to make, mean king in some regions and governor in others. Kish, home to Mesalim, was one of the northernmost of the Sumerian city-states of the early dynastic period. Lagash, he you see circled, home to Lugal Shah Engor, was far to the south and the mace head was found in Lagash. Ningirsu was the city god of Lagash. He was sometimes symbolized by a lion as seen here. So the temple that Mesalim built would have been the main temple in Lagash. This all suggests that in the early dynastic period, although the city-states were often independent of one another, in the 27th century BCE, King Mesalim of Kish was able to, in some way to dominate Lagash. So who was the audience for this inscription? As you can see from the photograph, the um, writing was barely visible. Who could possibly have read it? Fortunately, the gods could read cuneiform, even cramped cuneiform like this, and it was the god Ningirsu who needed to know about Me uh, Mesalim's dedication to him, the temple that he had built, as well as the mace head that he had dedicated. The desire of Mesopotamian kings to record their pious acts for the gods resulted in the creation of innumerable royal inscriptions written over thousands of years, from this mace head to texts written across alabaster walls of the palace of Ashurnasirpal II in the 9th century BCE and beyond. 
they have provided a core framework for the reconstruction of Mesopotamian political history. But royal inscriptions are innately problematic as sources. They are often described as propaganda and some were indeed set up in public or somewhat public spaces, though few people could read. But some were placed where they would never be seen, for example, in a box in the foundation of a building or on the flat side of a brick that was covered by mortar. Only the gods could see these, though the, god, the kings sometimes also noted that a future king might come across the inscription when rebuilding the structure. We can be certain though, that whoever was the intended audience, divine or human, royal inscriptions weren't unbiased. They didn't tell the complete story of events, and obviously they weren't written for the 21st century historians, like us, examining the issue of ancient leadership. We have to look beyond them in order to understand the structures of leadership and to identify the leaders other than kings in ancient Mesopotamia. Writing had developed in Mesopotamia, as I'm sure you know, around 3200 BCE, but for the first six centuries, it had been used in very limited ways, as a memory aid and for recording administrative details and lists of words, and for keeping records of some legal transactions. Its potential for recording narratives or spoken language was not yet realized. It was, however, recognized as a way to communicate over time and space. Scribes must have known that a great clay tablet listing the distribution of some barley from a warehouse, as here, could still be understood months or years after it had been written down, and the tablets were indeed kept and presumably consulted for long periods of time. A tablet could also be carried to a different location and understood by a scribe there. Someone who had never seen the original warehouse could know its contents based on this. A tablet could also be sealed, this is the back of that same tablet, which provided more information about who was involved. When kings started commissioning inscriptions to the gods, they were taking advantage of these qualities of writing. An inscription like the one on the mace head would last longer than the king's lifetime and could be read by someone, perhaps the god or another person, who might not have been present when it was written. An inscription helped keep the king's memory alive. This worked for thousands of years, for as long as cuneiform was being written and read, but by the first century CE, only a tiny number of people could still read cuneiform. And soon after that, the script was entirely forgotten. Only with the decipherment of cuneiform in the mid 19th century did the world rediscover the ancient Mesopotamian kings. But the story we tell now about these kings isn't exactly the one they commissioned. The, the next leader of Lagash to send messages to the gods seems to have been King Ornanshe, who ruled in the mid third millennium BCE, probably in the 20, uh, 2500s. This stone plaque is well known. It includes 13 figures, most of whom have cuneiform captions to identify who they are, along with a few lines to the gods. The captions include the names of three officials, seven sons of the king, including the crown prince, Akurgal, and a daughter, Abda. King Ornanshe himself appears twice, much larger than anyone else. On the left, he has a basket on his head, and on the right, he is seated with a cup in his hand. There's no mistaking that he's the most important person here. Curiously though, his daughter, Abda, is the second largest figure. The crown prince Akurgal stands behind her. One gets the sense that his daughter may have had some importance, though the accompanying inscription doesn't elaborate on what that might have been. As you can see, Ornanche starts his inscription with the name of his father, and he goes on to list three structures that he had constructed to the gods. Like Meselin before him, he claimed to have built the temple of the local god Ningirsu. He had probably perhaps rebuilt or refurbished it, and he also built two other structures. Throughout Mesopotamian history for another 2000 years, royal inscriptions were very often written to commemorate the construction of temples or the dedication of items in those temples. The kings wanted to remind the gods of their actions and so that the gods would never forget the king's piety. Ornanche's last claim here is interesting because it doesn't pertain to the gods. He refers to this, these ships of Dilmun submitting timber as tribute from the foreign lands to Lagash. Now, Dilmun was far to the south of Mesopotamia, across the Gulf in what is now Bahrain. It's unlikely that the timber sent from there was actually tribute. Dilmun wasn't controlled by Lagash at this time. The timber was more likely to have represented one side of an exchange of luxury goods for which Ornanche had in turn sent valuable items from Lagash. This type of diplomatic interaction 
was also a feature of ancient Middle Eastern history for thousands of years afterwards. Royal women were portrayed on another of Arnanche's inscriptions. The captions on the figures here show that the seated person on the bottom right was his wife, Min Bara Absu, and the seated person on the bottom left was his daughter, Nin Usu. His sons don't appear on this delay. He mentioned the ships from Dilmun here again, as he did on at least seven different inscriptions. The diplomatic or perhaps trade connection with Dilmun was clearly an achievement of which he was proud. Now, in spite of some images of his wife, his daughters, sons, his officials appearing on these steles, Ornanche's many known inscriptions don't mention any other person in Lagash actually doing anything. It was the king alone who built all the temples, shrines, gates, and monuments, and these make up the majority of the achievements that he listed. It was the king who brought the Dilmun ships. It was him who dug the canals and the, oak and the reservoirs. He created the statues. He fought the enemy cities, captured enemy leaders, and performed oracles to select a priest, and he distributed barley. From this period onwards, for 2,000 years, these were the basic building blocks of royal inscriptions in Mesopotamia. The king did everything himself, according to his own account. He did it all for the gods, and he wrote about it to let the gods know. Even the categories of achievements stayed pretty much the same. Buildings, water projects, statues, warfare, providing for the people, and appointment of priests and priestesses, though kings varied in the amounts that they emphasized each category. For over a hundred years, kings of Lagash after Ornanche continued to commission inscriptions, and they continued to direct these inscriptions to the gods, as on this statue of King Enmetena from around 2450 BCE. In this section of what is a very long text, and you can see how long it is from the autograph copy on the right, um, in the, within that, that long text, he mentions the original location of the statue. He wrote, at that time, Enmetena fashioned a statue of himself, named it Enmetena is the beloved of the god Enlil, and set it up before the god Enlil in the temple. He also acknowledged why it had been made. Enmetena, who built the Ayada temple, made his personal god, the god Shul'utl, forever pray to the god Enlil for the sake of Enmetena. This statue had the power to pray to the gods for their constant support. To Mesopotamian eyes, Statues held part of the life force of the person, and this statue not only prayed on behalf of Enmetena, but also received offerings to him, even after his death. Royal inscriptions in the early dynastic period were generally written on stone or metal objects, or on bricks or baked clay cones. These inorganic materials have survived well in the ground. In many other ancient cultures, at least in the Mediterranean region, royal inscriptions can be found on the same types of media. Think, for example, of the stone inscriptions of Egyptian kings or of Roman emperors. Documents that were meant to last lent themselves to being carved in stone or on metal. But the writing medium for daily use in many ancient cultures was ink on an organic material, papyrus or leather, and later parchment or paper. Almost all of these quotidian documents have disintegrated or carbonized over the subsequent millennia like for example, the papyrus from Herculaneum in the top left of this slide. A few ancient uh, texts escaped oblivion because they were either found in the desert, like the Hekanak letter, which is the, um, in the center of the top row in the slide, or in anaerobic conditions. And the um, top right, you see the letters from, from um, Vindolanda, the Vindolanda letters that were found in Britain near Hadrian's Wall that survived because of the anaerobic um, conditions in which they were Found. But more often, things, uh, ancient texts that were not sort of inscribed for the future are found because they were written in ink on, for example, uh, pottery sherds, or like on the left, or on pieces of limestone. And in China, um, some inscriptions were written on bone as well, and those also survived, like the one on the bottom right. Now, fortunately for Mesopotamian scholars, um, vastly more documents have survived. And this is of course, because they wrote on clay. The clay tablets that recall these mundane details of everyday life have been excavated in vast numbers. There are more than half a million that have been found to date and hundreds of thousands more probably are yet to be uncovered. They allow us to study the world of individuals in many different walks of life. And with, with regard to the topic of this conference, they provide a rich view of the way that leadership functioned. 
So let me give you an example. This is another king of Lagash, a king named Lugalanda, and he ruled around 2400 BCE. He had a fairly short reign. And unlike Enmatena, he didn't leave us a statue, or rather we have not yet found the statue that he um, made of himself, although we know it did in fact exist. And we also have not found any inscriptions on stone. Again, they may well exist and not have it been found. We do have his impressive cylinder seal seen here, um, but it includes nothing more than his uh, name and title. And as you can see there, it gives his full name, which was Lugalanda Nukonga. There's also a short brick inscription, and this is the only royal inscription that we know of of Lugalanda. It says, Lugalanda, ruler of Lagash, chosen in her heart by the goddess Nanshe, granted the exalted scepter by Ningirsu, son born by Baba, and then there's a break, as you can see. It says, son of Anantarzi, ruler of Lagash, for the master who loves him, Ningirsu, he erected a monument and named it Ningirsu is the Lord eternally exalted in Nippur. He fashioned his own statue and named it Lugal Nukhanga, never ceases in his efforts for the Girnun. So this is pretty standard stuff. He was chosen by the gods, son of the previous king, devoted to Ningirsu, to whom he dedicated a monument, and he created a statue of himself. Fortunately though, a huge number of administrative texts come from his reign, and they were found during the excavations in the ancient city of Girsu, which was the capital of Lagash. This one is a label on a basket of administrative texts, but although it names Lugalanda, it came from the archives of his wife, Bara Nantara, and she proves to have been much more influential than one would ever guess if you only had the royal inscriptions uh, to judge from. In fact, this was true of um, queens of Lagash in general. They seem to have, been, have had significant power in the kingdom, but they were almost never mentioned in the royal inscriptions at all, aside from those first images of the queens, of the queen, of uh, Onanche's queen, they don't get mentioned by the kings in their inscriptions. So what do we know about Queen Bara Namtara? Well, she had this very impressive seal, and here you see an impression of it. It was at least as impressive as her husband's, perhaps even more so. It's a very large seal, it has three registers, and the top and bottom ones show a heroic figure controlling rearing animals. And this was an image that was reserved for powerful people. And this inscription on it um, that identifies her, but tells us nothing more than that she was the wife of Lugalanda, the ruler of Lagash. But as I say, hundreds of administrative texts have been found in her palace at Girsu. And the, her palace was called the A Mi, which means the house of women. And on the website of CDLI, which is the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, you can find about 800 of these tablets. Um, many of them have images like this one that I got from the CDLI webpage, and many of them also have transliterations. A few even have translations as well. And they've been analyzed by many scholars over the years. And so we know in fact much more about Bara Namtara than we know about her husband, King Lugalanda. And it turns out from what we've found that she was a leader in her own right, and that this was common for the Queens of Lagash. And one would have never guessed that from royal inscriptions. Bara Namtara took over as the head of the Aimi only after her mother-in-law had died. As in many times and places across the ancient Middle East, the role of the queen didn't end with the death of her husband. She kept her position until her own death. Only then did the wife of the reigning king take over her responsibilities. Now the Aimi was not just a palace. It was a huge economic institution controlling more than 4,465 hectares of land and the barley, dates, and other crops that they produced. It also maintained the canals in these regions, along with fisheries and vast herds of sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. Bara Namtara was at the head of this, and she was personally involved in its administration. She oversaw a workforce of about 700 people whose names and payments were listed on the administrative texts found in her palace. A large number of workers named on these tablets worked in textile manufacturing, and the vast majority of these workers were women. It's been possible for researchers, and I want to note that this work has largely been done, notably been done, by Rosemary Prentice, Fumi uh, Karahashi, and Agnes Garcia Ventura, and so I'm, I'm recall, uh, describing their work here, and they have traced the careers of individual women who served as supervisors of textile workshops in the palace. 
And this um, cylinder seal shows these three textile workers around a horizontal loom. I mentioned this just to give you a sense of just the depth of information that one can get from these administrative texts to the point where you can actually look at individual um, workers and how they uh, progress through their careers. Baranantara also had other responsibilities. As I mentioned, King Ornanshe had boasted about those boats from Dilmun that had brought him timber and that that was probably representing a diplomatic alliance. Well, in the time of Baron Antara, we know this was diplomacy because she had diplomatic relations with other queens and she had an alliance represented on this tablet um, or recorded on this tablet with a queen named Nin Gishkimti of the land of Ada. And that was upriver from Lagash. And they exchanged gifts and their envoys traveled regularly between their courts. And here you can see, this is the text of that um, same uh, tablet that I just showed you. And what you can see is that at the beginning, it starts with gifts that the queen of Adab sent to Baron Amtara. And she lists 10 jennies, one boxwood footstool, one small boxwood figurine, and one small ivory figurine. And then it mentions that uh, these had been brought um, by a, a man uh, who worked for her. And then it says that Nin Gishkemti gave to Malgasu, and this was the, um, the envoy from Adab, she gave him one pair of exquisite garments. And then it says that Baran Antara in exchange um, sent goods to the queen of Ada. And there she lists 120 minas of copper and five minas of tin and bronze. So this is a classic gift exchange, luxury gift exchange between royalty. There's more evidence later on in Mesopotamian history for this taking place between kings, but clearly in the early dynastic period, this is a diplomatic relationship between queens. And at the end, it says that Baran Antara gave to the um, envoy from Adab, um, she gave him two garments and a flask of scented oil. So what we see here then is that this is the, one of the first examples of luxury gift exchange between rulers but that this continued then for more than a thousand years. Baranantara's rule also extended to religious rites. She had a central role in a festival called the Festival of Eating Malt of the Goddess Nanshe. And the text records her actions as she traveled around the major cities in the kingdom of Lagash over an eight day period, dedicating offerings to the gods and to past kings and queens of Lagash. A record was even kept of Bara Namtara's elaborate funeral, which took place over two days and involved 92 lamentation priests who would have performed music and they would have sung and they were paid in bread and beer. So when looking for royal leaders, you can see that royal inscriptions are just the tip of the iceberg. In Lagash, the Queens took a huge role. And the same was true in the same century, the 25th century BC, but in Ebla, far to the Northwest of Lagash. You see Ebla circled on the map here. The palace at Ebla included no royal inscriptions that have been found, so we don't know what the kings would have said about themselves, but the archive that was found in the palace, seen here during excavation, contained thousands of administrative texts on clay tablets, and as at Lagash, they record an intensive industry in textiles that was controlled by the palace. They also reflect a network of diplomatic relationships, that were reinforced by treaties in which um, the kings swore oaths. Uh, they had envoys, they exchanged in luxury gift exchange, and they also had an antagonistic relationship with a neighboring kingdom. This was also true in Lagash. Lagash had had a long standing war with the neighboring kingdom of Uma, and in the case of Ebla, there was a long standing battle going on with the neighboring kingdom of Mari. But the tablets also show that the king in Ebla, as in, in the case of the king of Lagash, was far from being the sole source of authority. One partner of the king in leading the kingdom was the vizier, but he had, his title was actually written with the Sumerian sign Lugal, which in Sumer meant king, but in this case, it seems to have reflected his role as a vizier. This was a man who was a military leader. He was the king's right-hand man, frequently mentioned in administrative documents, but there were also, besides the vizier and the king, a group of people known as the elders who advised the king. And perhaps the most important person next to the king in Ebla was his wife, the queen whose, whose title was the Maliktum. 
And here's a reconstruction. Um, it was proposed by Paolo Mattier, the uh, excavator at Ebla, of a standard that was found in Ebla, would have been mounted on a pole. And it was found in pieces. On the right is an image of the living queen. On the left, there's a smaller figure that was perhaps the statue of her predecessor and that she was paying homage to her predecessor with an altar in between them. In both Ebla and Lagash, we know that statues of former queens were indeed provided with offerings. So administrative records and ritual texts from Ebla show that the king and queen were perceived as a ruling couple sharing authority. I'm gonna speed ahead in time um, to the 18th century BCE to give you another case study of a king who is well known and who also was supported by a leadership uh, network rather than actually achieving all of his achievements himself. He was 700 years after the kings of Lagash and this is Hammurabi of Babylon. Now, when Hammur Hammurabi um, came to the throne, his kingdom didn't extend far beyond uh, the region of Babylon. But over the course of his 43 year reign, and especially in the last 13 years, he expanded it through conquest so that his empire eventually extended from the Gulf all the way to the city of Mari on the Euphrates. He's shown here at the top of the stele, very familiar image, I'm sure. He's on the left, he's got his hand raised in prayer, and he's standing in front of the statue of the um, sun god Shamash, and the sun god um, oversaw justice. In his royal inscriptions, and this includes the prologue to the laws that were written on the stele, Hammurabi emphasized many of the same types of achievements that were familiar from the inscriptions of the early dynastic kings of Lagash. He claimed to have been chosen and supported by the gods. He embellished and built temples. He provided water for irrigation and he expanded agricultural land. He conquered enemies at the command of the gods and with divine help. He performed religious rituals and made offerings. He protected and guided his subjects. He was entirely responsible for everything. He mentions no one, from Babylon at least, who had assisted him or who had actually carried out his many projects. Another type of royal inscription, in a way, was the year name. And year names were ubiquitous. For hundreds of years, each king chose a name for every year based on one of his recent great deeds. Throughout the year, scribes used these year names whenever they recorded the date on a text. These provided a way for the king to broadcast his achievements throughout his realm. If you wanted to refer to a date when something happened, you couldn't help mentioning the king and his, his uh, latest achievement. You'll not be surprised to know that in the 43 year names of Hammurabi, he doesn't mention a single other Babylonian name besides his own. So again, he's taking credit in the eyes of the gods at least for everything that he did. Scribes compiled these year names um, into uh, lists like the one shown here to help them keep track of the sequence in which the years took place. And by year 30, Hammurabi was composing these year names that were so long, they're sort of mini royal inscriptions on their own. And as you can imagine, with one this long, um, the scribes would abbreviate them so that they didn't have to write the entire thing every time they listed the date. A limestone stele here um, is also written by Hammurabi. And here you can see how often Hammurabi used the first person. So here it starts, I dug the canal called Hammurabi as the abundance of the people, which abun brings abundant water to the land of Sumer and Akkad. I turned both its banks into cultivated areas. I kept heaping up piles of grain and it goes on and on. I did this and I did this and I did this. Whereas the earlier kings would often use the third person and would say, or Nanche did something or Enmetena did something. Hammurabi often used the first person. So how do we find other leaders in his time behind all of these claims that Hammurabi did everything. Obviously he did not dig the canal himself. He didn't organize the workforce to do so. He needed administrators to help him in every one of the things that he boasted about. Again, clay tablets come to our rescue. Um, they were not written for the future. They were just written for the everyday purpose of keeping the kingdom running. And they provide the real story. During his reign, Hammurabi wrote letters to his officials and hundreds of them survive. And just like the administrative texts from Lagash, they reveal a much more complex situation than the one that you would guess from the royal inscriptions alone. His surviving correspondence includes a corpus of about 350 letters, like this one, that he wrote to official, an official 
um, who worked in the province of, uh, of uh, Larsa. And this was a man named Shamash Hazir. And he oversaw agricultural land that belonged to the state. He also oversaw walk, work on the irrigation system. And he um, was responsible for hiring people to uh, shear sheep. He had a lot of responsibilities within the uh, region of Larsa. And like the administrative text, um, we see through these letters then that Shamash Hazir played a very important role in Hammurabi's uh, era, and so did many other administrators. So for example, we have an, um, a letter written to Shamash Hazir by Hammurabi, and we see from it that Hammurabi was surprisingly engaged in what might seem to be rather minor details of Shamash Hazir's work. So here he wrote, Sin Ishmayani, the date gardener, brought this to my attention. Shamash Hazir has appropriated land of my family's estate and has given it to a soldier. Is perpetual land ever to be taken away? Return the field to him. Hammurabi must have received letters from people across his realm, like this date gardener mentioned here. And he personally, in many cases, addressed their complaints by sending them on to the administrators who could deal with them. And he kept in touch with a network of high officials across his realm, who in turn oversaw the work of others. And all of them recorded these interactions and listed their, uh, the workmen on clay tablets. And so we have both the letters from Hammurabi, but they would have also kept track of all the people that they were hiring. And again, this leaves um, a paper trail or a clay trail of these leaders and their, and their work. I should note also that queens no longer held quite the authority that they had had in the early dynastic period, but they had a responsibility in a different way now because kings often married foreign princesses. And they did this in order to cement alliances. They would often marry the daughter of their, of perhaps a, a, an, an ally. And these women had a different kind of power because they wrote letters sometimes to their fathers, to keep them apprised of events in their husband's kingdom. And so these women were functioning in a way almost as spies for their father in the region where they had married. And here, for example, is a section from a letter written by a princess to her father, Zimri Lim. And Zimri Lim was the king of Mari. He was a contemporary of Hammurabi's. And his daughter, Inbatum, wrote this letter. Apparently, Zimri Lim had written to Imbatum asking her something about what was going on in her husband's kingdom, and she wrote this back. She wrote, for many years, the city of Amaz was following the lead of the land of my lord, and there she means her husband. And as that city separated from the side of my lord, again, my, her husband, your servant, and that's her father's servant, went and returned that city to the city of my lord and subdued that land. When my lord, again, her husband, has come back, you and he talk among yourselves. So she's, she's filling in Zimri Lim on what had been going on within um, her husband's kingdom. And there's plenty of other examples like this. And clearly she was a useful asset in a way to her father, because by living in the husband's court and sending messengers and letters back to her, her father, she was able to keep him informed and her correspondence was separate from that of her husband. So we see then that the Mesopotamian kings wanted the gods to believe that they ran their kingdoms single-handedly. They were men with almost superhuman power to do so many things. But the daily activities of the scribes reveal the truth. Because the Mesopotamians wrote on clay tablets, even the most prosaic records often survive in the ground. They show that from the first early dynastic kings to the time of Hammurabi and long after, each king was supported by an extensive network of men and women in positions of leadership who were responsible for organizing and implementing the great achievements claimed by the kings in their inscriptions. If it were not for the survival of these quotidian texts, we would have no way to know of Baranamtara, Shamash Hazir, Inbatum, or a host of other individuals, men and women, who were leaders in their own right. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Padani, for that amazing talk and solid uh, images and maps, beautiful stuff. The, the comments are exploding with gratitude um, for the, the level of detail uh, in these, uh, these pictures and in this talk. Uh, so again, thank you so much. We do have a few questions from 
the uh, from the, the live stream here. So, uh, and I'll try and get to get to all of them here. Uh, one question question from Christina Donnelly. Uh, With your research, do you think it is fair to say that in the early dynastic period, the epigraph uh, um, wife of does not denote subordinate role, but is rather used um, to justify a, a familial relationship? That's a really good question. One really does have the sense that it was, I mean, it was a patriarchal society, obviously, in the early dynastic period as well. But one doesn't really get the sense that these women were subordinate to their husbands. It's really striking, in fact, in Baranam Tara's archive, how rarely Lugalanda is ever mentioned. It's not that she had to get his authorization for things. She was running her estate on her own. And I think that's, that's a good point that um, wife of, I mean, she was only in that position because she was married to Baranam Tara. And Bar Baranam Tara was married um, to, Lug to Lugalanda. So she had not inherited the throne herself. But having married him, she did have a tremendous amount of authority. And I think you're right that it is not seen, the term wife at that point wouldn't have had that um, subordinate uh, connotation. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so I guess um, wife uh, equals qu queen at that point. And yeah. so it's it's therefore like a higher title. Well, they had a term for queen as well. Um, and so it's... It's, and it's complicated with Sumerian terms too. Actually, Sumerian is fascinating for this because one of the striking things about Sumerian names is that they didn't have, a lot of names were androgynous so that men and women both had the same name. And sometimes you have to just look very carefully to see was this a woman or a man. And I suspect that a number of figures who we have just assumed were men may have been women because oh. Their names were not, you know, distinct in terms of, of what the gender was. Wow, that's really fascinating. Um, so we have another question uh, from uh, L LHM who asks, uh, says, thanks, Dr. Amanda Podney for this amazing presentation. Are there any other evidences of queenship in southern Iraq other than Lagash? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously there's the Queen of Adab, there's the Queen of Dilmun that corresponded with the Queen of Lagash. There are, in the early dynastic period, the best evidence comes from, from Girsu, from the, the, um, the excavations there. I'm sure there are, off the top of my head, I haven't been writing about them. And so everything that's in my brain at the moment is, is the things that I've been writing about in my book. Um, there, isn't, it, there isn't an archive that size from any other early dynastic uh, kingdom that reflects the queens, but I suspect, I mean, it certainly seems as though this was the norm, given that it was just such a comfortable relationship between the queen of Adab and the queen of Lagash and the queen of Dilmun, that they weren't ruling. I don't want to suggest they were in charge. They weren't, the kings were. But these queens certainly had an enormous area of um, control, their own estate, this huge estate, and this very interesting diplomatic relationship that doesn't even mention the kings, that I do think signifies that they had, um, it's just they weren't looked at as, as people who were in, in any way insignificant. They were certainly not independent rulers, but, but had tremendous power. Great. Uh, turning now to, uh, to cuneiform, okay. uh, one question from, from Queso Negro uh, on YouTube asks, uh, did they have standardized dimensions and formats for tablets, or did it vary from scribe to scribe in terms of uh, the size or, or like the, the style of the cuneiform? Yeah. yeah, no, that's really good. They were very good at fitting the, the cuneiform into the size of tablet. And so often it looks as though they kind of had figured out ahead of time about how big of a tablet they would need. And then they would make the tablet the size and then they would uh, the, make the little squares, you know, if it was the early dynastic period or the lines, if it was the old Babylonian period and fit the text into the amount of space. But that means that some tablets are tiny. So for example, in the old Babylonian period, you can find letters that are like the size of a postage stamp and the entire personal letter is written on them. And then from Ebla, you have these really big tablets that are um, summaries of administrative, almost like a ledger in a way, keeping track of, of um, rations, for example, over a long period of time. And those were, those were much bigger. 
And so it really varied depending on the use the tablet was going to be put to and the amount the scribe was trying to get written on it. Sometimes they've written the most unbelievably tiny script too. If you haven't seen a cuneiform tablet, go and see, you know, see, they're, they're all over the country in museums. Just go and have a look at them and you'd be amazed at the beauty of the script and how small it can be. Great. And uh, there's also a lot of uh, curiosity uh, in the chat regarding this festival of the eating of the barley. Can you tell us more? Well, this was, they had a number of different festivals at Lagash. And the festivals took place throughout the year and they were, they had these esoteric sounding names. So this was apparently the, the time at which the, the statue of the goddess Nanshe um, was given malt, but it, was, it happened to be the biggest event of the year in Lagash. And these festivals functioned in a number of different ways. One was that they provided an opportunity for the people to actually see the goddess or the God in that the statue would be brought out of the temple and paraded through the city. We know this was true later, it was almost certainly true at this time as well, where this was, it was not a congregational religion. They didn't go to sort of church or temple. They would um, practice their religion very privately, but the big temples to the city gods were off limits for the population. And that's where the God lived in their statue. And so you would have the statue brought out into the public walk paraded through the town. But the other thing it did it provided weekends in a way they didn't have a weekend. They didn't have a day off work. So a festival was a day when everybody didn't work. So it provided a break from work um, before the invention of the weekend. And importantly, the royal family members would go around the kingdom visiting different shrines on the occasions of some of these festivals. And Baran Antara going to these three major cities in the kingdom of Lagash is physically being there as a representative of the, the royal family. Um, and she did a lot of these. And I think, that, and we know this was true also in Ebla, where the queens would go out and perform the rituals. And these were offerings made to the goddess in the different cities. And it, it was a way I think of tying the city, the, the city state together, but also of um, physically being there. You know, if you think about the ancient world, the kings, were in their palaces, the queens were in their palaces, you didn't see them. You didn't have you know, CNN broadcasting it every night, showing you what your king looked like. And so when they physically showed up, that was a way for the people to sort of be reminded, this is the person who is in charge. This is the person to whom we pay our taxes. You know, that I think it was a, a form of propaganda as well as being a religious ritual to um, appease the gods. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It makes me think of, um like a, a Roman triumph or something like you would, you would show up and, and you were there to be seen. Uh, and yeah, right. it's, it's, it's and not an insignificant to, moment. Right. Even when they're traveling through the countryside, obviously the queen's not going to be traveling quietly, you know, trying to hide. She's going to have a big procession. She's right. going to have lots of attendants. She's going to really, you know, go just leave your village and go out and see the Royal procession go by, even if you're not in one of those major cities. So I do think it's, it's a, um, uh, a way of, um, of being present, yes, absolutely. Great, and uh, I think we'll give the, the final question uh, now to Barbara, uh, a presenter from our earlier panel. Uh, she says, uh, uh, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I'd like to know if there is a hypothesis as to why ruling women were missing uh, from some royal inscriptions. Uh, were men trying to diminish their power? That's such an interesting question. Yeah, they were completely missing other than Ornanche's images of his wife in the, or in the Lagash ones. I don't think, you know, I've, I've toyed with that idea. I don't think so. I think what the king was trying to do was to remind the gods of his piety. I don't think it was necessarily a conscious effort to say the queen didn't do anything. Um, it wasn't even a conscious effort to say, you know, even though I'm saying he, he emphasized, I did this, I did that. I think it's more about his relationship to the gods. He's not compelled to bring anyone else into that relationship. He doesn't have to say, oh yes, and my wife too. Oh, and my vizier. Oh, and that's what I did as well. You know, he's saying, I did this for you because I am the king and I represent you and you chose me. So I think it's more a question of what royal inscriptions did is, and, and perhaps that's the, the point I was trying to make at the beginning. They weren't writing for us. They weren't saying this is our political history. We use them for political history because that's what we have. But they were written as a sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship between king and God. And the king was telling the God he'd done these things and asking the God for his support. And so I think that it would, 
it's not that surprising that they don't mention the other people. But I think what's so interesting is getting to see what those other people were doing through these texts that were never intended to last. And that makes for a really interesting um, study. Great. Yes, that's a perfect way to, to finish this excellent presentation. And thank you so much to the audience for your questions. Uh, thank you again to, to Dr. Padani for, um, for joining us today. And here's another virtual clap for, for everyone. Um, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. And thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Of course. Much. All right. So <clears throat> we are uh, a little behind schedule, and that is, that is totally okay. Um, so uh, we are going to do a brief uh, presentation uh, by me <laughs> about some of the stuff we're doing at SASA, and we will, uh, and I will abbreviate it now so that we can uh, attempt to get back onto schedule. Um, and our next panel will begin uh, in about five minutes or so. Um, so again, welcome back. Uh, my name is John Haberstroh, and um, I'm a, a volunteer with SASA. I'm in charge of the uh, the act access team within SASA. And there are multiple teams in SASA that work on various projects. And the access team is de dedicated to creating um, content and um, programs that increase access to the study of all things ancient. Um, so uh, David, our, our leader, uh, our fearless leader, uh, alluded to some of those projects uh, earlier in, in his introduction. Um, and I will uh, go briefly through some of these now. Uh, and if any of these sound interesting to you, feel free to use them, feel free to promote them, uh, share them with your students, um, share them with your friends. Uh, and if you have ideas as well, uh, I'm always open to, to hearing more, um, uh, more ways that we can uh, increase access for uh, the study of the ancient world. Um, so one I'm gonna show you here is um, on, if you go to our, uh, SASA website. If you look at the um, at the resources tab here on the top right, if you go down to ancient studies resources, this is this will take you to a database that we created, where we are collecting any and all uh, websites or digital humanities projects that can help people study the ancient world. And currently, we have. We have over a thousand websites uh, listed in, in this database so far. Um, ran anything ranging from you know, the ancient Mediterranean, the ancient Near East, um, East Asia, India, um, some, some parts of Mesoamerica as well. And so we're looking to be truly global in our approach. Um, so, and we're, we're working as fast as we can and there's many more websites uh, for us to find. Um, if you are using this page and you can't find something that you know exists, uh, for example, if you have your own website that has um, translations or um, is a collection of, of high quality digital images, um, tell us about it. You can use this Google form here, which I'll highlight uh, here. And we're gonna try and crowdsource this database as much as we can. So if you know something's missing, uh, you can let us know by using that Google form. And uh, so, yeah, again, it's just easy. Use the search bar and you can find a whole bunch of stuff as and, and you can scroll through. Uh, everything is keyword, um, keyword searchable. And every uh, website comes with a brief description of what that website uh, contains. Um, and again, we're looking for anything, uh, digital humanities, uh, lessons for teachers, um, called map collections, etc. Um, so do feel free to share. So some other projects that we are working on uh, include um, a, a new mentorship program, which we're hoping to launch um, sometime next spring. And this is a program that will kind of um, educate uh, high school seniors, early college uh, students um, on how they can study ancient studies and the kind of um, how to get into the fields of their choice. Um, so you can stay on the lookout for that. Um, we also have a, another project called the Where to Study Ancient Studies uh, database, which uh, is our um, uh, probably hubristic attempt to collect uh, all known uh, programs that offer degrees in colleges and universities in any topic related to the ancient world. 
Uh, so we are going to um, have, a, have another type of database that has um, a list of all colleges and universities that have full degree programs. So not just classes in Greek mythology or classes in ancient India, right? It's a full degree program dedicated to an ancient studies field, whether it's archaeology, history, um, literature, and, and so forth. So stay tuned uh, for that coming down uh, later. Uh, and uh, very soon, I hope, we hope to launch another uh, useful resource for the public uh, and for those who are interested in archaeology and actually doing archaeology, uh, whether, whether studying it um, by reading articles or by actually digging in the field. Um, and this is going to be a list of archaeological terms, kind of like the, um, like the, the, the nitty gritty uh, terms that you might need if you're actually digging out in the field uh, to communicate with, uh, with people on your team, or perhaps there are local uh, um, excavators who, who do not speak your language, you, you can use this document to help you uh, find some terms that will help you get by and navigate uh, that, that space. Um, so this will be a multilingual project where we have, uh, I believe, eight languages so far, uh, ranging from uh, English, Spanish, French, German, uh, Italian, Polish, um, uh, and, and lots more, and Dutch, I think, uh, and Arabic. And so we are, we are trying to be as comprehensive as possible. So uh, we hope to launch that um, in about a month or so. So I'll, I'll wrap it up here uh, now, and uh, we'll, we'll get underway with our second panel. Uh, and I will introduce our, our next moderator. Is is Julie here? Yes, Julie is here. Hello, Julie. Hello. All right. So uh, Julie Levy is the program coordinator for SASA uh, and holds two graduate degrees in ancient Greek and Roman studies. She is an activist, scholar, writer, and YouTuber. Uh, their scholarly interests include Greek, Greek lyric poetry, especially Sappho, historical linguistics, and archaeogaming and uh, I'm a proud colleague of Julie here at SASA, and uh, I will pass it on to her now to uh, introduce our second panel. Thank you so much, John. <clears throat> um, let me just... get set up here. So welcome to our second session, Paths to Leadership. We have a really great lineup for you today, a lot of wonderful speakers um, who will be talking about various ways that people have come to power and, uh, and how they have used that power um, to shape history. So uh, we'll be starting with uh, Patista Mukherjee, who will be discussing uh, the rise of the Indian Empire, uh, Nicholas Mataya, who will be discussing uh, Severinus of Noricum, and then Babette Margolis, who is uh, going to talk to us about the interconnected leadership of the Achaemenid Empire. So we've got a really great panel coming up for you. And without further ado, uh, let me get started here. Okay. <clears throat> so during this, we do have a hashtag for this panel, which is, um, which is in one of my documents, I promise. <laughs> um, so you can always tweet for this conference using hashtag OEW conference. And the hashtag for this panel is OAW session paths to leadership. So please do tweet that out. Please join us. We'd love to have you. <clears throat> and um, and let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Pratista, if you would 
go ahead and turn on your video. <clears throat> so, um, hello. Uh, Patista Mukherjee is uh, presently pursuing her PhD in archaeology and ancient history from the MS University of Baroda. She's done her master's in archaeology and heritage management from Guru Gobind Singh Indra Prashtha University in New Delhi. She's explored many archaeological sites, including uh, ones all throughout the Indian subcontinent and the Indus River Valley. Um, she's also worked with various governmental organizations, such as the National Museum and Monuments Authority. She specializes in ancient art and architecture, iconographical studies, and early historical archaeology, and has published articles on the same. And this paper follows her interests. Pratista, please take it away. Yeah. So, thank you, Judy. I'll just share my screen. I hope it is visible. And it is on full screen. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So after the introduction, I am Pratishta and I'm from India, as Julie has already introduced me. Uh, today, I will be speaking on the administrative and military achievements of Chandragupta Maurya. So like introducing, in Indian context, when we talk about history, it actually starts from 6th century BCE. Before that, we have archaeological sources such as small cultures, village cultures, such as the ochre colored pottery, painted grayware, and the northern black polished ware culture. So these cultures have, you know, little bit references in the later historical references. But what was exactly going at that point of time? It can only be traced through the archaeological sources. But when the time slowly evolved, we come to 6th century BCE and we see this upcoming of the state. Before that, we have the urban centers at the Indus Valley civilization. After decline around 900 and, uh, 1900 BCE, we see the first time and the starting of the second urbanization in the Indian subcontinent. And still we are in the second urbanization. So from the second urbanization, that is 6th century BCE, we see the upcoming of the states. And they are called the Mahajanpadas or the great city. And the various Buddhist texts and uh, Jain texts talk about these states. So at this point of time, from 600 to 300 BCE, we see a lot of types of governments coming up, such as the monarchical, the republic, then the other forms of government. And also, at this point of time, we see the foreign invasions, the invasions coming here from specifically from Greek, uh, from the Macedonian. Alexander was invading at this point of time. When we reach to 3rd century BCE, we see the upcoming of Chandragupta Maurya. Now, Chandragupta Maurya is said to be first emperor of India, and he has unified the Indian subcontinent. And we need to understand a bit about Chandragupta Maurya. Now, the Mauryan dynasty, it is said to be the greatest empire that have ever ruled in Indian subcontinent. And for 137 years, they have ruled. Now, Chandragupta Maurya, he was the founder of the Mauryan empire. As I said, he was the first emperor and he established the largest political entity that ever existed in Indian subcontinent. And even it is still existing with no changes. It, this time period, witnessed an unprecedented level of economic prosperity, advancement in art and architecture. The great historians in India say that before this, we do not have anything precise. Everything is in fragmentary position. But with, you know, um, Chandragupta Maurya taking up the throne, even though he was not a born king, he was made a king. So uh, from this point of time, we see that the history becomes precise. The chronology becomes precise. There is no fragmentary. Everything, the archaeological sources and the uh, literary sources corroborate each other. So this time becomes very, very important. And he introduced a highly centralized administrative system with the frame of bureaucratic institutions, as I said, that we still follow in India. 
Now, how did Chandragupta Maurya came into existence? Now, his origin is quite an obscurity, and there are a number of stories talking about him. But which story do we, you know, actually understand? That is upon all the historians, because historians and the textual sources they talk about various origin stories. The first story is that of Shudra origin. Now, in India, we have in the that period from 1500 century, uh, 1500 BCE to around second century CE, we had this form of rigid caste system, the Varna system. So the Varna system was Brahman, Kshatriya, uh, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. And Shudras were said to be the lowest in the society. Now, Shudra origin is that that the last king of the uh, the Dhananda. Now, before Chandragupta Maurya came into existence, there were two dynasties already prevailing. First is the Haranyaka dynasty. Second was the Nanda dynasty. Now, the Nanda dynasty had many, the kings, uh, there were six kings, and these six kings had lots of wives with them. So, it is said that the last king, Dhananda, uh, and uh, his mistress had a child, and that was Chandragupta Maurya. Some say that it, uh, he originated from the Nepalese tribe, that they were, uh, there was a tribe with the Poshak Maurya, and hence the name came Maurya. So there are lots of stories. Now, how, with, how did Chandragupta Maurya become Chandragupta? Now, the, uh, during the Nanda period, there used to be ministers who, uh, who were called Amatyas or Maha Amatya. And they were very, very important. And they were having a stronghold in all the administrative and the military powers of the king. Now, the last king, Nanda, he was a person who was having a very merry time. And he was, you know, enjoying his time, wasting all of his money on women and on uh, alcohol. So there is a saying in Hindi that Mahila and Madera means women and alcohol. You should stay away from these two things. Otherwise, a man would would be, you know, devastated. He will be destroyed. So this was what's happening. Now, when Tanakya or Kautilya, he was a great minister and even still uh, in, in, in the Indian society, we say that Chanakya Niti is this, Chanakya says that. And in Arthashastra, he is, is, is one of the most important books. Now, when he went to the king and he said that you are wasting all of his money, all of the state's money, he was thrown out of it, uh, thrown out of the uh, state. So he went out and he was seeing a lot of people interviewing them. Then he saw Chandragupta Maurya. So that this story is quite debatable because there are no proper uh, textual or archaeological sources claiming this story. But since it is in the society, it is, you know, a continuous tradition. So people accept this story. So with the help of uh, Chanakya and Chandragupta, they overthrew the Nanda. And finally, the Chandragupta, uh, the, the Mauryan dynasty was brought into existence. Now, if you see the map, this was the region of Chandragupta Maurya who was ruling it. Now, during uh, his period, Chandragupta Maurya's period, he had three important military conquests. So these were the military achievements. First was the conquest of Punjab. Now, when I'm talking about Punjab, it is absolutely the undivided Punjab, including the parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. So this was the region of Punjab. And this point of time, the Greeks were here. The satraps were ruling here. Now, Alexander, when he invaded India, uh, he divided his uh, regions into various provinces. And these provinces had chiefs or a, a certain type of executors who were called satraps. In Sanskrit, it becomes Shatra. Later in the context, in, uh, in Western India, specifically in Gujarat, the Western Shatra built up a huge empire and the Indo Greek era built up a huge empire in the later con in the period. So there are stories that uh, Alexander had a meetup with uh, this Chandragupta Maurya when he was a little boy, but only one. Uh, text that is Plutarch, he talks in his uh, text that, yeah, they met, but no other text, all other texts are silent about the meeting of Chandragupta and Alexander. So, uh, Chandragupta Maurya, with the help of Chanakya, he conquered the area of Punjab because there were these small provinces, the satraps were there, 
and he with you know with petty battles they were having these small small battles and he was slowly conquering the area of punjab after conquering this region of punjab he invaded the area of magadha where he founded the new dynasty of the modern dynasty in 322 bce so here this is the main region where the all of the north indian empires were prevailing so he invaded magadha and therefore the modern dynasty was formed now there are now you might be thinking that why this area now this is the yaganga yamuna dwap and it is said to be the most fertile region in this in this whole country this is the most fertile region and also if you see the sea the sea is here the trade routes are here all the major trade routes cross here so it is an important political center as well as trade center so a lot of revenue would be generated so this center was the most important that is the reason why all the empires and all the kingdoms were here and also buddha and jaina uh, mahavi were also born in the same region uh, they were you know walking around and um, uh, preaching their teachings in all in the same region now the second important uh, chandragupta's achievement was the defeat of the nanda ruler now after uh, you know fighting up with the punjab's uh, satraps and everything and unifying them under them he had a large cavalry now th there were 60000 uh, horses and chariots and 1000 standing army so this all army in the indian context we see for the first time in the indian context the chariots are coming up the chariots which were run by horses before that we do not have any archaeological or any textual references about horses that is quite debatable since this is now refuted because the dates are shifting back because there were stories that uh, horses came here in india through central asia and all but these stories are now refuted and because there are the dates have been pushed back to around 1500 to 1600 bce so after all of these things came they you know bashed the nanda uh, dynasty because dhananand the last ruler of the nanda dynasty was already you know he has already wasted all his money on women and uh, alcohol and he was he had nothing so bashing him and controlling him was much more easier with such a big army now the third important military achievement of chandragupta maurya was that uh, the war with seleucus now alexander died so his things were finishing off now this area was under the seleucid empire Selu uh, and obviously seleucus was the ruler now obviously uh, chandragupta maurya wanted this area under his control as well because here the important the trade route was following the silk route which goes through here and he wanted a control over that now he had a battle with uh, the seleucid empire this is seleucus and uh, uh, seleucus lost the battle and a treaty was uh, filed uh, was signed between them that okay you can have a control over this area and also to you know commemorate this uh, treaty Seleucid uh, Seleucus's daughter was married off to Chandragupta Maurya. So yes, uh, so here from here we have the start of starting off of the uh, Indo-Greeks and everything was coming into existence. So uh, if you see uh, the map, so this was the area which was under Chandragupta uh, Chandragupta Maurya's reign, and he had unified a lot of region under him, and he is said to be an emperor because he had unified this large area under him. And after his uh, successors, we had Bindusar, his son, and the third ruler, Bindusar's son, was the most celebrated ruler of India. Indian history was Ashoka Maurya, and he added to the existing um uh. a territorial region if you see the map now the administrative achievements of chandragupta maurya now when we talk about the administrative achievement this achievement was all credited to chanakya now chanakya plays a very important role on his chanakya niti because through uh, through this book only and the as the literature talks about it 
Now the administrative achievement is that the whole province was divided into 30 parts and these 30 parts were having six provinces and with five, five ministers with them and they overall called the Mantri Parishad or the Council of Ministers. Now these Council of Ministers were controlling different parts like the foreign trade, uh, the wages, the taxation system, the administration, everything was, uh, was taken care by these people. Now, the important theory which was followed was Kautilya's Sapta Anga theory or the seven limbs. He says that the first the important limb is that of the Swami, the ruler. The second is Amatya, the minister. Then we have the Jana, that is the population that will be acting. Now, Durga, that is the fortification. Kosha, the treasury. Danda, the army. And Mitra are the allies. So, if you follow this, the state will, you know, will be prosperous. Now, there were different type of, the state was divided into various parts, the navy, the supply, the transport, and each, each of these heads were having a certain head who used to control all of the things, and they were directly answerable to the king. Now, here what was happening that Chanakya had already said that the king should be, you know, accessible to the normal people as well. He is not the supreme. He is a person who has been elected by the people or he has been chosen by the people to represent and solve that issue. So that is still for that is being still followed in India. The republic, democracy is still there in India. So that is a cultural continuation that we see. So I would be uh, concluding uh, my concluding remark would be that. Now, Chandragupta, even though he had a very small time uh, in ruling and in the later period, he became a Jain and uh, he went to Karnataka with his uh, teacher Bhadrabahu and he followed Saleh Khana, that is, you know, uh, he fasted until he had death. So he was a very, uh, because he had a very troubled life. And uh, he was a very simple person, but with great achievements, with very, uh, 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 I would say, a very sharp uh, towards, you know, controlling the administration and the military achievements were there. And the administration of his empire was pursued by his successor with no change, was even though no change was felt necessary because with the help of Chanakya, he has made it. And even today, in the even today, the Indian government follows the same uh, Chanakya Niti, I would say, that with, with no change. So it is a cultural continuation. And the system of administration was of a very centralized type, having a powerful bureaucracy at the center. So the king was, was controlling each and everything, taking care of everything. And uh, Chandragupta, is said to be and will always be the first emperor of India. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Pratishtha. That was a wonderful paper. Um, we do have several questions. Um, let's start with one from Bibia on, on YouTube. Uh, can you talk about how much interaction there would have been between India and Egypt, like the trade connections at the time of, of Maria? Okay, when, when we are talking about the connection with India with Egypt, so we are going back around uh, 2500 years back. So that is where we have the Indus Valley civilization, which is prevailing. And uh, yes, they were having proper connections with the uh, Egyptian people because we have seen certain things uh, like the materials. We were seeing that the uh, Harappans or the Indus Valley people were trading with the Egyptians. And in Egypt also, with the excavations of various sites, we have seen that the Carlenial beads, the Fayan beads, the steatite, then the the trademarked Harappan pottery that we call it in Indian context that was seen in um, Egypt. Even the cotton was traded from Gujarat. It is said that for making mummies, they used to have these cotton bandages, and they that was traded from uh, Gujarat. So that they, and even the uh, Egyptian inscriptions talk about the same thing that the Indus Valley people were actually trading with them. So this is the. Uh, 
you know, connection with the Egypt, uh, Egyptians with India. But when we shift our focus towards the early historic uh, period from 6th century BCE, we do not see such uh, archaeological or uh, historic literature. We do not see any types of, uh, you know, connection with them. There must have been, but they were not recorded. It can be possible, but the literature and archaeology do not talk about the connection with the Egyptians, uh, Egyptians during the early historic period. Thanks. Um... Next question comes from Lakshmi Praveen. Uh, where can I see the sources of Mauryan war with the Seleucid Empire and relations to the West? Like, where do you find detailed studies on that? Okay, there are various books. You can uh, see the ancient civilization by uh, Dr. S. N. Sen. And uh, the other book would be The Wonder That Was India by A. L. Basham. So these books are best where, where you can actually see how Seleucus was, you know, having this connection and what was the battle about and how they, you know, commemorated with the this thing with the marital alliances. So, yeah, these two books are the best. You can go for that. Um, our next question comes from Christina Donnelly. How did religion play into the Mauryan Empire? Uh, religion played, they were not using religion in any way. Chandragupta, as a ruler, he was an Ajivika follower, but later period, he became Jain. But as when specifically talking about Chandragupta Maurya, he was patronizing everything, that if you are a Brahmin, you can, whatever religion you want to follow, it was happily patronized. Art and architecture was also happily patronized. But uh, when we see with the successors such as Bindusar and uh, Ashoka coming up, they were using, I would say a very wrong term that they were using, but yes, religion was an important, you know, a thing to control, to have a control over this period. Because if you see the Ashokan inscriptions, they talk about variously about the Buddhist uh, following, the Buddhism, how important it is, how uh, you should follow Buddhism, how you should propagate. His ministers were going Sri Lanka to Far East and everywhere they were going just to propagate Buddhism, along with, you know, showing that how great Ashoka was. But when we see in Chandragupta Maurya, he was quite liberal with all of the things. Um. We have a question from Ironclad Ranch and Forge, uh, who is interested to know how elections were held at this time, or or how how the bureaucracy works. I think. Okay, so I was I'm happy with this question. I was expecting this question. So, uh, what was happening that now he had divided his state into various provinces. Now, there is a hierarchy. If you see, if you read Chanakya's Arthashastra or Chanakya Niti, I would say that there is a hierarchy, that there is one small village, then uh, the tribe is there, which forms a, a village, the village forms a small town. And these people were having different heads. These heads were, you know, elderly people. Now, these elderly people used to come and see that, okay, you show me which all the candidates who wanted to be a king. They used to come and they used to showcase their, you know, their achievements. Now, the thing, the Shastra and Shastra comes in. Now, Shastra is that you should be well versed in literature. That is specifically Sanskrit. Then we have Shastra. That is how you are using the weapon. You should be great in weaponry, be it chariot, be it the use of bow and arrow, be it mace and all the weapons. You should know everything. Now, there used to be tests that, okay, this person is getting whoever used to get proper marks. And who used to qualify these tests, that person would be selected. So the selection was based on, you know, your uh, abilities and not like, okay, I am the king, tomorrow my son will become the king and so on. The monarchy was not there. But in the later periods, when we shift our focus to around 2nd to 3rd century CE, we see that the monarchy has taken the stronghold. But from 6th century to around uh, 2nd century BCE, we see the republics were there. Monarchy was not. Uh, as much prevalent, but yes, democracy was there. People were, you know, allowed to select their king. So this was prevalent. That's really interesting. What a different system. I like it a lot. Um, so I actually have a question for you. You mentioned the sort of oral tradition of of these stories of, of Chandragupta Maurya. 
Hmm. So how is that tradition, how does that come down to, to our present time? Um, is it, is it, um, are these songs, are they stories? Where do you get that? Actually, uh, different religious texts, the Buddhist talk about a different story. The Jain texts talk about a different story and the Puranic tradition or the Purans talk about different stories. So I'm like in my family that obviously Chandragupta Maurya is a great king and he is always, you know, looked upon, he's praised a lot. So there is a story which is quite prevalent and it is like, again, it is, you know, an oral tradition. It's an oral, absolute oral tradition. This story has got no place in, uh, in literature or any other important literary, literary source. So this is an absolute lit, uh, story. When you visit uh, Magadha or the present Bihar region, there is a story in Magadha that uh, Chandragupta Maurya was a person of very low caste. But because in Indian context, we had the system of low caste, upper class and everything. We still follow this. So he was a person of very low caste and his mother was a concubine. She was a mistress to a king. And when she died, uh, like in Hindu traditions, we burn, uh, we cremate a person's body. So he wanted, you know, wood to cremate his mother. And nobody helped him saying that, okay, you are mother was a mistress and you are a son of a mistress. We are not going to help you. So, you know, at that point of time, he said that, no, I am going to change this system and I will become a king so that nobody in this society ever suffers due to such things. At that point of time, Chanakya sees this, Kautilya sees it, okay, that how much this child is suffering, but still he is, you know, having an attitude, okay, I will change this system. That is the point, that is the breaking point where Chandragupta decides to train this child. Then it becomes Chandragupta Maurya. This is an oral tradition and it is quite prevalent in the states of Bihar and Bengal. So, yeah. Thank you so much. There's a lot of people in the chat who have more questions and more questions, but I'm afraid we're out of time for now. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation, Pratishta. Uh, please feel free to to engage with your fans in the chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll Thank see you. you. Thank uh, you. We'll move on to our next presentation. Um, please allow me to introduce to you uh, Nicholas Mattia. Um, Nicholas Mattia is a Latin teacher in San Antonio. He holds a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University and a master's from Villanova University. And he also studied at Swansea University in Wales. He also holds a certificate in classics from Central European University in Budapest. So. His, uh, his paper is on holy leadership in a power vacuum, Severinus of Noricum in post-Roman Noricum. Nicholas, if you would turn on your video. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Sharing screen now. Let's get in here. Okay. So. I'm talking today about holy leadership in a power vacuum, Severinus of Noricum in post-Roman Noricum. During the mid-400s, along the western Danubian frontier, a holy man came out of the east. He decided to stay in a small town, Asturias. One day, the holy man went to the church and asked the people to come listen to him. In a scene reminiscent of the prophet Jonah, the holy man told the people to pray fast and do works of mercy, lest they be attacked by the enemy. The people did not listen, and the holy man left. Shortly after, the holy man came to another town and repeated his call to prayer, fasting, and works of mercy. The people of the new town also did not listen. But one day, a man came from, to the town from Asturias. He reported that his town had been destroyed, just as the holy man had foretold. The man found the holy man and threw himself at the holy man's feet. The people of the town saw this and decided to believe the holy man. For three days, they made up for their past doubt and did as the holy man asked. On the third day, while the people were in church, an earthquake struck the town. The barbarian army outside the town, terrified by this act of God, ran out of the area haphazardly and began to fight each other. 
the barbarians annihilated each other and the city was saved. The above story is a recapitulation of the first two chapters of Eugippius of Lucullanum's Commemoratorium of Severinus of Noricum. Eugippius, in the Commemoratorium, describes a Roman province on the brink of collapse, and the only man standing between the province and catastrophe is a holy man. In this paper, the collapse of the Roman political control in the late antique Western Roman frontier will be examined using the commemoratorium as a hermeneutic. This presentation will begin with an overview of the period between 395 and 520 on the Western Roman frontier. Then this paper will introduce the hearers to Eugippius of Lucullanum, a Christian refugee from a Roman frontier province with a brief overview of his life and works. This presentation will then introduce Eugippius' commemoratorium of Severinus of Noricum. Then the actions of Severinus on the frontier will be examined, especially his interactions with the Roman army, the barbarians, and with the people of Noricum. Finally, this presentation will investigate the flight of the Noricans from the province. The collapse of Roman political control over the Western frontier began with the Battle of Adrianople in 378, which led to the destruction of two thirds of the Eastern Roman army by the Goths. The next four years, which included another Roman defeat in 380 by the Goths, led to a treaty between Rome and the Goths, settling the Goths along the Eastern Danube in 382. This settlement began a new strategy for the Roman Empire with respect to the frontier. The frontier was now seen as a defensive buffer between the rest of the empire and the barbarians. The frontier became a, setting, a settling ground for numerous groups of barbarians who could, in the Roman mind, then be turned on other barbarians in exchange for frontier land. This made the Roman population's grasp on the frontier tenuous. Why remain when your home could be given up to the next group of barbarians to cause the Romans a problem by crossing the Danube? This uneasiness by Romans along the frontier with Roman concessions to the barbarians in conflict with their new barbarian neighbors can be seen quite clearly in an incident that occurred in 390 in Thessalonica. Butheric, a Gothic magister militum in the Roman army, arrested a Roman charioteer. The people of Thessalonica agitated for the man's release, but Butheric refused. The Thessalonians then rose up against Butheric and killed him. Emperor Theodo Theodosius retaliated against Thessalonica, ordering an attack on the city and massacring a sizable portion of the population. Soon after, in 395, Alaric, a Gothic chieftain, led a group of Goths that had served at the Battle of the River Frigidus to revolt in the er area along the eastern Danube, looting large sections of the region to apply pressure on Constantinople. Stilicho, Honorius's Magister Utriusque Militiae, who also claimed regency over Arcadius in the east, then attempted to use this revolt to wrest control of the Bar Balkans from Arcadius, but was unsuccessful. The revolt was ended in 397 by Eutropius, Stilicho's Arcadian equivalent, who appointed Alaric to a military command in Illyricum. Alaric and his Goths left Illyricum in 401 to invade the west. By 410, following a number of invasions into Italy, the Goths, who the Romans had settled along the Danube in Roman territory, had left the region. The next group the Romans settled in the Balkans was a group of Goths freed from Hunnic dominance by the Romans in Pannonia in the early 420s. These Goths were then settled in Thrace. By 420, Roman control of Pannonia had diminished, and the Romans had abandoned the province. Sometime around 430, the Alamanni invaded the western frontier and a sizable part of Noricum revolted. However, both of these problems were put down by Aetius, the western magister Utriusque Militiae. The full force of the Hunnic army came to the frontier in the 440s, and the eastern army suffered defeats to them in 442 and 447. By the end of the 440s, the town of Imanachium, Nisus, Sertica, Ratiaria, Philippopolis, Arcadiopolis, and Constantia had fallen to the Huns and their allies. Although Attila died shortly thereafter and Roman political control was reestablished in these parts of the Balkans, permanent damage had already been done. 
Further in the West, possibly in response to Attila, Roman control of Noricum, modern day Austria, ceased to exist. It is interesting to note that the human geography of the collapse of the Roman control during this period. From 378 through the 440s, the major area impacted by Roman losses to barbarian groups in the Balkans were the Romans settled along the Via Militaris through the northern Balkans. This northern road that connected the western half of the empire with Thessalonica and Constantinople is also the same route through which the intellectual fights of the Christological crisis on the frontier had taken place a century earlier. The loss of these regions to the barbarians undid the progress that had been made by the Nicene Christians. Though the region was now re-Aryanized, so the Nicene contingent in the Balkans and the surrounding region was tasked with returning it to the Nicene fold again. With the Hunnic threat diminished by 469, the Goths of Thrace became the bad actors on the frontier. The revolt broke out by these Goths in 471, and the towns of the Roman frontier were again looted by the Goths for political gain over Constantinople. Combined with this Gothic revolt, a group of Goths led by the Amals crossed into the frontier from now barbarian northern Pannonia around 473 and were settled in Macedonia. These two Gothic groups spent the next decade squabbling with each other and the Romans, with the frontier's Roman inhabitants stuck in the crossfire. During this period, the collapse of the Roman moved from the to the Ignatia. There, a number of incidents hearkened to the unrest among the frontier of the 390s. In 479, the Pannonian Goths were detected near Thessalonica due to a malicious rumor that the Emperor Zeno had given these Goths territory near the city. The Thessalonians revolted, overturned imperial statuary, apprehended Zeno's legates in the city, and gave their power over to the city's archbishop. This action is quite interesting as frontier bishops in areas like Dacia had more political control over their cities than areas in the Roman heartland like Thessalonica. Although it is possible that the Thessalonians merely saw their bishop, entrusted by the church with their spiritual care, as someone who was less inclined to betray them, the Thessalonians cannot have been ignorant of the role of Vetranio in Tomai, Uphila in Nicopolis, and the bishops in now barbarian-controlled Italy. The second incident also occurred in 479. Bearing in mind the actions of the Thessalonians, Theodoric the Amal and his, had his supporters spread a rumor in Epidaurum on the Adriatic coast southeast of Noai, where the Pannonian Goths were now located. The inhabitants of Epidaurum panicked and fled the city, leaving it uninhabited for the Goths to take over. As Peter Heather contends, this abandonment of the city points to a belief on the part of frontier Romans that the empire had given up on them. Although most of the Goths would leave the majority of the Roman frontier by 488, and then almost completely abandon it for Italy by the 510s, the collapse of Roman military and administration along the frontier led to seismic changes in the area. The Roman communities along the Via Militaris and the Via Ignatia were de either demolished or constrained by 520. Further, frontier confidence in the Roman Empire had ebbed to such an extent that the few remaining Romans were willing to cede power to either their clergy or to the barbarians, something that was rarely, if ever, practiced in the frontier prior to the 5th century. Moreover, Roman political control of the frontier shrank dramatically during this period. Pannonia, Noricum, Dacia, and Thrace were lost, along with large portions portions of Moesia and Macedonia. Before moving to discuss the commemoratorium and Severinus of Noricum's actions during the final years of Noricum, it is important to provide further context on that frontier province. Noricum, a province located north across the Alps from Italy, joined the Roman Empire around 15 BC under the reign of the Emperor Augustus. Under Emperor Diocletian, Noricum was placed under, under the prefecture of Italy. The province then went through a number of divisions until, during the time of Severinus, the province was divided into Noricum Repents, which included the Danube and is the main theater for the actions of Severinus, and Noricum Mediterranean, which included the Alps. 
Due to its location along the Limes, north of the Alps, the area was the frequent target of barbarian incursions, including an aborted attempt to settle the province by the Goths in the early 5th century. During 430 to 431, two revolts occurred in the province which were personally ended by the Magister Utriusque Militiae Aetius. The province was then attacked several times by the Huns, but the real damage to Roman control came from the Hunnic successor groups, including the Rugi, the Goths, the Heruli, and the Thuringi. Emperor Zeno in 486 to 487 fomented a revolt of the Rugians against Odovacar, and in response, Odovacar defeated the Rugians in Noricum and removed the Roman population from the province. Eugippius's commemoratorium of Severinus begins around 453 with the death of Attila and ends after the Noricans settle in Italy following their forced emigration from the province. We now turn our attention to the collapse of Roman control in the Balkans as seen in Eugippius of Lucullanum's commemoratorium. Eugippius was the abbot of a monastery at Castellum Lucullanum outside of Naples, Italy, and he is known to have written, along with the commemoratorium, a book of excerpts of Augustine of Hippo and, according to Isidore of Seville, a monastic rule. The commemoratorium is a 46-chapter work that is intended to provide a record of the important miracles and events in the life and death of the holy man called Severinus of Norica. The commemoratorium was written by Eugippius, a follower of Severinus and a refugee from Norica. He is also, or he is also one of the ones who helped move Severinus's body to its final resting place in Castellum Lucullanum on the Bay of Naples. The text is mainly written in the third person, but it switches to the first person when Eugippius enters the story. Although Eugippius did not title his work a life, he only called it a commemoratorium, modern scholarship has consistently called it the Vita Sancti Severini. This title, however, is somewhat misleading as the work is not actually a life of Severinus. Instead, the commemoratorium is a work sent with a covering letter from Eugippius to the deacon Pascasius, ostensibly for Pascasius to write a more complete life of Severinus from the materials assembled by Eugippius. Although Eugippius terms his work a commemoratorium or a means of remembrance, he includes nothing of Severinus's life or background prior to the holy man's entrance into the area between Noricum and Pannonia late in the holy man's life. It also includes a number of events after the death of the holy man, including a war between two barbarian armies, the exodus of a group of Norcan refugees, including Eugippius, into Italy, and the subsequent internment of the holy man's remains in Eugippius's monastery at Castellum Lupulana. Eugippius later became the abbot of that monastery. It was in his role as abbot that Eugippius decided to write the commemoratorium. In his covering letter to Pascasius, Eugippius tells us his motive in writing the commemoratorium. Eugippius was worried that a layman was planning to write a life of Severinus, and Eugippius did not want to risk a layman making Severinus' a story unapproachable for the unlearned. It is also clear that Eugippius was not a witness of many of the events depicted in the commemoratorium. Eugippius, a young man at the time of the Roman flight from Noricum, relied on the older members of his monastery to fill in the blanks of Severinus's life. In many ways, Severinus is presented as a typical holy man. He was, quote, a model of piety and chastity. He was a lover of solitude, but like his prototype, St. Anthony of Egypt, he frequently went into the towns to perform miracles or teach the people. He took upon himself the care of the captives and needy. Almost all the poor were supported by his personal efforts. He urged the spiritual practice of tears on many occasions. He was an ascetic who possessed only one rug and one cloak, and he would only break the fast before sunset on feast days. However, his face always shone with the same cheerfulness. He had the gift of prophecy and performed many miracles. There are, however, a number of things that make Severinus unique. As E.A. Thompson explains, Severinus is the only cleric of whom we know from the northern frontier provinces who regularly hobnobbed with the barbarian leaders. He is absolutely unique. Further, as discussed by the author myself elsewhere, Severinus had a unique theological outlook, and many of his miracles are strange even for miracles. 
including the ability to cause earthquakes and death and exorcism with his tears. So moving on, the demise of the Roman army and the loss of Roman political control of Noricum and its surroundings is felt throughout the commemoratorium. This loss is seen most clearly in Eugippius's depiction of the Roman military. In his depiction of the Roman towns of Noricum and in Severinus's interactions with the Roman people of the region. The first sphere in which one can see the collapse of Roman control in the Balkans is the depiction of the Roman military within the commemoratorium. The introduction of the first Roman soldier in the commemoratorium is not until chapter four, when Severinus is in his third Norican city, Fabianus. This is surprising as the Noticia Dignitatum states that Asturias, the first town that Severinus visited, boasted an infantry unit commanded by a tribunus. In chapter four, a group of barbarians raided outside the city walls and took a number of people captive. The people of Fabianus came to Severinus for aid, and he went to the Roman tribunus, Mamertinus. Mamertinus lamented to Severinus that he only had a small number of soldiers, Milites Paucissini, and that these soldiers were poorly supplied. Now, Martinus then states that if Severinus commanded it, he and his men would attack the barbarians due to his soldiers' respect for Severinus. Severinus orders Martinus to attack the barbarians and to bring any barbarians taken prisoner to him. Now, Martinus agrees to this condition, attacks the barbarians, and wins the battle. It is clear in this episode that the Roman military in Noricum is small and poorly supplied. Further, the citizens of Fambianus coming to Severinus first, instead of to Mamertinus or another member of the Roman military, demonstrates that lack of faith that the citizens had in their Roman protectors. The next episode involving the Roman military is even more enlightening. <clears throat> the reader is told that the forts of the upper portion of Noricum Repents competed with each other to have Severinus visit. This competition resulted from their belief that Severinus's presence would protect them from barbarian raids. This behavior is not what one expects from the Roman army. Later in the commemoratorium, when Severinus reaches the town of Batalis, Eugippius explains that the Roman military in Orkham was not being paid, and this caused the soldiers in most towns to abandon the walls. He then relates the story of the soldiers of Batalis and how a group of them went to Italy to bring back the last payment. In a heartbreaking scene, Severinus, with tears, directs a number of men to go to the river inn, where they discover that the soldiers sent to retrieve the payments have been killed in a barbarian attack. From the commemoratorium, one finds that the Roman military has collapsed. The parts of the Roman military that were based in Norcum at the time of the Noticia Dignitatum, both soldiers and ships have vanished. The soldiers left in Norcum are poorly supplied and poorly paid. The demise of the Roman army in Noricum is emphasized in another scene in the commemoratorium. Eugippius explains that the people of Quintanus, tired of the attacks of the Alamanni, abandoned the town and moved to Batalis. The barbarians then attack Batalis. The small force of Roman soldiers present at the fort in earlier chapters are absent from this episode. Instead, Severinus rallies the people of the town and they defeat the Alamanni. Severinus then urges the people of the town to abandon this town as well and to come with him to Loriacum. Although many people do follow Severinus, the town is not fully abandoned. It is then attacked a few days later by another barbarian force, the Thuringi. There are four interesting factors in this episode. First, Romans are seen fleeing from their homes and taking refuge in other towns. Second, the defensive force of the town is composed not of soldiers, but of the people. Third, the people of the town are able to defeat a barbarian force. And finally, four, there are numerous hostile barbarian groups in the same area. The implication of these factors is clear. The Roman military in Noricum is non-existent. Eugenius's depiction of the political landscape of Noricum is very telling of the influence of the empire in the region. Eugenius begins his narrative of Severus's life with the downfall of Asturias and Severinus's miraculous defense of Comagenes. Comagenes is described as a Roman town that was hosting a group of barbarians within its walls as a result of a treaty. As E.A. Thompson has shown, this treaty was highly unusual as it was not a treaty between the empire and the barbarians, but a treaty between barbarians and a single Roman town. 
This treaty, combined with the lack of a noticeable Roman government in the demise of the army, as shown above, illustrates for Thompson that the imperial administration had completely disappeared from the province. This lack of imperial administration raises Severinus' profile in the region. Instead of merely being a mediator in village life and between the divine and man, Severinus becomes, in a sense, the de facto leader of Noricum, albeit an, an itinerant one. The political authority of Severinus is shown time and again throughout the commemoratorium. The people of Fabianus, as discussed above, came to Severinus for aid instead of the local tribunus when their town was raided by barbarians. Severinus went, then went to the tri tribunus and he commands him to attack the barbarians and gave him conditions on how to treat any prisoners taken. On another occasion, near the end of the holy man's life, people of Loriacum entrust Severinus with the ability to negotiate with the barbarians on their behalf. Severinus meets with Felotheus, the Rugian king, and successfully negotiates the settlement of the people. Further, bolstering Eugippius's portrayal of Severinus as having political authority, a barbarian king, Flacitheus, feeling troubled regarding the security of his reign, traveled to see Severinus rather than having the holy man travel to him. Although this can be explained plainly as a simple piety, despite there being followers of virgin Christianity, the implication, due to the nature of Placatheus' trouble, is that Placatheus saw Severinus as possessing some temporal authority. The similar episode occurs in chapter 19 of the Commemoratorium, when the king of the Alamanni, Gibaldus, travels to see Severinus. Eugippius, noticing the irregularity of the meeting, calls attention to Gibaldus's decision to travel to meet Severinus. This meeting deserves further scrutiny. Gibaldus came to meet Severinus at Batawis. Severinus does not allow Gibaldus to come into the city. Instead, Severinus goes out to Gibaldus. Severinus rebukes Gibaldus, causing Gibaldus to tremble vehemently. Gibaldus then agrees to release his Roman prisoners. Eugippius in this episode is making a clear parallel to the legend regarding Pope Leo's meeting with Attila. In the legend, Attila, having defeated the Roman army, was marching on Rome. Leo decided to ride out to meet Attila outside the walls. The two met, and Attila turn, turns his army around, allegedly due to fear of Leo and the wrath of God. Batali says the last Roman town in the region to have a Roman garrison is a clear standard for Rome, while Severinus and Gibaldus play the roles of Leo and Attila, respectively. This episode is not the only one where you give us parallels Severinus and the Bishop of Rome. On two occasions, the commemoratorium relates an episode in which Severinus orders a bishop to do something and the bishop assents. First, after the fall of Yoiaco, Severinus sent a letter to Paulinus, ordering him to begin a three-day fast for the entire diocese. Paulinus agrees, and the fast, according to Eugippius, saves the Roman forts from being overrun by the Alamanni. Then, in the town of Loriacum, Severinus orders the bishop of the city, Constantius, to distribute guards along the walls. Although Constantius does not immediately agree to this order, he does assent after a rebuke from Severinus. Again, the bishop, following the order of the holy man, leads to the salvation of the people from the barbarian attack. In both instances, we see Severinus, a non-ordained monastic, taking on the authority of the pope and ordering the bishop to do something. Eugippius is clearly arguing that Severinus has both political and religious authority over Noricum. The political authority taken on by Severinus and given to him by the townspeople has led to a great deal of speculation regarding his identity. As discussed above, Eugippius does not give many details regarding Severinus' life before his coming into Noricum, and he discourages people from looking into Severinus' origins. Modern scholarship has, however, attempted to fill in the blanks of Severinus' resume. A popular theory, first posited by Friedrich Lauder, is that Severinus is the consul Severinus of 461, who, the theory goes, came to Noricum after falling out of favor following the assassination of the Emperor Majorian. Although this theory has little merit due to the dating of the actions within the commemoratorium, for example, the commemoratorium begins with events that take place around 453 to 455, the idea that Severinus has some political news is credible. As discussed above, Severinus is shown to have political authority throughout the commemoratorium. Further, Severinus's ability to lead the defense of a city, to negotiate successfully with barbarians, and to successfully relocate segments of the Norican population on multiple occasions 
shows a competence that one does not expect from an ordinary monk. Severinus's political competence is also shown in his relations with the barbarians of the region. Although Severinus is a Nicene Christian and the barbarians of the region are Arians, Severinus deals with them in a way which is unique among late antique Christianity. Although the theological implications of his treatment are discussed by myself elsewhere, it is important to understand that Severinus, instead of rebuking the heretical barbarians as one expects from a holy man, embraces real politique. For example, when Flacatheus, the Regian king, first came to Severinus, Severinus, after waving away their theological differences, counseled Flacatheus. In this way, Severinus, on numerous occasions, made life better for the Roman Norcans through his meetings with barbarians. Severinus died on the 8th of January. Eugippius does not provide a year. And following his death, Eugippius hastens the fall of Noricum. Instead of blaming Emperor Zeno and his Rugian allies for the forced evacuation of the province, Eugippius connects the fall of the province to a prophecy made by Severinus shortly before his death. Eugippius ends the Norican stay in a satisfactory style for his readers, informs us that Severinus' greatest en enemy in the commemoratorium, Gizo, the wife of Felatheus, was captured along with her husband and taken to Italy as a prisoner. When the Noricans left the province, Severinus' monks, along with Eugippius, disinterred the holy men and brought him with them to Italy. Eugippius then relates the evacuation of the Noricans to Italy, connecting them with Israel's exodus from Egypt, before finally arriving at Castellum Luculanum outside of Naples. I apologize. Uh, we are about to run out of time, so okay. please just give us a closing statement if you would. Yeah. So, the Noricans are forced to abandon their province in 488. This flight was a common place for Romans along the frontier during this period of late antiquity. And we've seen in the commemoratorium that Roman control had already vanished from the region by the time of Severinus's adventus into the region, and it traced the demise of the Roman army and the Roman population in the province, culminating in the flight of the Noricans from Rome into Italy. It depicted a Noricum that gave Severinus implicit political control of the region. And a last little extra note. The Castellum Luculanum is possibly the same monastery where Romulus Augustulus, the final emperor of the West, is forced to go. So it's possible that Eugippius and Romulus Augustulus are there at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was a really fascinating talk. We do have a bunch of questions in the chat about the nature of these barbarians, uh, whether they were all the same tribes, but I'm afraid that we are really out of time. So if you can just give us just a little short response. <laughs> On the types of barbarians? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we start off with the Goths, and there is a section of Goths led by Odovacar who actually shows up in the middle of the commemoratorium and as a young man, and Severinus actually heals him. But the other barbarian groups around are just smaller groups that end up being kind of folded into the Goths after they take over Italy, like the Rugians, the Thuringi, the Amals, the Alamanni, etc. Okay, thank you so much. What a wonderful paper. Um, please. Uh, thank you so much to our wonderful chat who have been applauding. Uh, feel free to interact with them if you if you can see them. Uh, we do need to move on to our third speaker. I'm very excited for Babette Margolis. Um, she is a retired elementary school math teacher who graduated from Penn State University um, and a Master of Science from Western Maryland College. She served on the Maryland Council of Mathematics Board and the position of historian. Post-retirement, her journey took her into the world of archaeology and Near East art history and culture at Montgomery College. Um, she has done a number of volunteer work uh volunteer works at the national museum of history and other smithsonian museums and the aspen hill library board um please welcome for her paper leadership in the multicultural world of the achaemenid empire babette margolis thank you 
So I'm happy to be here today to share my presentation. So let me just share my screen. Yeah, coming to these ancient studies, I've had lots of questions. And in this presentation, I'm hoping will help explore some of those questions. Multicultural societies have existed for millennia. Yeah, however, today's world leaders seem to struggle with the notion of leadership in the multicultural world. The dilemma leaves us with these questions. Where did the contemporary views of multicultural leadership originate? How did ancient rulers deal with multicultural or multi-ethnic populations in their midst? This presentation will explore the question through the eyes of the rulers of the Achaemenid Empire, considered by some researchers to be the first empire in history to attempt to consciously unify the diverse population of lands that stretched from the Mediterranean in the west to the Indus Valley in the east, making it the largest empire of its time, basically being 550 BC to 320. My session goals are basically to look at the origins of the Imad Empire's multiculturalism and its beginnings in diversity. And then second, we'll look at, at the leadership and government and, and that came out of that history and the influences on the Achaemenid rule or styles of leadership. Finally, we'll look at the imperial structure that supported all of this and made it successful. Written records were scarce, even in the first millennium. Until recently, much of our knowledge of the Achaemenid world came from sources like Herodotus and other ancient Greek writers. However, today we have some other in his book, The Deep Well, Carl Neander, er, whose work I had the privilege of investigating, he puts it this way, the past speaks with many tongues, voices and words. Er, it's come to us from clay tablets, papyrus scrolls and inscriptions. But there are also other accounts of life and conditions of man, obscure ones, more manifold and harder to interpret. To listen to them and to try to understand them is the archaeologist's task. That is our task as well. The notion of multiculturalism is by its nature a nondescript entity. No matter the definition of multiculturalism, all definitions imply diversity of cultural characteristics. In order to interpret that, we need to look at a few parameters, including the definition of multiculturalism itself. And also, specifically, we need to look look at per the idea of perceptions, what we see, hear, and read. Because with so many views of the Achaemenid buyer being considered, we must take the approach that perception is in the eye of the beholder. This the perspective creates an opportunity to do that. Rob er, Rollinger, er, made a st specific statement about perspective seen between Herodotus living in 79 BCE and the perspective of the Achaemenid 
rulers. Here's what he said. The ancient Greeks invented a new form of dealing with the past, an investigative historical narrative. As for the Achaemenid kings, their version is more a narrative of deeds accomplished. It is up to us to critically evaluate these representations of the past to sort out multicultural ideals. Perspective is all a need and when <clears throat> And we look at the definition and the way we think about the past and the future. Uh, Stephen Mall describes the concept in the way that I hope we'll come to really look at closely. Here's what it, he said about it. The past lay before him. It was something he faced, whereas that which was coming, the future, was something he regarded as behind him, as at his back. In other words, the Achaemenids looked at their past, honored their past. And what do we do today? Our view is the opposite. We live in the present, but our gaze is fixed into the future. We worry about our law of how it will impact future generations. Our backs are to the past. In fact, we often ignore our history. We make decisions governmentally and otherwise, neglecting to consider knowledge learned from past experiences. Maul's definition of the past was especially true, as I said, for the Mid Empire. Much of what they did to establish and administer their empire reflected and honored civilizations that came before them, such as the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Elamites. This idea of facing the past embracing and honoring it was integral to the definition of multiculturalism and its origins as defined by Achaemenid rulers. Looking further down on the law, and we can look at these origins. Populations basically gravitated to the valleys and basins where fresh water collected, creating arable land. The lifestyle, for the most part, was agricultural. The climate at that time aimed. We're not so sure. However, what we do know is that recently geologists and others were able to determine that conditions were actually very variable, oh, semi-arid lands, dry. It was those lands that sites would eventually conquer. If you look at this particular slide, you notice is that um, the first piece of it looking at today shows the area that we're talking about. The second one looks at it from the ancient times where the peoples migrated into 
what is now considered Iran. They came into the plateau oh, from a variety of places. The land itself was more or less this mountainous and ruddy. As I said, when they settled, it was into these areas of the valleys. As, you know, for the leadership, you need to look at some other questions. How did the background of their geography and climate and cohesion of people with different languages, religions, and knowledge impact the formation and governance of the Achaemenid Empire as they strive to bring culturally diverse peoples together to form an empire that lasted for over 200 years and continued to have an impact even today? The empire is essentially created through a series of conquests, beginning with Cyrus the Great of Parsa, who in 550 BCE defeated the ruler of the Medes, whose capital was a Batana. Through conquest, the, the rulers became the host for diverse peoples. These cultural groups had their own rules, laws, and leadership, both formal and informal. The Hid family tree provides us with both the empire's name and the lineage that was honored in the establishment of the monarchical form of government. The tree evolved from the Indo-Aryan in nomadic pastoralist groups and from the Elamites. At Bennett's points, to the term that it can in it is the meaning family clan or family of Aka and Maine. That tribe was part of the Sargadate group of tribes. There were conflicting accounts of the identities of the earliest kings depending on where you look. Cyrus and his silk which is our oldest extant genealogy, uh, uh, and it gave one perspective. Herodotus histories concurred on part of that, and Darius history inscription basically said something similar, but pieces of it were different. Let's begin. And the actual story though with Cyrus and his conquest. We discovered evidence of Cyrus's conquest from an Syrian crafted black obelisk found in Pasargade, but originally crafted by Shalmanazar III, who lived 858 to 824 BC and the leader of in Nimrod at Assyria. It records the king's campaigns and tributes given to him. By many accounts, Cyrus the Great is the embodiment of a successful leader. He met Socrates' definition of successful leadership, the ability to distinguish the good from the bad and to know what to do or not to do. Plato, Plato described it thusly, the most basic condition to become a leader is to be a philosopher. He goes on to say that either philosophers should be kings or kings should be philosophers. Cyrus embodied this ideal. 
and conquest Cyrus are documented actually in several other sources. Cyrus Cylinder, Nip, his Cylinder and Chronicle, and a fragment known as 4Q242 of the Dead Sea Scrolls, just to name a few. Cyrus has been variously portrayed as brave, daring, tolerant, and magnanimous to his captives. For the information of Achaemenid rule, these qualities of leadership became just as important as the concept of leadership itself. The Cyrus Cylinder is considered by many to be the first declaration of human rights. It was dictated by scribes, scribes by Cyrus after his Babylonian conquest, written in Babylonian cuneiform and excavated from the foundation walls of Babylon by the British team of Hormid Rossum, who was an assistant, and who worked with the main person, Austin Henry Layard, by enumerating it a royal protocol and his family history. The text shows the respect that Cyrus II had for his own genealogy, in other words, his own past. Additionally, the text employs mechanisms to legitimize Cyrus's conquest and restoration of Babylon, thus establishing peace and good condition to his empire. It portrays the victorious Cyrus as pleasing to the Babylonian god Marduk and returning cultic objects, thus exhibiting his respect for the sacred beliefs of those he had conquered and epitomizing his views of religious freedom for all the peoples. This sequence sets an example of how Cyrus improved the lives of the citizens of Babylonia with his intent of honoring and bettering the lives of all peoples. The example illustrates his goal to repa repatriate displaced captives of the Babylonians. The inscription confirms Cyrus's general policy of returning the exiles to their dwellings and allowing them to take their gods with them and rebuild their sanctuaries. Another is leadership. The themes that can be explored by studying the monuments, reliefs, and inscriptions at Pasargade, the first capital of the Persian Empire. The site was most likely chosen for its symbolism. In fact, succeeding Akamen kings came there on important ceremonial occasions, and more importantly, this is the site of the investitures of each successive monarch. Cyrus' sense of orderliness is personified in the buildings of the central area where stone architectural elements with mud bricks are set with power orientation. This can also be seen in the landscaping in the gardens. His sense of beauty was probably the reason he kept this orderliness and had those gardens at Pasargada. Cyrus, not to honoring his background, as well as the peoples of his realm, can also be seen in the visible remains depict is on a four-winged figure that has Egyptianizing crown and the element I robe. Again, honoring 
the other customs and traditions. Cyrus displayed ingenuity in his organizational and administrative systems. At the apex of the administrative hire, he sat the king whose power was absolute and whose reign was regarded as divine. Multiple inscriptions record statements such as Hura Mazda has granted by the great of Hura Mazda or a great god is a Hura Mazda who created this earth, who created yonder sky. In other words, this Ahura Mazda was at the top of the leadership pyramid. The kings were not of divine origin. Rather, they ruled because of the theory of divine right of kings. Their kings, by the favor of Ahura Mazda. As these examples show, the reign is legitimized by the gods and the king is invested by them. He is their representative on earth. Moving to how that structure actually showed through. We know a dilemma that was faced by the king and kings. How to unite the, the people so that they would support the king, yet allow them to worship their own gods, continue with their own daily routines while living the life they chose. This goal was particularly accomplished by creating a multicultural system of administration that welcomed the in social classes, placing value on law, traditions, and cultures of the citizens of the empire. The rulers worked toward ensuring civil rights and the uniting the nations by promoting mutual respect through an inclusive government structure. This so, conquest created the need to establish political and economic policies that would equally support himself and the populations of the empire. He created policies by which groups could keep their lives, identities, property, and traditions while he himself retained the hereditary identity of kingship, which had been passed down through the royal clans of his Persian heritage. The the only thing Cyrus asked of the people he ruled was that taxes be paid, men provided for the armies, and that everyone should get along with each other as best they could. Another item of, about Cyrus is that he did not force his personal religious beliefs on the population he conquered. It's unclear what or he set up precise boundaries for the provinces before he died in 530, at least according to Babylonian letters. However, Cyrus and Lysus had left the empire as a somewhat loose federation of self-governing satrapies, subject to regular tribute and reliance largely on pre-existing institutions and person. Now, Darius I, who took the threat after Cyrus and Cambyses, set the empire on sound administrative footing by creating a completely new style of government. To understand and that government structure, we must visualize locations from which the laws and edicts are generated. This is true of us today. To understand how government works, we must comprehend the implications of a federal government whose legal edicts mandate from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, 
will rulers and regulations come in state governments and governors. The accumulated rulers set up much the same in system with the central administration and a provincial administration. Provinces were under the control of that central administration. Various imperial he had, as you can see in this slide, the emperor at the top, administrative officials and advisors just below him, and secretaries below them. Babette, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are running out of time. If you could make a, a brief closing statement. Sure. Let me just get to that. <laughs> There were, was much infrastructure, and that infrastructure, which <laughs> I'm going to flip through all these slides that I couldn't get to, they simply supported the multicultural world, you know, like the communication set enters to the provinces, written records that were done, trade that was established, religion which was not specified basically, and to kind of put it all together, er, the Persians basically changed the world's political and administrated his and forever by influencing the course of the events and the fate of many peoples. The humid rulers successfully developed an inclusive form of government by establishing an efficient bureaucratic style combining centralization of power with decentralization of the administration to positively impact diverse peoples with differing cultures, religions, and traditions. And to successfully bring them together under one united government. This benefited all in the multicultural world. So I want to thank everyone um, who helped me really get this all together and help me think through everything in order to be able to present to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babette. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions. There have been a couple about the um, multiculturalism as a response to previous empire, and I would love to talk about it, but maybe we can get that started in the chat. Meanwhile, thank you all so much for coming to our Paths to Leadership panel. It has been a fantastic experience. Thank you so much to our speakers who were absolutely wonderful and to our very active and lively chat. Uh, please stick around. We will now have a presentation from our Archeo Gaming live team, and you don't wanna miss that. Um, Alex and Kate, if you want to take over. Hi, can you hear us? Hi, everyone. Um, let me just share the slides. Um, can everybody see the slides? Yeah. All right. That's great. So um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, being here. We are Kate uh, and Alex. Um, and um, we'll briefly be presenting uh, what the SASA Archeo Gaming Live team uh, is and what we've been doing uh, for the past uh, year. Uh, but maybe let's just first introduce ourselves. Um, 
Uh, maybe I'll go first. I'm uh, Alexander van der Walle. I'm a joint uh, PhD researcher at the um, University of Antwerp and Ghent University in Belgium. And my PhD topic, uh, which I've been working on for two years now, is um, the characterization of Greek and Roman gods and heroes in video games. So I, I basically work with games uh, all day. Um, and Kate... Um, uh, hi, I'm Kate Mimiti. <laughs> Apologies for the for the bad voice and the, the constant coughing of just slightly coming out of COVID. Um, so I will not talk a lot today. I'm a PhD candidate um, at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Uh, my PhD, PhD topic has nothing to do with video games, uh, but I've been a gamer for as long as I could hold a joypad in my hands. Um, so I'm, I, I was very excited to start this new um, Archeo Gaming Live event uh, with Sasa. <laughs> Um, yeah, so maybe uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with what Archeo Gaming is, maybe we should just briefly um, sort of introduce that and, and clarify what that is. So Archeo Gaming is, uh, as, if I recall correctly, it's a term that was coined by Andrew Reinhardt in 2013, I think it was. Uh, but then he wrote a book on it and, and published it in 2018 called uh, Archeo Gaming, Introduction to Archaeology in and of Video Games. And that's basically what it is. Uh, it's so It sort of marries the concept of archaeology with video games it looks at representations of archaeology uh in games for example tomb raider uh, or uncharted um it looks at video games as archaeological sites for example you could have games where players create um uh, towns or where players create uh, settlements how does that work can we use archaeological methods to look at that um, but at the same time it's also the archaeology of uh, video games. So it's about looking how the material culture of video games has uh, evolved. And I think the best example of that is at the, uh, an, a large uh, archaeological dig, I think in 2014, where they uh, excavated the legendary Atari uh, burial ground where uh, hundreds of, of game cartridges of, I think, E.T., was it? In, in 1984, the, the, the game that crashed the American uh, game industry. Um, basically, and, and so they, they buried, Atari buried all of these cartridges somewhere in, in the desert in New Mexico, and then they um, excavated that um, in, in 2014, I think. So it's basically it's archaeology in and of video games. And um, we have been doing basically that, uh, looking at archaeology in uh, video games. I don't know if Kate wants to add something. <laughs> or... um, I will try. Um, so we, we tried to find um, a happy medium between being um, instructional and do uh, what uh, academics very pompously call outreach um, and also being entertaining because uh, we realized that people watching us uh, play for two hours, play a game for two hours and just talk about academia um, would not have worked. So we tried okay. to have guests that were, even if not gamers, could have um, a good time with the material that we were providing. Uh, and most of the times the people that came on had no idea what they were getting into um, <laughs> or what kind of games we were going to play. Um, the screen um, that Alex is showing now is um, one of the screens with our... Uh, uh, excellent uh, host for the time that was Dr. Mm -hmm. Brianna Jackson, um, with whom we were playing um, Assassin's Creed Origins Curse of the Pharaohs, and she had not played it before. Uh, but she is an expert in ancient Egypt and the Aten, um, uh, the Akhet Aten period. So it was um, uh, having her reaction to the recreation of Amarna in game was was priceless. Um, <laughs> so we yeah. tried, we tried to. Um, have a different expert every week. Um, when we could not have um, guests, we tried to fill in um, with things that we previously knew. Um, and the, the best part of this um, experiment, let's say, was how lively the chat was. Um, a, people showed up week after week um, to offer uh, suggestions on the game, to ask questions about the game, to ask questions about antiquity. Um, and to ask, you know, um, our experts things that were in their in their field of expertise, um, and we were very, very, um, very pleased with the the turnout um, in the chat and in terms of viewers too. Um, the chat to viewer thing on Twitch is not one to one. You can have way more viewers than people who are chatting, um, but our chat was never dead. So that was mm -hmm. uh, probably the best part of it and the most stimulating part of it because we would read 
the questions yeah. and then we would answer and people in the chat would also answer and start conversations on their own it was a beautiful synergy mm -hmm. that we created yeah that's true so so basically what we do is so we stream once every week um i mean usually it's uh, on friday at 2 p.m est so basically around this time that we do and um so we we play different games we talk about the games we play them simultaneously uh as well we're discussing them and people from everywhere can basically join in on Twitch and ask questions uh, or talk about uh, stuff they see. Um, so for the last uh, year, what we did in, in 2021, 2022, um, because it's also maybe it's, we should say as well, like th we aren't the first to do Sasa Archeo gaming. Like uh, the year before uh, Tina Razala, she did Archeo gaming live stream like once a month, but uh, we, basically uh, uh follow in her footsteps and we uh we, we, we turn it into this weekly thing she, so, she walked so we so we could run yeah yeah <laughs> True. walking simulator um but so what we've done the past year is we've played hades uh which is a great game uh setting uh, greek mythology uh we played uh the curse of the pharaohs dlc uh for, from assassin's creed origins with the game you just saw it's set in, in ancient egypt we played Uncharted 4 uh, with Dr. Bill Farley to talk about uh, representation of looting and, and heritage uh, and, uh, and preservation uh, of materials, preservation, uh, cultural artifacts. Uh, and then finally, we played Heaven's Vault, which is also like an archaeological game where you decipher inscriptions and it's very like uh there's lots to talk about in terms of uh, epigraphy uh but we also did a couple of specials uh for example we played uh valhalla and odyssey from assassin's creed uh, with both Liv albert who does the let's talk about myths baby podcast which was a lot of fun uh we also played it with adam beerstead uh, who does the ludo history um uh twitch channel uh who you should also really check out he does more uh, medieval uh, stuff but that he's amazing um we also did a special with the people uh for for who were developing the dream of darkness game uh, javier Rayon uh, nunez and andres rojas uh who are they're creating a game set in aztec uh, ancient aztec uh, culture like a very mythological game and we talked about what they do uh how they create a game what the creative process of that is um for the the birthday bash with sasa i think that was in april uh we had andrew reinhardt the, the founder the, the, i mean the the, the pioneer the, the godfather of archeo gaming we had him on and uh, he uh surveyed uh, various games with us i think we did fortnite we did no man's sky and fallout 76 if i remember correctly mm -hmm. and then we, yeah. we looked at how players engaged with that world archaeologically and for our uh, mother's day special we played this game which sounds much more horrible than it actually is it's called oedipus dating simulator um but it, it was a lot of fun it, it was it was great and it was uh, also a good example of classical reception in a video game that has nothing yeah. to do with classics but at the same time it has everything to do with classics at this, yeah really it's just, uh, what what better myth do <laughs> for a dating yeah, simulator we, we did not date our own mother <laughs> we did not. i want to make that clear <laughs> <laughs> Um, and if we look at the guests that we had in 2021-22, uh, we had a lot of different guests on. We, we had uh, academics, and we also had uh, game developers. For example, Greg Kasavin, who wrote Hades, uh, or Steve Morton, who was the uh, quality assurance tester uh, for Heaven's Vault. So we have a very hybrid mix, I would say, like a very diverse group of people, people uh, uh, who are expert in, in Greek mythology, but also or, or in Egyptian history, for example. It was a very um, uh, great mix. Um, and I think we also have some numbers. Uh, so I think in the past year, we, we got like 200 followers on Twitch, I think. Yeah. Uh, more than that, we, we did 30 plus episodes of this. And we, we usually stream for like two hours or more. So we streamed about 60 to 70 hours, uh, which I think is, is, is a lot. <laughs> but we, It is a lot. And we, yeah. we reached the status of Twitch uh, affiliates. So yeah. uh, we will, you know, that that is for streamers who are like very consistent in their, you know, in putting out new material. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't think we would. And then we did. And that was because we had a really great turnout of people who actually tuned in to watch us. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean, the fact that we're 
able to do that for two hours on end, I mean, means that we're, we, we have this great community uh, who's uh, speaking to us uh, while we're playing it. And uh, so the, the most successful stream that we did was the one with Hades, uh, for, I mean, the one of Hades with, with Hades Greg himself, Kisses, with Hades <laughs> himself uh, which was actually during an academic conference at the same time. So we both, we kind of married it to the, the academic part of it. Uh, the Heaven's Vault was also a highly successful one uh, with uh, Monica Hanna, who, who the game is basically inspired by. Um, so that was fantastic. Uh, and then the one with uh, Liv Albert uh, for Assassin's Creed Odyssey, that was also one of the, 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 the most viewed ones. It was a great joining of, of chaotic minds um, yeah. <laughs> to, you know, to freak out over, over a video game and me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we thought we would also like, we, we would sort of tease or to give like a brief insight into what we're doing next year. Uh, I don't know if you want to <laughs> do the honors. Um, yes. Um, so we uh, we are trying to branch out and not do um, as many classics and Egyptian games anymore. Uh, we're trying to branch out. So we're going to play, um, I apologize for butchering the pronunciation, Skadma, Snowfall, um, which is a game based in um, Sami mythology. Yeah. We have, I have no idea what to expect. Uh, we're going to play the DLC of Immortals Phoenix Rising Myths of the Eastern Realm, which deals in um, Chinese mythology. We are going to play God of War Ragnarok because we will have to play the most massive AAA game <laughs> to come out yeah. this year. Um, like uh, We have high expectations. Um, we will play Tomb Raider because there cannot be Arco Gaming without talking about Dr. Lara Croft. Um, we might double in a Total War Saga Troy. Um, and we might also play Pendragon, so move slightly forward in time, uh, but still, you know, in the general era of antiquity. And we have a few specials. Um, we will have the authors of the book Women in Classical Video Games for September. We will play The Frogs, which is an absolutely delirious take on the already delirious Aristophanes play The Frogs, um, but with some Renaissance art in it. We will have a special that we are really looking forward to on oracles and video games, which some virtual reality stuff. So stay tuned for that. Um, we are planning a roundtable on myths and the Marvel Cinematic Universe with other scholars in November 2022. And then for our Valentine's Day special, we will romance um, cities around across Europe in while we play as Vikings in Doki Doki Ragnarok, uh, because we need to have at least one delirious game for the year. This, this time yeah. we will do more. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we we hope um, to have you know an even better turnout for for next mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Um, we are playing um, a lot of interesting games, and most importantly, we're playing games that neither of us have played before, yeah. apart from Tomb Raider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, God of War Ragnarok will literally be our I mean first impression because the game exactly. is released in November. Exactly. Uh, so how can you support us? Uh, so if you enjoy these events, you can become a supporter uh, with a recurring monthly donation. Uh, for as little as $3 a month, you can help us save ancient studies. Uh, and you can, there's a website uh, on, the, on the slide here, safeancientstudies.org slash donate, where you can learn more. Uh, and you can also subscribe to Twitch, uh, where you might be even watching this. So if you scroll down, you should see this donate button or subscription button uh, where you can just click. And if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, I think you get one free Twitch subscription as well. Um, so if you have that, maybe you want to spend it on us. I don't know. Um, and I think that's basically yeah. what we have. Um, right, right on the clock. Right um, on the clock. <laughs> come follow us on Twitch. Uh, yeah. sub subscribe if you can. If you can't, just give us a follow, which, which helps. Uh, mm -hmm. And tune in. We're gonna start again September fifth, I think. Uh, yeah, September fifth is the the Women in Classical Video Games uh book event, mm -hmm. and then the week after we start uh, we start playing Scatma. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> Perfect. So I'll stop sharing now, mm -hmm. and I think we are ready for the roundtable now. Right? Indeed, indeed. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, that handoff wasn't quite elegant, but I think that's my fault for not picking it up fast enough. 
Um, so I'm super happy to be here today. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, um, where I'm a uh, professor of classical studies and uh, I'm serving as senior associate dean for faculty affairs. Um, I think the work being done by this group is critical for the future of, um, you know, the, our disciplinary interests. Um, and not to put it too broadly, but also sort of humanistic presence in the public. Um, but I don't want to speak too much. I want to be a little transparent about the fact that my relationship with this work is conflicted because I've never been outside the academy, at least not since I was in high school. Um, so that's why I'm really happy to be able to support it as I can. Um, and here are some of the great ideas that the people in this roundtable have on how I can help support them, um, but also how we can build a community um, that's more supportive of the work that we do together and all of the different um, personalities um, and abilities that we bring to our work. Um, so today that we have three people who are going to speak. Um, I'm going to introduce them first um, and then we'll have uh, after they speak um, three rounds of questions and I'll kind of push it so we can get to each of the topics ahead of time. Um, and the basic questions are how do we support independent scholars better? How do we foster integration between independent scholars and traditional academic structures? And um, how do we reach and engage more independent scholars to uh, work with this organization? Um, so our uh, members who are talking about this today Today, uh, to start, it's David Danzig. Uh, David received his PhD from the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World of New York University, and he studies the social history of migration and immigrants in the first millennium BCE in the ancient Near East. He's also the creator and lead researcher of the Shinati Project, which is reconstructing the Babylonian chronology of the first millennium BCE to this day, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. David started Sasa two and a half years ago um, to take proactive action on the issues that ancient studies is facing and to make a better ancient studies for all of us in the future. Um, David will be followed by Austin Blackman. Um, Austin graduated from Fuller Seminary, where he studied Hebrew Bible and Northwest Semitic languages. He currently works as a Hebrew Bible data specialist for Blue Letter Bible. He has written curriculum for numerous Bible courses for TL education and has an article being published in the upcoming volume of Textual History of the Bible. Austin has been working with SASA for about a year as the independent scholar and alumni coordinator. Uh, coordinator. And third, uh, Heather Rosemarin is an attorney and independent scholar whose research interests um, and I lost my script trying to let someone in. His research interests include ancient Roman history. Uh, based in California, uh, Ms. Rosemarin is an active member of SASA's Independent Scholars Working Group, where she leads the initiative to compile resources for independent scholars in ancient studies. Uh, she holds an AB in Classics from Princeton University, a JD from the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and travels frequently to the Mediterranean and has participated in archaeological excavations in Greece and Italy. So, um, David, do you want to get us started? Sure. Thank you, Joel. Thanks so much for joining us today and leading this group. Um, first thing, uh, what I want to talk about today is um, about independent scholarship and the role I see that it needs to play in the future of ancient studies. Um, but before I give the introduction to this session, my introduction, I'd like to take a moment to share my screen and show everybody um, something that we've all, we've been working on at SASA for the last year, and that I'm hoping you'll like. So here is the uh, title page and table of contents from the proceedings from SASA's first virtual conference from last year, which we ran together with Digital Hammurabi. Megan Lewis, who is our co-editor. We have several wonderful co-editors who've been working on this project throughout the course of the year. And a bunch of our presenters from last year are publishing their work um, together in this volume. This volume is under contract with Archeo Press in the, one of their um, open access series because we wanna bring um, our independent scholars scholarship to the public in a way that anybody can access it um, in any, place in any format that they that they have access to, um, rather than it stay, sitting behind a paywall so people can't read this wonderful scholarship. And um, we're expecting that we will continue doing this year after year with the proceedings of this wonderful conference. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you, all of you. If you want to download a version of this 
um, title page and table of contents. It's on the virtual conference um, webpage, saveancientstudies.org slash virtual hyphen conference. Right below the chat, um, there's a row of things that you can click on, and one of them is to download this table of contents so you can take a look at it yourself. All right, now let me go on. SASA promotes and supports ancient studies engagement in informal contexts, in the public humanities, and in schools at all academic levels. We aim to grow the number of people involved in the academic pursuit of ancient studies scholarship and to expand the opportunities for this pursuit to everyone. So a natural consequence of this is that we will increase in the number of graduates who have their sights set on an academic career in the future. If jobs available in academia do not likewise increase, which we hope they will, but if they don't, this sets up a disaster of an overtrained, underemployed or unemployed, indebted and disillusioned cadre of people with doctorates and master's degrees and many who opted out earlier along the course of their studies. So how could we possibly advocate in good faith to influence the lives of people towards such an awful predicament? It's even worse. The fact is that this isn't some hypothetical future. It already is the case. Many fully trained, well-regarded young ancient studies scholars cannot find employment in academia. There simply are not enough positions to accommodate the output of the current graduate programs. The situation has worsened to the degree that a negative feedback loop is operating. Dozens and dozens of suitable applicants pursue every single job opening. Search committees must act in good faith for their schools and their applicants, and therefore the demands upon job prospects are ever higher. This pushes young scholars to work even harder, to do even more, in order to reach the top of that list to get that job. But is this actually helping ancient studies? Do schools and departments benefit from this? Do students benefit? Does the scholarship benefit? And then there's the personal toll that's exacted upon so many. Graduate students and those holding doctorates regularly operate under enormous pressure. Anxiety and depression are common. Fulfillment in other areas of their lives is often delayed, if not dismissed. Women in particular face the tremendous dilemma of how to build a family while pursuing their scholarly passions. Many live in a precarious financial limbo as they attempt to keep their window of hireability open. Then there may come the soul crushing day when a scholar decides to move in a different direction with their lives, with their careers. So often giving up on their passionate work to which they dedicated so many years of their life, usually over a decade. We believe that this crisis has to be addressed. The current situation of the mismatch between the number of qualified graduates and the number of available positions in ancient studies is absolutely untenable. It's time to come to terms with the notion that this simply will not change. No matter how many people become engaged in ancient studies, no matter how many students take Introduction to Greek or Archaeology 101 or World History 1, no matter how much publicity new discoveries garner, Howsoever successful we will be in, with SASA in growing Asian studies, there will not be commensurate growth in teaching and research positions. It's time to actually accept this and adapt. Our solution that we've been working on for over a year is to reimagine what it means to be a scholar. We need to separate the concept of scholar from academic. An Asian studies scholar is anyone who has achieved sufficient mastery over a set of materials so that they're able to engage in current scholarly discourse on that matter. An academic is someone who works at a teaching and research institution. A scholar has a lifelong passion. An academic has an occupation. Although there are many paths to becoming a scholar, all such paths must be supported and included with our, within our community of ancient studies scholars. The purpose of this roundtable discussion is to continue our work on building toward a new acceptance of independent scholars and their integration into and normalization within the ancient studies community. In fact, this is one of the main goals of this whole conference, that by bringing together excellent scholarship of independent scholars, 
All of the presenters you've heard today, aside from our keynotes, are independent scholars. People will understand their value and belonging, the value and belongingness of independent scholars within the community of scholars. So let's work on solutions to the problems together that make independent scholars, independent scholarship difficult and that hold back the inclusion of independent scholars in the broader ancient studies community. So first I'd like to turn things over to Austin Blackman and to Heather Rosemarin, who will present what we've been working on over the last year, since last year's virtual conference in SASA's Independent Scholars Working Group. And then we'll all return together and have a discussion of the many problems I'm working towards solutions for how to make this all possible. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, like you said, these roundtables that we are gonna have through this conference today and tomorrow came about from the conference last year and this creation of the Independent Scholars Working Group. So with that, I'm going to share um, a Google Doc that all the notes from this roundtable will be recorded on. So your guys' uh, replies, things we discussed are going to be recorded and you'll have access to view that um, and use that as a resource. So that will be in the chat. But I'm going to report on um, the SASA's Independent Scholar Working Group accomplishments since last year's conference. And it'll be followed by an open forum discussion um, to talk about topics related to the reimagining of ancient study scholarship in community as a passion rather than a vocation. The field of ancient studies consists of a wonderful tight-knit community of scholars Though they are spread across the though they're spread, spread across the world, scholars see each other regularly at conferences and events held by various learned societies and departments. However, this community has strict boundaries imposed by the limited number of academic positions available, as David discussed, and reinforced by the attitude that to be a scholar, one must be directly part of an academic institution. As you work to expand participation in the ancient studies field. This model of the self-defined of the community of scholars and the attendant attitude of exclusive must change. SASA envisions a new ancient studies in which all are not only welcome, but also actively incorporated into the study of the deep past of all places and cultures. Any scholar of the ancient world should have a place in and be able to contribute to the ancient studies scholarly community. Together, we aim to pool our efforts and to make real change. So that's kind of our goal for these roundtables, goal for the entire community group that was developed out of last year. And since then, we've had two major projects that we've been working on. One is the Let's Get Published um, events that we host monthly, and then a resource page um, in a gathering of resources really that Heather has been leading and she'll report on. And then third is the conference as a whole in the roundtables that we will be having um, these next two days. So uh, first, I want to say the SASA Independent Scholar Working Group uh, was created after last year's virtual conference um, and has met regularly over the past year. We meet each month and discuss um, life as independent scholars and opportunities to further the research of independent scholars. From these meetings, we began our two projects um, that are our monthly Let's Get Published events and then our resource project. So Let's Get Published event uh, that was developed over the past year has hosted six events so far. These events, um, people submit their working projects to the events page and then we assign them a day and they are gonna present their project. They have about 10 minutes and they're gonna present their project, um, talk about error uh, issues and things that they need assistance on. And then there is a community of scholars, independent scholars in that call that will give advice and give input and discuss their working project. So independent scholars and traditional scholars alike uh, meet to present their working projects in the area in which they need advice. People who attend these meetings listen to the presenters then engage in a discussion regarding their project and address the presenters questions. We have presentations from a wide range of topics in ancient studies and I want to share my screen to show you some of um, the presentations we've had so far. So if you can see this, um, here are a lot of the topics that we've explored. Um, wide range and the people presenting are from very different backgrounds. Some are doing like this, here their master's thesis, some are doing their doctrinal work, others are trying to get a book published or an article done or they have their own blog. So very wide range of goals for their projects um, and a wide range of topics that we dis um, discuss as well. 
Um, so that is uh, probably one of our biggest um, events that has come out of last year's conference and something that we're going to continue to do. We continue to have people signing up. We've actually have less presenters each event because we want to have more time to talk about them. So as this grows, we're going to have to have more meetings and go from maybe once a month to twice a month and have more people host these meetings, come to these meetings to discuss and be audience members. But in all, it is growing tremendously with people wanting to talk about their projects and get advice from a community of scholars. And then the second major project uh, that Independent Scholar Working Group has been working on is the gathering of open source resources available for independent scholars. As most of us might know, resources can be difficult to get if we're not part of a institution, but Heather has done a great job showing that this is not the case and there's actually a ton of resources out there for people who aren't part of institutions um, and need access to resources. So Heather's been leading this project and uh, I'm going to give it to her so she can give us an update on the project and its goals and areas in which we'd like it to grow. Thanks so much Austin, David, and Joel and greetings to everybody from California. I'm Heather Rosemarin and I've been um, involved in the SASA group for about a year and it's been a wonderful, warm, welcoming, and supportive community. And I encourage everyone to get involved. Um, the I think we should post some links in the chat, both to the um, Let's Get Published Fora and the working group in general, so folks can sign up um, if they are interested. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a brief PowerPoint. And let me make sure that hopefully this works. Let's see. Hmm. Apparently, my system preferences aren't set up for this. Austin, could you maybe pull up the PowerPoint? Yes, give me a second. I will go get it. OK, thanks. So um, let me give a little bit of background on the origin of this project. Um, at the In our discussions uh, in the Independent Scholars Working Group, um, it, people have shared a lot of their concerns, the challenges they face as independent scholars. Um, and among these are um, not having an institutional affiliation, um, not feeling uh, perhaps comfortable going to professional conferences. Um, perhaps they don't know um, where the, which publications are open to reviewing submissions from independent scholars. So in order to um, explore these topics, we set up a Google Sheet with 12 subject areas. And um, it looks like we're about to, great. Thank you so much, Austin. So um, could you advance to the next slide? Great. So I already covered the background. Um, so to, as I said, after these issues were identified, we created a subgroup of volunteers to survey existing resources available to independent scholars um, with two goals, support independent scholarship in Asian studies and identify and address gaps in resources and other barriers to independent scholarship. Um, and our process is really ongoing as people find resources, they put them into the Google sheet. I kind of, I continually add to it um, as the months roll on. And the idea is that once we reach critical mass in these different topic areas, we'll publish them um, as kind of mini guides to independent scholars um, in this field, uh, perhaps in the form of a blog, perhaps in the form of um, you know, a, a PDF on the SASA website, the actual form um, for sharing has not been determined yet. Austin, could you advance, please? I think it's useful for the discussion to review um, some definitions of what is an independent scholar or who is an independent scholar. Um, so I think David has a really interesting definition, um, which is the last bullet point here. Anyone who has achieved sufficient mastery over a set of materials so that they are able to engage in current scholarly discourse on that matter. Um, a National Coalition of Independent Scholars defines an uh, independent scholar as someone pursuing knowledge in or across any field who is not affiliated with an institution of higher learning in a tenure track position. So interestingly, that, that one, that definition would include independent scholars 
who are perhaps adjuncts or um, postdocs or in some role that's not tenure track. Wikipedia defines independent scholar as anyone who conducts scholarly research outside universities and traditional academia. So that really is, draws more of a bright line between academia and independent scholarship. Um, I kind of like the Canadian Academy of Independent Scholars definition, lifelong learners, avid readers and researchers, curious travelers and thoughtful practitioners who are not affiliated with the University of Scholar. And finally, um, the Independent Scholars Community on, independent, on Humanities Commons defines an independent scholar as someone who produces research, which can be published or presented at conferences outside of a tenure tech teaching position in a university. Um, so there's clearly some commonalities in these definitions, but also some distinctions. And of course, it's up to anybody, you know, each of us to decide kind of which, you know, how we um, see ourselves as independent scholars. But needless to say, there is, you know, definitely a lot of flexibility and um, openness in these definitions. Austin, could you please advance? So in our gathering of resources, we've identified these categories, institutional affiliations, platforms, which would be sites such as academia, which um, .edu, which serve multiple functions. They could be self-publishing platforms, their social networking platforms, their um, their research sharing platforms. And that we've identified four or five that we think are of interest. Um, memberships in learned societies and um, professional networks and history organizations. Interestingly, out of the dozens and dozens of um, ancient studies and history organizations that I have looked at and looked at their, I've looked at their criteria and they're all open to independent scholars. So this goes to what David was talking about earlier that perhaps the barriers we imagined into, you know, independent scholarship are not quite as high as we initially thought. Um, because I haven't actually encountered to date um, a resource that says, nope, can't come in, can't do this, can't join, can't participate. So I think that's good news. So I think what we need to do is, you know, encourage people to sally forth and present their research and submit their, their ideas and their publications and their presentations. And then we'll, you know, see what happens. If there's a barrier encountered, we can try to address it. Four is research. I mean, certainly access to libraries and tools like JSTOR are an issue that come up a lot. Um, and we have some potential solutions for that. Um, where to publish comes up a lot, where to present comes up a lot. And I think SASA has some great ideas about putting together a conference aggregator so we can keep better track of um, when the upcoming conferences are. Um, that's seven, one of the conferences. Eight, archeological field work opportunities. Nine, continuing education for people who want to study, continue their study of ancient languages, for example. Um, 10, of course, funding um, is a uh, constant topic, except for, I guess, those who are retired or um, have another source of support, perhaps from a career they're pursuing. Um, 11, inspiration and 12, community. Um, and below is a link to the Google Sheet. I don't know if it's active um, from the PowerPoint, but um, you can sort of see what we've gathered so far. And I'm gonna just share one example, Austin, if you could advance. Institutional affiliation. So the problem that was identified was that outside of academia, ancient studies scholars often lack the benefits of institutional affiliation, such as the opportunity to post an online profile, a business card, letterhead, um, which they can use to perhaps write to a library or an archive. Um, the ability to apply for grants because oftentimes individuals are not eligible for grants, only organizations or institutions and library access privileges. These are some of the barriers. So as a solution, several organizations offer independent scholars who meet their membership criteria an array of institutional benefits. And there, these are two that we have um, explored, um, National Coalition of Independent Scholars and Institute for Historical Study. Um, membership fees are in the order of 40 or $50 a year. They're not terribly high. Um, and so I encourage anybody who's interested in, in institutional affiliation to explore these groups and see if they are interested in applying and accessing these benefits. Next slide. So if you're interested in these questions about institutional, you know, uh, about addressing barriers to um, independent scholarship and encouraging independent scholars to take advantage of the resources that are in fact out there, um, consider participating in our working group and our Let's Get Published Fora. 
providing feedback on the resources category. There's 12 categories. Um, are they covering everything? Are there major uh, areas that we're missing? Consider contributing ideas and links to the Google Sheet. Um, consider working with us to develop SASA guides for publication. Um, and I think, you know, as we develop the conference aggregator, David, I think it would be great to have some folks involved in forwarding conference announcements and RFPs and so forth. Um, this is the website for independent scholars that we are working with. And then finally, I posted here the attic red figure owl as a reminder of the importance of ancient wisdom, <laughs> because that's what that means to me. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Heather, Austin, and David for giving us all that information. And I also want to state that um, I think the way that you have formulated it is really productive and helpful, starting with naming some of our challenges, but then being proactive and thinking about ways of reimagining the work that's done traditionally in the academy over the past, let's say, a few centuries, but by no means intrinsically located there. Um, so in that spirit, then, um, we've selected sort of three uh, sets of questions to sort of push this a little farther. And I'd like to invite people to raise their hands digitally if they would like to contribute. Um, and when you do, please introduce yourself. And if you're comfortable, um, turn on your video um, so we can you know, share your presence with each other. As a note, of course, we do have community standards. Um, so please do ab abide by them and know that uh, you'll, you'll get a fast hook um, if you don't. All right? um, but I doubt that's going to be the problem. For those of you who have, ac who have access um, to the chat, right here. I've put sort of the, the plan questions in there, or at least I'm trying to. Um, and we'll just move through them as we can. And I've got a Zoom freezing issue. Um, all right. So the first question that we're going to talk about is what are um, the specific barriers that independent scholars face? Um, and how can we support independent scholars better? Um, so I'll lean a bit on um, the panelists who've already spoken, unless I get a hand uh, hand to start with. Um, but Heather, while we're waiting for people to absorb a little bit, um, in your experience, what, what have been some specific barriers you faced um, that you'd like to address more? Well, I think, um... The initial barriers that I personally faced were that I really had no community around me. So, um, so when you're in academia as either a student or an educator, um, you have this ready-made community of people who are, share your interests in ancient studies. And so whether it's at a seminar or, you know, just over in the library or for, you know, in a, in a coffee meeting, um, you're able to bounce ideas off people. You're able to talk to people. You're able, you know, to ask their their advice. Um, and so SASA, I think, has really stepped up and filled that gap. There are other intentional communities of independent scholars, but as far as I know, SASA is the only one that is really focused on independent scholars for in the ancient studies field. So I feel like that was one barrier that is being successfully addressed thanks to the leadership of David and Austin and SASA. And I think that's a, a really good point to bring up because even, you know, uh, academics who end up in small departments or in places that aren't focused on research are still around people who value the work they're doing um, and expect them to do it. So being separate from that and being somewhere else where it's not a common practice um, can be demotivating. Um, Julie, I see your hand. You're muted, Julie. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just wanted to to add the lack of community and the surprising depth of lack of resources. I mean, you already mentioned the problem of the lack of libraries, uh, but as someone in in classics specifically, I found that I'm no longer even able to do my own searching because I'm used to the tools for searching for materials that the institutions always provide, La Nefila Logique in particular, for those of you following along on that side. So like this is a really hard barrier to overcome even when you do have community. Yeah. And so that, and that's, I mean, um, my, <laughs> My bad solution to that is to pirate materials all the time, um, but that's not um, sustainable. And oh, now that this is being broadcast, that was a joke. 
Um, but you know, one of our other one of um, our chat members, um, uh, Max underscore KF, um, says a significant barrier is how much of that scholarly publishing is behind a paywall. Um, so if you're not part of an academic institution, um, this can change. And there are some fields where open access is much more common. The sciences that are government funded, you have to publish a lot in open access ways. And more in the um, in Europe and the UK, this is true. Um, and sort of a backdoor way of solving this is just asking people to share publications with you. I certainly would do that all the time. But this puts an unfair burden on people outside the academy. Academy, right. Um, and it really sort of it, it, it um, disincentivizes um, working with their materials. Um, so we've got a new person coming in. Um, so the community is a problem. Resources, access is other to the problem. And one of the solutions you've already shown, shown for both of these is sort of collective action. Right. So as a group has SASA looked into sourcing some of these materials and providing access. I'm sorry, now I'm asking you questions. Uh, Heather, I see you raising your hand. Well, first, let's let's make sure we all are aware of the access that's already available. OK, so um, I think, you know, one I recommend everybody um, explore the access they can have as an alumni of their institution. So um, if you, for example, if you go to JSTOR, um, in addition to the 100 free articles a month you can search for, they have a list of all the um, universities that they have a relationship with. They have, a, they have contracts with the alumni associations, not with the universities themselves, but as alumni, there are search privileges. So, um, and that's, they say on their website, that's a partial list, contact your alumni association. I don't know if that addresses Lane Philologique, um, but it's a, it's an it's an example of kind of thinking almost like in an entrepreneurial way about how do I get access to these resources, you know, and contacting the groups you have ongoing relationships with, um, such as your alma mater, um, or perhaps joining um, the uh, the different independent scholar organizations may have discounted. Um, subscriptions, um, then there's just the, um, I mean, obviously everybody here is a research expert. So I don't want to presume that folks haven't already tried these things. I mean, I'm just putting it out there as that sometimes there are solutions. And um, uh, thanks, Teresa, for that. No, many alumni groups are actually open to non-alumni. Um, you know, so like work you know, working your existing networks, or if you're in, and I know this is not true for everybody, but if you're near a major public university, um, exploring whether they have a um, program that offers members of the public access to the university collections. So, um, you know, I have an alumni relationship with UC Berkeley, which gives me access to literally everything, everything in their system. Um, but they also have um, some programs that are open to the public as well. So that's you know where I would start um, to explore before necessary. I mean, SASA, of course, you know, it would be interesting to if if we hit dead ends. I mean, if we hear from our community, you know, I've tried all these things and I'm still hitting a dead end, and I think I and other scholars really, really, really need access to X, then. Maybe we try to explore a, um, you know, like a concierge solution for for SASA folks. And Heather, I want to raise up what you're saying um, in two counts. One, uh, many professional organizations give access to materials that you might be surprised about. So if you're part of a, you know, Cam West Cl Classical Association of the Midwest and South um, or SCS, you get like access to the low classical library, um, or at least it, you used to. Um, but also uh, public institutions, state institutions are often part of networks. So I used to teach in Texas um, and UT Austin's library was part of TechShare. Um, so if you got a, a public library card at any library in Texas, you could go there and use the materials or just walk in without the library card. You just couldn't take stuff out. Um, and even some public institutions, I know in Massachusetts, um, people can walk into uh, the Brandeis and Tufts libraries, uh, but you don't have you know the login information for the electronic access. Um, so one thing before sort of shifting our gaze towards the next set of questions I want to bring up is what collective action can do. 
Um, so part of it, I think, is getting working with academics and non-academics to advocate more for open access publishing. Um, this is something that I really, really want to focus on um, because as we publish, we can choose to publish open access work. Um, we can also choose to support it in other ways. It's not a silver bullet, uh, but hopefully it, it can um, you know, uh, mitigate some of the challenges. Of course, there are always going to be things like manuscripts um, that we're not going to have access to because it's not open access, um, but it but it is a start. Um, so we have a couple more minutes for this prompt. Uh, maybe one question left. If there's anybody else who has another thought about either what um, specific barriers independent scholars face or um, some ways to support them. And I'll sort of do that thing like Dora the Explorer where I blink and look at the screen. Okay. I think we can shift then over to this question number two, uh, which keeps us more or less on schedule, um, which is building on this first one, but how do we foster in integration between independent scholars and academia? What are the ways that we can do it? Um, and I'll just sort of put my own twist on there. Who's responsible for this, right? Where does sort of the burden um, way, or sorry, fall? Um, so what? how do we foster this integration and cooperation too? And maybe on this one, I'll start with you, David. David, do you have any thoughts about, um, you know, fostering uh, collaboration between uh, academic scholars and uh, independent ones? Well, I'm definitely the, the right person to pick on for this. Um, I think it's an incredibly difficult problem. And, and that's really why we started with this conference is to, to first of all, to show um, people out there and to show academics that independent scholars can do real scholarship. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a misconception. I think there's a whole set of attitudes that are really the largest base of the problem um, that people within academia, which means um, from my perspective is people who hold jobs and positions and students collectively build up this attitude that people who are not within academia um, me, we're, don't um, have the same level of quality in their scholarship or in their studies. And that's just patently false. Um, obviously it's difficult to do high quality scholarship when you have other time commitments, but that's also true within the academia. Everybody has other time commitments <laughs> to m many different things that they don't spend all of their time, 60 hours a week or 40 hours a week on their scholarly pursuits. That's just not true. They're teaching and they're doing um, lots of other administrative tasks along the way. So I'm not sure if that really went to, to the question, um, but I think understanding, beginning to understand that independent, that not being within an academic framework does not impinge on the quality and level of scholarship is the first important step. And I, the, the thing that I struggle with is where the meeting points are going to be. Where are independent scholars going to be in physical or virtual spaces together with academic scholars? Where are they going to be able to mingle and talk to one another? Because that's how it's gonna have to work for people to build uh, an integrated community. Thank you, David. And, you know, not to, to add sort of flavor to it, even within academic standards, there are pecking orders, right? If your PhD comes from places, if your appointment is out of place, um, it can color the way people receive you. Um, so, Brian, I see your hand. Would you unmute and just sort of say hi? Hi. So I'm the uh, I'm the uh, flip side of all that because uh, and, and David, David and I are go back very far um, because I am the complete independent scholar, if you will. I'm not involved in, a, in an institution. I have a profession completely outside of this. And I would really say that part of the answer is starting from scratch of even defining the term, what are you defined by scholarship to people? You know, I'm a reader. I read a lot of different things in a lot of different areas. I bring them all together. I try to integrate them in some way. Um, and, but it's not necessarily in the formal way. I mean, I finished the master's 20 years ago. So what does it look like to go through a career and want to get back into it uh, many years later? What does it look like to have those conversations? Where are the forums? I mean, this is, you know, that's where SASA came into play and some of the, and we have the technology today to really foster that, but we have to start by breaking down some of those jargons and terms 
and then rebuilding them, of course, as we're building the scholarship, um, because there are many people out there who, not just dabblers, but really people who have spent a lot of time on a subject who've gone really deep into something, but maybe don't have the tools um, to take it to their next step or just haven't uh, exercised those tools in so many years. And so when they wanna come back into it, they feel like they are really are at square one. They don't, you know, you want to, let's say you wanna go back to school. How do you open that door when you're the people who were your mentors, professors and so on are no longer there, no longer, or you have no relationship to them and you're not the person you were when you were younger. How do you, um, where do you knock on the door? How do you deal with, you know, how life and the finances are? I think all these things play a role, but I think that starting number one in that term of, okay, what does it define you as a scholar? really is a fundamental beginning question to the whole thing. And, and Brian, I'll just take a chance, a, a moment to sort of recap some of the great things you said before we go to Heather and Austin, um, because there are some themes there that, that I want to raise to the top, right? One is that technology has changed the access we have to scholarship, but it also changes our products, right? A question, a conversation we're not having enough in the academy is why do we still put so much focus in the humanities on the single authored monograph, right? Technology has changed the need for it. And just as you're saying, it's not necessarily the type of contribution that anybody can make or that anybody can use, right? Um, as someone who has written books, has been a book review editor, I can say that I have mixed feelings about them. Um, another thing um, that, that you mentioned um, is, is again, the, the time and the, and the community. So um, Julie brought up in the chat, um, the independent scholars don't necessarily have the time to focus on their work. Um, and it may take longer to come out. It may come out in a different form, Brian, as you're saying. Um, but as someone who's traditionally in the academy, I can say that the passion and knowledge that you find on things like Reddit, even Twitter, right? Um, it's pretty significant. I think it rivals Alexandria and Scolia easily. Um, and often it gives me a run for, for my money. Um, so I'm going to break the order and I'm going to invite Babette to come in and, and join us um, because she hasn't spoken yet. And then uh, Heather and Austin, I'll get back to you. Thanks. I just have a kind of thought to add to this discussion that we've been having now on the relationship between the independent scholars and the academics. And it actually comes from a SASA reading group that John Habersham and I just finished. We decided to maybe extend an invitation to some academics that we knew with the hope that maybe they would just kind of join in. We were not asking them to present or do anything specific, just be part of the reading group and then share any knowledge they had. The reading groups are basically independent scholars who have signed up for it. This worked very, very well as a means to actually make that connection because I took a chance, you know, I'm just a, a volunteer in a number of organizations and my Smithsonian research that I got involved in, and I was introduced to several well, scholars, I said, okay, I'm going to like cold, instead of cold call, it was cold email, and all of them. And I had very little hope that I would even get a response, let alone have them join me. I was surprised. I got a response from every single one of them. And we did have one of them join us. And I think the point being is that then that individual said he would be telling his students uh, about uh, uh, and gives you know, some more of the clues. So I think the point is, if, if we take our own involvements in a variety of organizations and then try to make those connections you know, to the academics, but from an independent perspective, all of a sudden you have this larger base to build from. Thank you, Babette. And what, what I like about what you're suggesting is to echo sort of David's question, like how do we create new community? How do we create new 
new spaces. Um, my worry there as someone who, who's been invited to these groups and loves them is when I go in, am I reifying um, relationships outside of that group, right? Is my academic identity preventing a, an honest exchange? Um, before I get to Heather, I want to bring up a, a comment from the chat, um, which is the suggestion by Ricardo Fernandez that independent scholars should publish their research in peer-reviewed journals um, so for recognition, which is something that I think is a great suggestion. And I would invite people to look at some of the debates that are going on in the Chronicle and elsewhere about the infrastructure supporting peer-reviewed um, journals um, and how frayed it is right now. And I also do, one of the things that we didn't mention in the barriers to independent scholars that I am worried about is how in some journals, um, in some editorial boards, your affiliation will change the treatment you get in um, the process. Um, and so this isn't supposed to happen, but it does. Um, so I, I think really looking at the full range of publication possibilities helps. Um, but, you know, to sort of support Ricardo, it never hurts to send something out there and see what happens. Um, Heather, I think your hand was up slightly before Austin's on this topic. Heather? You're muted. Do you yeah. want to chime? Yes, I okay. do. If it's okay with Austin, I'll um, I'll jump yeah, in. Ahead. I just want to share a few reactions to the comments that have been brought up. Um, so, with respect to where can academics and independent scholars mix and mingle, build relationships and community, I think these professional associations, learned societies, they're open to everybody, um, and some of them are very inexpensive to join or even free. Um, and we do have a list of dozens. Um, that I'm sure could grow, be twice as long if we are expanding behind, beyond my, um, my background in classics, Greco-Roman world to all of the other ancient studies um, fields. So I'm just posting an example in the chat that the Association of Ancient Historians is $15 a year for membership. And their annual conference this year, which was hybrid online in person was free. Um, and Joel, I would, I think academics such as yourself um, should come to independent scholar events. I think it's wonderful to have connection with the, um, with the, the folks who are inside the academy. Um, that's like cross fertilization and it's fantastic. So from my point of view, please, you're welcome. Um, the, uh, to the question of what is an independent scholar. That's why I put some definitions on my slides. I do think publication is, is core to scholarship because it is the way that we share um, what we've learned and our research and our conclusions and our theories. And, um, but I wanna point out that for the first time in human history with a push of a button, you can publish to millions of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the platforms that we're compiling in um, our resource guide um, really include a lot of self-publication opportunities um, that can be, I mean, you can self-publish to academia.edu, just upload a PDF and boom, millions of people can access it. Um, the, you know, LinkedIn, uh, Google Scholar, these are, I mean, you know, you can publish an article, you can upload an article that has been published elsewhere, but you can also just upload a paper that you've written. Now, is this going to accrue the credibility of a publication in a peer-reviewed uh, um, journal? Probably not, but it gets your ideas out there. They can stand on their own and um, people can respond and that's instantly published to millions of people. So we have so many opportunities that even 50 years ago were non-existent. And um, I think we're gonna have a, a session tomorrow about publications with um, World History Encyclopedia and others that offer more of a um, you know, open independent scholars and offer peer review. So there's that, you know, that, that's another avenue. So I think there are a lot of publication opportunities that could be explored and um, leveraged. And then I finally just want to address the time to work because I feel that strongly because I'm an attorney practicing. I'm also a single mother. So the way I'm addressing this just from a personal point of view is um, just defining my goals very realistically. So, you know, I consider it success if I am able to submit one 1500 word article to World History Encyclopedia. Do I ever see myself putting out a critical edition? No, no, okay. But that doesn't mean I'm not making a contribution to scholarship. And I'll just close with my favorite analogy, which is the brick road. The human knowledge is like a brick road. And some of us contribute many, many, many layers. And some of us just put one brick in. 
but we're all building the road. And, and thank you for that metaphor, Heather. And one of the things like I want to raise up in what you're saying um, is if you publish an idea, no matter how great it is, and no one has access to it, it can't be, become a fully integrated part of that road. Um, so, you know, I've spent a lot of time publishing, but also writing silly things on my blog. Um, and you can guess which one has seen more eyes and has received more citations around the world. Um, so, you know, I, I, when I advise young scholars at my institution, I have to say, look, we have these rules people go through for tenure, right? Um, but, you know, what you get credit for in publishing is not at all commensurate with what's influential in the world anymore. So thank you, Heather. Austin. You're muted, friend. All right. Um, yeah, I want to hit on that as well, that going, wanting to do PhD work for myself and then also learning about the opportunities for independent scholars, I realized that the barrier between those two is something I've more put up, especially with Heather showing all these resources that are still accessible for independent scholars. And then, like you said, with personal blogs versus academic publishing, it seems like there's even more freedom for independent scholars to get their work out there um, because they don't have to worry about the institution they work at or going through um, editor boards or whatever they need to do to get that published, where if you have your own blog, YouTube channel, Twitter, you can get your work out there by yourself right, um, right away. So I'm realizing that the, the integration between the two and the boundaries that are put up there were something that I was putting up and it's actually a lot more um, open, like Babette was saying, reaching out to scholars, I super intimidating, but their goal is to get their work out there. So someone reaching out about their work, they're gonna, I've always had great success reaching out to scholars um, for information or even things they've published that I don't have access to. Because I think the independent scholar and the traditional scholar, their goals are the same, to do their research and to get it out to the people. So if we wanna meet somewhere, that's where we meet. Our goals are very similar and the same. So to kind of plug the Let's Get Published event SAS is doing, that's where the integration is happening in that. When we come together, people are presenting their topics. We have people presenting their PhD research. We have people, independent scholars publishing and everyone's talking about their research and the goals they wanna meet. And there's no, are you an independent scholar? Are you a traditional scholar? That isn't part of the discussion, but the work is part of the discussion and what we're doing and how do we support one another. So I think it's really just creating those communities and then people are already ready to be part of them. They're all on Reddit and Twitter and YouTube, and they're all already in academic um, organizations looking for places to um, communicate their work. So like Let's Get Published and things SAS are doing is just providing pretty much a Zoom call so people can talk about those. And uh, so I think it's a lot easier than that I personally thought it was gonna be. Um, because it's just pretty much creating that space and then uh, everyone's going to be coming to it. Um, so it's less of a boundary than I thought. And, and to braid a few of these uh, things together, that one of the, the sub prompt for this question was, it, are presentations at academic conferences a good way to foster integration? Um, I think what you are saying is that, yes, going into traditional spaces is good, whether you're publishing or conferences, but also creating and capitalizing upon other spaces is important as well. And so one of the great things I think SASA is doing is, is it's a interweaving or braiding these options together um, in, into one sort of plan. Uh, Julie. Yeah, I just I wanted to pick up on this thread of non traditional publication, um, which for me as an independent scholar has kind of been the backbone of where I sit. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be back in formal academia again, but I'm still within the community because of my presence where if any of you knew me from, from before I joined SASA, you probably knew me from my Twitter account at Brotodactylos. Um, and there's a great community of online scholars just on academic Twitter alone has been an amazing resource. Um, but then you also have, like Austin was saying, I have a YouTube channel. I have a 40 minute video on on the the lies that we teach about ancient Sparta, you know. Um, we have ways to continue work to get work out to people that are not the traditional publishing avenues that are so heavily gatekept. And while I don't think that 
an article of mine would necessarily be considered for a traditional publication because I am an independent scholar without my PhD. I do have an article published by Alex Vanderwell on his on his blog about Archeo gaming, right? So Sasa is a great focal point in bringing those kinds of resources together. And I would love to see more of traditional academia extending its hand to us. That's really what I want. Thank you, Julie. And I want to say that uh, your Twitter handle is, has always been one of my favorite. Um, it's, it, you know, Protodactylus. It's, it's deep. Um, so, no, and you bring up some great suggestions. It's there. aeolic. <laughs> right. And one thing to bring in, I mean, you know, the scholarship that some of you, most of you probably know, is created, related to this ancient Greek word skole, which means leisure, right? And it used to be conceived like something that a leisure class would engage in. Um, and when we talk about traditional academia, one of the things um, that I want to emphasize is that these traditions aren't that old, especially when we're talking about ancient studies, which is 10 to 20 times older than the very traditions and conventions so many of us hold dear. Um, so David, one more before we go to question three. Yeah, I, I just want to say that um, Sasa and I have been working on reaching out to um, the different academic professional organizations. And one thing that I've worked on together with the executive directors of the Society for Biblical Literature and the director of the executor of the Society for Classical Studies is starting to create a coalition. We call it the Coalition of Asian Studies Organizations because there are people out there like you, Joel, who recognize that there does need to be change and there does need to be more integration. And um, by bringing together these organizations over time and developing the communication between them and the collaboration, I think we are going to be able to start moving them towards under accepting and being more open to independent scholars and starting to work towards integrating them. Um, so I just wanted to say that this is, I, I think a lot of what people have been saying is that we should be working um, from, our, from the in independent scholarship side towards the academic side, but I totally think that we have to work for both sides towards mm -hmm. the center. And I think there is a recognition among many academics that this is the appropriate time to start doing that. It's just, a, it's a enormous shift in um, cultural mores, ways that people are used to doing things. And that's gonna take a long time to shift. But part of how that actually does happen is that as students um, grow and become scholars and potentially become academics, they who are exposed to this type of thinking, they are the ones who are going to be carrying that forward into the future and bringing, making a more integrated scholarly community. Thanks. Thank you, David. I, I think we, when we're living with things we were raised with, we forget how quickly things can change. Um, and so when it comes to our professional organizations, are they cartels? Are they guardians of knowledge or should they be engaging in ad advocacy and outreach? And those of you who've been involved with uh, professional organizations of the past two, two decades can recognize those different themes in their various behaviors as they struggle to figure out who they are. Um, so question three, before we move towards some call to actions, if we have them, um, is how do we reach and engage more independent scholars to connect with Sasa? Um, David has really mentioned some sort of higher level work there, structural work engaging with the professional organizations. But what are ideas we have for bringing more people into the collective? Um, because from my perspective, at least, um, the more people involved, the more human resources we'll have, the more ideas we'll have, um, and the, uh, the further the reach of this organization will go. So I just said too much, right? But what are some ideas uh, for reaching out and sort of expanding um, the, the, the size of this tent? And I think this time I'll, I'll pick on Austin. Austin, do you want to get us started out with some ideas? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, I think like Julie was mentioning her, all her YouTube channels, her Twitter accounts, um, I would say, I mean, SAS in general, reach out to people already doing the work, um, having those YouTube channels. And we have Port Agent, we have partners with those type of people doing those. But I think for independent scholars, uh, organization like SASA coming to independent scholars saying, we are interested in what you're doing. Because independent scholars already feel 
probably like they're doing the work for themselves or by themselves. So having a some sort of organization coming to them and asking them um, to be part of what we're doing would be something that uh, Infants House would probably appreciate and like. So again, to plug the Let's Get Published events, um, a time for independent scholars to present their work um, to a community and talk about their work um, would be able to connect more. Um, yeah, with Sasa. All right. Thank you. If you guys have specific things you've seen or opportunities to engage that have been missed, what are some of those? So, David, I see your hand. I wonder if there might be a way to engage um, ancient studies departments, because from my point of view, they're the people who hold the keys to their alumni who are no longer within a, a scholarly community. And I don't know how, what would be an effective way of getting them interested in trying to reach out to their alumni towards connecting with us. That's a good suggestion. I, I think one of them, so from my perspective as a former department chair, um, we're given very few resources from our institutions and asked to do too much. So I think there just may be exhaustion there. Um, but I think that that's a great place to start, David. Um, Julie, what are your ideas? So I think in terms of getting departments involved, the easiest thing to do is to email department administrators. Don't reach out to the professors. They're busy and they're not going to look. But the admins, if you send them an email, it says, hey, please forward this to all of your undergrads or all of your alums. That's a really easy way to, you know, as long as it's, you know, proper and official looking and, and sends them to SASA, I think that's a really good way to get the word out there. You might not get anybody right away, but when that senior graduates and goes off to do something completely else, they're going to think, oh, well, wasn't there that email that I got about how I can stay connected? Um, like, I think that's really one of, one of the biggest areas where I see loss is people who, well, they love the work, but they just did that for undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so tell them before they leave. That's my thought. I, I like that a lot. And, and what I'm hearing here is that there are really two sort of groups to think about. Um, one is sort of people who are passionate about a subject and maybe go to graduate school or maybe don't, um, but don't get engaged in the idea that they can keep working on the ancient world after their degrees. And then we also have, Julie, and I'm going to direct this to you, uh, I'm going to get you more involved, are, are scholars um, who are working in publishing, um, but are not in academic positions already. They don't need to be convinced that they can do it. They just need to be brought into the fold. Um, so, so Julie, while I'm waiting for other hands, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of the, the, uh, the ills and advantages of social media for bringing um, independent scholars uh, together. Oh, gosh. So social media is so complicated and it's so new that we just don't have good work done on how to how to use it safely, uh, I guess I'll call it. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned that I love is Classics Twitter has basically been my lifesaver um, because when I left academia, it was not under friendly circumstances and I don't know where I would have ended up in terms of my work. Uh, but with knowing the people from Classics Twitter, I've been invited to speak at conferences. I've been pulled into SASA, which I never would have heard of uh, without, without Classics Twitter. Um, I have been able to go on podcasts and talk about my research. Um, this is a really good place where I enjoy being a classicist, being an ancient historian, being able to say, hey, it's okay to, to just stay here. To keep up to keep up with this you don't have to you know be all one thing or all the other um and that's a really great way also to reach undergraduate students or even high school students who are terminally online <laughs> as most of us younger folks tend to be i say us younger folks that they're infants compared to me um but you know when when people are so 
very involved with Twitter and they can seek out academic spaces on Twitter by finding a hashtag, hashtag classics Twitter, hashtag ancient history, you know, whatever it is, they can start to see a world that they can picture themselves in doing. Mm. And I think it's the same with YouTube. Um, we also get, and with TikTok, um, you know, Maxwell T. Pauley has, has an amazing classics TikTok that uh, I've had friends who aren't classicists, who aren't ancient historians, who have nothing to do with this, say, hey, I saw this Latin teacher on TikTok. And I'm like, yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think that's a really wonderful thing that we can be so easily accessible that we can reach people who don't even necessarily think of themselves as even independent scholars just interested. And, you know, to bring up another, like you already mentioned, somebody I already mentioned earlier, uh, Liv Alberts, let's talk about Myths Baby. Uh, mm -hmm. she's, she's great to talk to. She's really built this podcast and its following. Um, and there are several scholars like that who uh, exist across different platforms on social media online. Uh, and notice, I, I don't know if Liv would be comfortable with me saying um, a scholar, but I think that's what uh, Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I've actually had that conversation with her. Um, she, she takes she doesn't she, she doesn't think she doesn't think of herself as a scholar because she's just interested she's just asking other people about it yeah she does research she summarizes it she, she repackages it is. in her new forms um that's the type of scholarship as far as i'm concerned uh, but you know i wanted to use that that's so julie your experience and your wonderful twitter handle uh, <laughs> to, to sort of answer one of the questions here for you or at least give it i give a direction which is that people have found these new spaces and allowed them and poured their passions into it right it's twitter it's youtube it's these the people on reddit who know more than i ever thought anybody mm -hmm. did right we have like mm -hmm. you know john zetsy's there on um on reddit practically um and these are opportunities you know these are people who are already not taking no for an answer and just making the spaces for them um and i as a as you know a traditional scholar have entered these spaces and i usually don't even know what people's uh, affiliations are and people like i want to mention uh, peter gainsford i'm forgetting his um his twitter sign now but you know i asked him to write a chapter for for a book on the odyssey because his work is excellent and i don't care what his affiliation is um so i think part of it is also breaking down the boundaries in both ways um and and opening spaces for each other um because we all know the you know faculty members who think we shouldn't be doing twitter um but we should be out there we should be getting our our um you know, our feet a little bit wet um all right um so we are yeah kiwi hellenist thank you he, he's excellent um and there are so many people like that i mean part of my practice is to not check credentials because i just don't care um but that's something i think that's part of the uh the aesthetic we can um work on so we've got a few more minutes to talk about our um our takeaways our calls to action but julie i interrupted you i think and you raised your yeah hand. yeah i just i wanted to get to the pitfall side which i'll, okay. I'll keep oh, short yeah, sorry <laughs> So the, the big pitfall, I think, okay. came uh, came very clear to a lot of people when that TikTok got viral for spreading the uh, the conspiracy theory that Rome didn't exist. Yeah. Right. I like this was this was everywhere for for a couple of weeks, um, which it as it turns out is part of a, an even bigger a historical conspiracy, uh, but like. It is just as easy for people to access bad information as it is for them to access good. And that is really one of the dangers of the non-vetted space of social media. Um, and so that is that is one of those problems that is much easier to deal with from the academic side because you can sort who knows what they're talking about from who doesn't. But it's very dangerous for the average independent person who might not necessarily know the difference between me talking about something and the person who thinks that Rome never existed. 
And thank you for that, Julie. And I, I would add sort of to the perils, you know, the, the mobbing, abuse, bullying, the things that can happen. Um, but again, you know, smart people who are passionate can help uh, counterbalance all of those things. Um, so uh, to raise up from the chat, uh, Michael DeGator says that Dr. Miano, I think, uh, from World of Antiquity on YouTube is breaking boundaries. Um, so I, I don't know this site. I, I'll, I'll look on that. Uh, I'll look at that. But in our brief time yet, and I said I'd stick to the clock, but we might go a little over. Um, what are some what are some specific things that we can do going forward from this conversation or that occurred to you during the conversation that we can recap um, uh, uh, next year when we meet again? So calls to action, specific things you'd like to do or have someone else look into doing. Um, anything's game. And let, let me start with our... Uh, our panelists again, while we all think about, it. oh, Teresa, I see your hand. Would you like to uh, make a suggestion? And then we'll um, hit up Austin. Well, this would be a, a, a very out of, out of left field idea, but a tattoo committee. There's tremendous interest, especially on Reddit, yeah. on Latin and Greek tattoos. And often they are, um, they, they can really use mm, guidance and expertise so if we had a vetted committee that can provide feedback and guidance that might engage a greater public, that's my well, idea. Thank you. I, you know, I actually don't mind that one. A few years back, probably five or six years now, uh, six years now, Adelon um, did an issue about tattoos, uh, classically uh, informed tattoos. Um, and I have I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted randomly by members of the public an expert to give advice on tattoos. Um, so that's a great one. Austin, what do you have? So I'd say, uh, luckily, you don't have to wait till next year to continue this conversation. Um, we have our monthly meetings, uh, our working group on independent scholar community building team. Um, so I put it in the chat, you could sign up um, for a meeting for the end of this month or at the last Sunday of the month. And uh, just like that, ta the tattoo committee, those are the types of things we want to talk about. And how can we um, start doing these projects to expand independent scholars. So you could join those meetings and that's really when um, the work takes place and brainstorm um, what we need to do as independent scholars to move forward. With the, the Reddit and we talk about Reddit, Twitter, um, YouTube, I'm interested in if we would have independent scholars be on those places as part of SASA to be vetters and provide information um, as like a team-based thing. So we have independent scholars from SASA that are in those spaces um, and we kind of report on those weekly, what's going on, what are we talking about, what are we engaging with. Um, so if we have, instead of just ourselves on there working, um, if it's like a team-based uh, collaboration. Thank, thank you, Austin, I'm sorry, I didn't know the schedule. Um, you know, this is Layla, she managed to take a nap for most of this panel, so I'm, I'm gonna congratulate her for that. Um, Heather, I see your hand. Hi, everyone. Well, um, I'd like, by the time we convene next year, I'd like to have the um, some sections of the resources guide published. Um, and I'd love some feedback from this group. Um, if folks just want to pop corn some ideas or put some notes in the chat, what form of publication would these resources be most useful to you in? Are we you know, do you want to go to a website? Do you want to see SASA start a blog and post articles about the, with these resources? Um, do you want to see a two page, you know, here's the, here's the quick overview of professional associations that are open to independent scholars. Um, any thoughts? Thank you for that, for that, Heather. I think those are all great suggestions. I'm envisioning a subreddit about tattoos um, that would be hysterical. Um, one of our chat mates on Restream has said that Dr. M. David Litwa has a Patreon that's breaking boundaries. Um, so that's another sort of independent funding is another way of crowdsourcing is another way for us to think about it. And I know there's something else coming up shortly, so I don't want to take up too much time, but David, I see your hand. So I came up with a crazy idea that I've been playing with for a long time, and I absolutely don't know how to do this, but um, it's leveraging the digital online world to actually simulate um, in-person 
discussion and mingling. Um, there are apps that exist like this, um, where you basically you're on a video chat and you go into random rooms and you can switch rooms, uh, you know, with just a click and you can go in and out of spaces and you can talk to people face to face. A lot of them are used for uh, indecent purposes, but if there was a way to try to build uh, or to use one of these platforms um, for our own purposes in a safe way, in a safe and decent way to be able to make um, basically discussion events um, where anybody could come in and talk about specific topics related to the ancient world. I think that's something we could try to work on. I just don't know how we could pull it off. It's just an well, idea. Yeah, I mean, th there's probably a way to do it. Something I would like to add. So, that, sorry, Layla has strong feelings. Um, but there are so many articles published that nobody ever reads or hears about. I would love to see a Twitter thread of people just sort of calling for the best article of the month or something, just bringing up other people's work and publicizing it in some way. Um, again, um, who knows how, how feasible it is, um, but there are many ideas out there. Sorry, Le Layla has a, wants a snack. Um, so we do have, there's another session following this on Archeo Gaming again. I don't want to take up their time. Um, I would like to thank everybody for attending this panel. Um, David, Austin, Heather for sharing with us, Brian and Julie for jumping in, um, Teresa for the tattoo idea, um, and everybody in SASA um, for really looking forward uh, to the future and bringing people together. Um, so that, that's the last thing I'm going to say. I hope to be involved more in the future. Um, and we're going to we're going to have a snack soon after this. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Joel, for re leading this discussion. And now I think we're handing this over to our next um, presentation here. Um, we have our Archeo Gaming education team presentation, which will be led by Emily McElroy. So Emily, please um, show yourself and unmute. And I'd like to ask everybody else who's um, to leave our Zoom session um, so that we can continue with other parts of the conference. Thank you to everybody for joining us and participating. Um, Emily, there you are. Hello. Do all right, let me just. So Emily is a member of our Archeo Gaming education team and she's been working for quite a while on putting together the our Archeo Gaming resources uh, modules for classrooms and she will be explaining what those are about. Can I share my screen? Or... Yeah, you can yeah, share your screen. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. It won't take up too much of your time. I just have a quick little talk about what we're going to be uh, talking about really? today. Did you raise yes. your volume a little bit? Yes. Uh, That's better. Did you say it? A little bit. Thank you. No problem. All right. So I'm Emily. I'm from our RTO Gaming team. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I, uh, I've been involved with SASA since last conference. I was one of our uh, talkers last year and they've worked me in and they haven't let me go since. So I'm here to give a very brief little chat about what we are doing with our RTO Gaming Education team. So the main thing we're doing right now with our, is we're really focusing on our RTO Gaming modules. And I hear you wondering, what are the Archeo Gaming modules? And you might even be wondering what is Archeo Gaming in itself. So Archeo Gaming is a new field that integrates, uh, that integrates the methods of archaeological discovery in the environment of video games. We an interactive and collaborative play to teach and learn about the past. And we've been using these to create our Archeo Gaming modules. And our Archeo Gaming modules are little packets of information with a video that we've been making as the Archeo Gaming team to give out to different education groups. We've been mainly uh, working towards getting, I've been getting information and creating our stuff for middle schoolers, eight through six through eight. So we're hoping to eventually move on to doing more with stuff in both elementary and more with older groups. So each Archeo Gaming module is focused on one topic. 
currently we have four SEO gaming modules out right now, and they are dealing with topics such as ancient Ireland, uh, the Roman roads and Roman Empire building, Greek pottery, and ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt uh, city building. So each of these modules are created with scholars that have volunteered to help us with the thing with the module. Each one is created with feedback from scholars by us at the RCA Gaming Team. There's a couple of us who are working on it. I've just been the one volunteer to come today. <laughs> Little joke. And these topics are each illustrated through video games. So why are these modular gaming modules so important? Well, I think that they are important for a number of reasons. Each one of them is going out to a number of people and they're going out for, the, for a number of different reasons. Each teacher has their own play in mind when they're looking at these. But these are the reasons I think they are personally so important. The reason I feel so passionate about this. Because more and more, as we were talking about in the, in just in our previous session, people are learning about classical studies through the online world and they're coming in in different ways. When I was in undergrad, a lot of the gateway drugs for classical studies was among people my age was the Disney and Disney. And then with the people who were just a couple of years younger than me, the thing that got them interested in classical studies was Percy Jackson. And more and more we're seeing as more and more scholars are coming into the field, the thing that got them interested was video games. And going into schools with these archaeo gaming modules using video games is so important for early outreach. Because as we're finding, as we're getting feedback from teachers, teachers are telling us that they didn't realize how important video games were to these early developing outreach kinds of thoughts. Unfortunately, video games have, have a bad reputation as a time waster. And these oftentimes teachers felt reluctant to use these kinds of video games, arcade gaming things in the classroom to see it becoming a process time waster. With these arcade gaming modules, we're able to take video games into the classroom in a way that's both fun and educational. So these Modules are coming in and they are creating dynamic content that kids are able to interact with in person and they are able to handle in the classroom. Well, oftentimes the games that we're using maybe aren't always completely appropriate for kids outside of the classroom. The main example in that case is the well, oftentimes the main game we use is Assassin's Creed for wandering around areas and showing off different locations. While they may not be appropriate in full for children around sixth to eighth grade, they do oftentimes have modes of the game that can be used purely for scholarly content. And that's often what we use to create the game. So using it to create the module. So these the dynamic content is helping to not only get kids interested, but they are able to lift burdens on teachers, both in the US and abroad. Do you have the thing that really surprised us when we started making these modules and after the first one went out was how many people, not only from the United States, but but beyond the classroom, up beyond the United States, were using these modules. I was handling feedback from people all the way from Greece, from Italy, from Scandinavia, and we are able to perform outreach that is going into a whole new generation of scholars not just here in the US, but abroad. We are impacting, this, these modules are having an impact on a whole generation of scholars well beyond what we were imagining. The first batch of Archeo Gaming modules was created with the conjunction of the, uh, the state of New Jersey. And when we were creating them, it was maybe we would, getting them beyond would be a great goal, but these things are already leading their goal and they're surpassing it and they're making an impact well beyond the typical boundaries. And another important thing for what these modules are doing, they are supporting augmentation of technology and bringing in familiar technology into the classroom. Like I said, there's an unfortunate stereotype that video games are simply something that is a time waster that kids 
shouldn't really be doing or if they should they even if they are they should be doing other things but these are bringing in connections into the classroom they're lifting the burdens off of teachers and they're bringing more and more information into the classroom and they're getting these kids interested early and they're getting them interested for life and i know you're thinking these modules sound pretty great so where can we find them you can find them here at the download link for the archeo getting modules and if you're interested in working on these modules please reach out to pbrevet at studies.org. we're working on a bunch of new exciting things in the future, we should be, uh, we are finishing up a module on the Viking diaspora, which I'm really excited about. We've been doing a lot of work for, and we have uh, have a really great scholar who's already involved in live streaming and integration of technology in new ways that aren't typical academia, but are bringing in new scholars, uh, new independent scholars in ways that haven't been done before. So he's pretty great. I'm, big plug for him. And, but we are hoping to have more and more modules coming out over time. We just need the resources and the scholars so that if you're possibly interested, please come and talk to us. We're more than happy to try and figure something out. And that's what I've got. So if anyone has any questions, I ran a bit under. I'd be more than happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a great presentation. Um, and like Emily was saying, uh, do check out the modules that are up. They are available for free on our website, and they are wonderful. Like, you have no idea. They're so good. Um, so that's saveancientstudies.org. And um, what was the full URL again, Emily? So, kvcstudies.org slash archeogaming dash modules. Yeah, and it's it's just a wonderful project. I can't tell you how exciting this is. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm sorry if I was, uh, it, it wasn't good, but I really wanted to say are pretty fantastic. Not even keeping my own horn, but they are pretty great. I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody in chat have a question for for Emily about uh, about these modules before we move on to our next event? Okay, looks like we got through the biggest part. Thank you again, Emily. That was great. I'll see you around later. So to those of us who so to those of you who are just joining, welcome. Uh, we are about to start our special session. Um, our keynote number two, Dr. Sarah Allen, when the sky heaven was not moved, redefining kingship in the Warring States period 475 to 222 BCE in China. Um, Sarah Allen is a... <clears throat> the Burlington Northern Foundation Professor of Asian Studies Emeritus of Dartmouth College. She's also the editor of Early China and the chair of the Society for, Early, for the Study of Early China. Her bachelor's is from UCLA and her MA and PhD are from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Allen specializes in the study of ancient China before about 100 BCE, especially in the history of thought. She generally uses multidisciplinary approach that combines received Chinese texts, material culture from archaeological excavations, and unearthed inscriptions from manuscripts. Her most recent book is Buried Ideas, Legends of Abdication and Ideal Government in Early Chinese Bamboo Slip Manuscripts. Her other single author books include The Heir and the Sage, Dynastic Legend in Early China, the Shape of the Turtle, Myth, Art, and Cosmos in Early China, and The Way of Water and Sprouts of Virtue. These books have all been published with Chinese translation in the series Collected Works of Sarah Allen. She's currently working on a book on Chinese art in the early Bronze Age. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Sarah Allen.
Am I unmuted yet? I guess so. Uh, please let me know if there's any difficulty in hearing me. And whether my screen is being shared. Hello? Um, your sound is fine, but your screen is not being screen isn't shared. Screen is being shared. Okay. Yes. Um, is it shared now? I'm afraid not. Um, do you see the screen share button at the bottom of your screen? Actually, it's... I I don't see it, and I think it's let's see if this works. It's being hidden by um. Okay, we've made you a co-host, so that should bring the button up for share screen, hopefully. Apologies for the technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's me who should apologize, I think. Um, there's a chance it's underneath a panel at the bottom. Is there a more button, perhaps? Um. The chance that it, let me, um, I'm, I'm up low. It says it's, um, sorry about this. It says it has to be uploaded to OneDrive. Does that make any sense to you? Um, I don't think that's necessary for sharing. Um, your Zoom, your Zoom app should have a share screen button in its menu bar. Um, if your app is taking too much space up on your screen for you to see the buttons, maybe you can resize it. Okay. Okay. Now I've got it. I've got it. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then. Okay. Now, so. Um, my topic is, uh, is uh, first of all, let me say how delighted I am to be part of this. And having just listened uh, to the uh, previous discussion, I'd like to say that the Society for the Study of Early China, uh, if you go to earlychina.org, is something that is open to anyone. It doesn't have any academic qualifications. Uh, so I would be delighted to have any of you join uh, and uh, we in early China uh, would like to join more fully the studies of ancient ancient world. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is my title, When Sky Heaven Was Not Moved, uh, Redefining Kingship in the Warring States Period of China, which is 475 to 422 BCE. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a general theory of government uh, that lasted through traditional China and has had, had some influence today, uh, and talk about uh, how this came about. And uh, I think that you'll see in the way that it came about that there are analogies with other societies, including even our own today. So the, the general theory is called the changing mandate of heaven, and Chinese is called Tianming. 
This was set in motion at the beginning of the Zhou dynasty around 1050 BC, when the Zhou kings accused the kings of the last dynasty called the Shang uh, of evil behavior, thus transforming a Shang myth into a new historical paradigm in which bad rulers were inevitably replaced by divine forces. That historical paradigm was inadequate as an explanation when Zhou rule declined, but a new dynasty was not established. During states period, political philosophy was a response to the resulting ideological crisis. The Confucian response was a recasting of the idea of kingship to create another historical paradigm in which kingship necessarily included a moral component. Now, as I go through this, I mean, this is essentially what I'm going to show. And then what I want to show is that the terminology that was used, the terms that were used and the events in the historical narrative from the Shang dynasty through to the Warring States period, they continue, but their many meanings are transformed at re regular intervals. In other words, the same words are used to describe things and the same events are not negated. They don't say they didn't happen. They just say that their meaning was not quite what other people thought and they add to them. So the Shang dynasty is the uh, early Bronze Age and it, uh, the late period from 1300 to 1500 uh, to 1050 approximately BC, BCE um, is the earliest period from China from which we have texts, uh, divination texts. And this, the capital of this dynasty where these texts or called oracle bone inscriptions were excavated, it was excavated in um, between 28 and, and 30, a century, 37. Um, and this is a, this, the picture on the right is a picture of the excavation in 1935 of one of the royal tombs. And you'll see that there are bronzes here being excavated. Um, so we know quite a bit about it because we have these inscriptions. We know that the society was organized in hereditary lineages and that one state uh, ruled uh, all the other lineages, and he and the ruler was called a king. In Chinese, the term is Wang. Now he appealed to his own ancestors in these divination inscriptions, but uh, everyone pr practiced a form of ancestor worship. Now, one of the significant aspects of this that's that's not often acknowledged is that the gods were the spirits of the ancestors. Uh, and the effect of this is that rather than talking about gods in other worlds and their relationships with humans, very often people are talking about what happened in the past uh, because the gods and the ancestors were one and the same. So the history in China has always had an unusually strong role. So the Shang kings, they called themselves Wang, they divined about offerings to their own ancestors and nature spirits. And these, uh, these offerings were, were often very uh, uh, great. I mean, there were, could be hundreds, even thousands of animals and even humans. And the ancestors in the main line of descent were called Di. These Di, could, they could get favor or the Di could curse them as they more often did. And they appealed to a high spirit called Shangdi, which I'll translate as a Lord on high. So he's called the highest, the Shang means highest, he's called the highest D, which suggests that he may have also been an ancestor. And uh, uh, one theory, which I happen to agree with, is that in fact, he was the progenitor of the main lineages. So the sacrifices to the ancestors, so they, they approached, they didn't approach Shangdi first, Changdi directly, they approached them through their ancestors. Uh, as I've reconstructed it, there was a myth mythical dualism. I should say this is um, not accepted by everyone. Um, but the, the Shang ancestors were associated by with 10 sons. These 10 sons were worshipped and their ancestors were worshipped on the 10 days of ritual week and their ancestors were associated with birds, light, sky, and light. Uh, and the opposite of their own ancestors 
was another people that they called the Shell. And the Shell were associated with 12 moons, dragons, the underworld, and darkness. Now, around 1050, the uh, Zhou overthrew the Shang uh, and established a government, uh, and they appointed members of their own lineages and allies to govern the states. They were less developed than the Shang, and they took over a lot of the Shang governmental system. Uh, they called themselves Wang, uh, used it the same title, and they appointed rulers of states, which were called Ho. Now, they were much more systematic than the Shang had been. The Shang had sort of grown up their power over a period of time. So the Zhou, having conquered them, were able to establish a much more systemized and, and bureaucratized government. Uh, they still accepted that the highest power was Shang Di, but they also called him Tian. Tian means sky or heaven. Uh, literally, it means sky, and it's usually translated as heaven. Um, the, so Qin meant either Shangdi or it could be a more general term for Shangdi and the other celestial spirits. So the king was then considered the Tianzi, the son of Tian. If he was in Shang times, we have no record of it. And what he ruled was called Tianxia, which is under the sky, it's often translated as all under heaven. Uh, and by definition, the ruler then ruled the world, uh, just simply by those names, uh, whether he actually did or not. Um, in a moral sense, he was considered to be the ruler of the entire world, who was answerable to Shangdi. Virtue, the term da, which was used in other times to mean virtue, essentially in this period was an inherited essence something that you got from your ancestors. And in these inscriptions on the bronzes, they talked about the da that they inherited from their ancestors who had helped the Zhou king. So it was something that you got. It didn't really mean virtue yet, but it was something more like, more like a kind of charismatic power that gave you some kind of authority. Uh, so, what happened when the Zhou defeated the Shang is that they needed the support of Shang artisans like bronze casters. We now know that some of the bronzes that were found in the Zhou homeland were actually cast in the Shang capital after the overthrow, scribes, military, etc. And um, the reason we know this is that uh, they're trans Submitted texts, some of which probably date to Suna after the overthrow. And also these bronzes often have inscriptions. The inscriptions are, are about what their ancestors had done to help the original or, or, or earlier Zhou kings. So we know that at that time, what they did was they claimed that they had the mandate of heaven. And, this, and that the mandate of heaven, Tian Ming, had been that of the Zhou rulers, but was now theirs. The term Ming, which is the same as the, the Ch other Chinese word Ling, means to command and was the same term that the Zhou used when they appointed officials. So what they essentially said is that you had this mandate and now we had it. And then they also said that you had it because your ancestors defeated this previous people called the Xia. As you'll remember, I just said that those were the mythical opposite of the Shang. Uh, so that meant that first there was a Shang, and then uh, first there was a Xia, then there was a Shang, and then there was a Zhou. So there then became the idea of a dynastic cycle. That is to say that a dynasty starts, it flourishes, and then it dies, and then there's going to be another one. And they also justified their takeover by saying that the last Shang ruler was evil. And then they said he was just like the last Xia ruler. We don't have any text to, to, to know uh, that that would allow us to equate the archeologic, any archeological finds with Xia rule, although many, many, um, 
archaeologists think that uh, an archaeological site called Arlito was the shell, we have no way of, of knowing. And so um, those of us who are cautious uh, don't put the two together, but you'll find it in the literature. Now, the result of this, what was really a political, ex political expediency when they were trying to get uh, the aid of the Shang uh, artisans and other people that could help them was that they inserted a moral qualification into the idea of political legitimacy. That qualification is limited. It, it really means that a really evil person cannot, is not, is, does not have legitimacy to rule and have been, but, and the way you'll know it is that heaven will change its mandate. And um, this is a piece of early evidence uh, for that idea going back and to show you a little bit what it was like. So according to the inscription, it says it was the ninth month when the king was at Zhongzhou. He commanded you and uh, said, you, the illustrious King Wen, received the great mandate that was seen in the sky. So there was some sort of event. There's been a lot of debate about what this event was in this that he saw. And there's also a lot of debate about the precise chronology. Uh, but there was something that was seen and that they said, and that you saw this in the sky, so you know that Tin was changing his mandate. And then, uh, and King Wen was the, the, the father of the first Zhou ruler, King Wu. So King Wu, having succeeded Wen, formed a state and expelled the evil. Spreading its beneficence to the four quadrants, he greatly reformed the behavior of the people. We have heard that in in means the same as Shang, letting go of their mandate was due to the peripheral lords of In or Shang and all the In authorities being mired in drink, causing their troops to perish. So immorality was a disqualification and alcohol came into it. Uh, I should say that alcohol was, um, yeah, been, had, China was the earliest place to use alcohol. That's at least according to present. Uh, archaeological records, uh, but alcohol was very general. Um, in China was 7th millennium BCE, but it was very general in the ancient world. So he was, they were bad, the, the king was accused of being drunken, licentious. Uh, very bad was that he, is, he, he listened to his wives or mis, in, mistresses, and um, that's a bad last king's. Um, most important evil is in, in in the long run over the over the over the dynasties, and he enjoyed cruel, cruelty. He tortured humans, and he um, hunted to excess. These these uh, this textual tradition or this idea of what it takes to lose rule is something that later dynasties uh, all looked back to that because these this was a classical period of text. Um, now, I mentioned that the Zhou rulers in, appointed uh, rulers of states, and then those, those rulers of states also appointed other people. It was very strictly organized. Uh, so they, they had some sure rules, uh, rules about what you could put in your tomb according to your rank. Now, in 770, uh, the Zhou were invaded from the northwest by uh, a people called the Chenrong. They were probably a herding people. And uh, there's this happened commonly uh, throughout Chinese history. It was a sort of uh, invasions from the, from the northwest. Uh, but once, once they were invaded, there was no sign from sky heaven that the mandate was changing. And in fact, they didn't lose power. They simply declined. So the political system gradually broke down. At the same time, there was a, a change in religious beliefs. So those sumptuary rules for burial that I was just mentioning, they no longer functioned. And people began to put markers of personal identity or wealth rather than those of lineage status 
in the tombs. So this structure that you'd had from 1300 to BCE, then replaced by a, sim, by a more systematic but similar structure is collapsing. And uh, the state, because the center, the Zhou, no longer have any real power, the other states that they had created become individually more powerful and they start to fight with one another. And those rulers that were appointed are often by the Zhou are often replaced by people who had no hereditary claim to the position. Uh, you, you could, there's all sorts of forces in, involved, including urbanization and, and such. Um, but one of the important things that happens from our point of view in terms of understanding the how people regarded the history is there was a spread of literacy. And this led to really an intellectual revolution. Uh, writing, which was first used in divination, which was kind of official employment. And then when you get all these states, they have to have a bunch of scribes in order to record their activities, to organize their activities. But people start writing on their own, just for their own amusement and to just to express ideas. Um, and they began to write on these kind of bamboo slips that you see on the right. And they used the kind of brushes that people used uh, in later times. At the same time, and this is associated with that, there was a rise of a class of what's called sure, people with literary skills who could assist the lords of these states that were fighting with one another. And those people include Confucius and the other philosophers. Essentially, the heads of states, they realized they needed armies, but they also thought they needed ideas. And so some of them uh, actually set up academies in which they, they competed for these uh, sure to come to their academies and debate about what to do. So the problem was that how do you gain power? Uh, the states are fighting one another and uh, rather than the original idea was that you had one king and that one lineage and when that lineage uh, played itself out and you had such a bad king then somebody would come up and they would overthrow them and the mandate of heaven would be moved to this new person. But you don't have that situation. You have multiple states who are fighting for power. And some of the rulers of these states even take the title of, of Wang themselves, claiming that they are the ruler. Because if you remember, the ruler was the son of heaven and he ruled Tian Xia. One of the things that's curious about this is that some pe people have argued that uh, ancient China could have become like Europe, you could have had a whole bunch of states. But conceptually, um, there was never any idea of multiple states being able to exist in peace. The idea was always that there had to be one ruler who conquered all the other states or who somehow took over them from them in order for there not to be civil war. The difficulty was, in terms of the idea of the dynastic cycle, was that defeating the Zhou king wouldn't do any good. He didn't have any power anymore. He was still king, but um, you couldn't change the mandate by defeating him. The Zhou had had a lot of evil kings by this time, uh, and there were all kinds of stories about their doing all these kinds of evil things, but it, it didn't matter. Uh, so... Uh, you have different ideas about how people could achieve power. And um, these thinkers would go around to the different states and advise them about how to become king or simply how to survive. Uh, and then because they were writing not just 
for the rulers, but also for one another, they began to address questions of what's the best type of rule? How can you be achieve rulership when you don't have a hereditary su succession? And they did this in terms of examples from ancient history. So this is still a problem in any society. Uh, now, we, the idea of democracy is a very powerful idea. But if you don't have the idea of democracy, how do you have an idea of changing your system of rule? So what they came up with was the idea of having sage kings who would abdicate to other sages. And um, according this theory, we know really mostly about, about from excavated texts from around 300 BCE. Uh, and of course, this was very good for the literati because they were planning to be the sage kings. Uh, the, so, or the ministers of the sage kings. So uh, according to this example, the text called Tang Yu Zhidao. So Tang, what, Tang Yu was the um, a pre dynastic ruler, and he called himself Di. Uh, Di, well, I, I don't know what he called himself, or even if he existed, he was called Di Yao. And then there was Yu Yu Xun, who was also called Di Xun. So what you've got is a period before the first hereditary dynasty being created. So the way of Tang Yao and Yu Xun was to abdicate the rule and not monopolize its benefits. That is to say, like the lineage wouldn't monopolize its benefits. The kingship of Yao and Xun benefited everyone under heaven, yet it did not benefit them. To abdicate and not monopolize is the fullest expression of sagehood. To benefit everyone under heaven and not to benefit oneself is the zenith of humaneness. So the way the, the way that you could get permanent good rule, according to this theory, was that you would have a sage king and he would give the rule to another sage king that he selected. And this was uh, the ideal method of government. And in fact, there were was at least one ruler of a small state who was persuaded to abdicate to someone else. Uh, and he turned out, not surprisingly, not to be a sage king and was overthrown in, with, by the people of the state a little bit later. So now you get a new historical paradigm in which the three dynasties were preceded by an era of sage kings who were called D. And you'll remember that this Di was the name used by the ancestors in the Shang times, but now it's changed to ancient rulers uh, and specifically those who lived in this period before, and ruled in the period before uh, dynastic rule. Uh, and they have there, so there's Yao, Shun, and Yu, these three D, and then there's the Xia dynasty. And the sons of these three rulers were likened to the bad last, bad last kings of the dynastic rulers. And what they did was to, when they appointed, because their sons were evil, is another reason why they appointed this D sage rulers. So then you had a theory of the mandate of heaven being moved from one sage ruler to another sage ruler before you had hereditary rule. Kingship then was redefined as serving to benefit the people. So what started out was a lineage system, and then you get uh, a lineage that uh, replaced the previous lineage because of evil behavior, but now you get an idea of government and a king being required to actively benefit his people, not just his own lineage. Now, Confucius, Confucian, Confucius uh, and his disciples are the result of this 
period of thought. It's called the golden age of Chinese philosophy. But it was an, an I, it was almost like a kind of renaissance in which the ancient myths, uh, which were because it was because you have an an, uh, a system of spirits being ancestors, so uh, the history was a way that everything was being talked about, and so they co-opt this and they make it into an ethical system, starting with Confucius and his main disciple called Mencius, who lived in the fourth century BCE, was the person who really uh, established the political philosophy that is associated with Confucianism. And according to this, uh, dynastic rule is based upon an idea of a changing mandate of heaven, Qin Ming. The evil ruler is replaced by a good king, uh, Wang, who was called Tianzi. History begins with the pre-dynastic rulers, Yao and Xun, who then abdicated to sage successors, and they were called Di. Da, which in the Zhou times was a quality that was inherited within a lineage, but could be cultivated. So it was cultivated probably originally by your sacrifices and by your loyalty to the king. It become, it's redefined as virtue. It becomes something that uh, everyone has to a certain extent, some people may have more capacity for it than other people, but anyone can cultivate it. And anyone in theory can become a D, like Yao and Xuan, if they sufficiently cultivated their Da. And the way that you knew whether they sufficiently cultivated their Da was by the reaction of the people with whom they lived. So for example, Xun went to, Xun's father was also evil and he uh, went and lived with various people and wherever he went, uh, the people were transformed by his goodness. So the idea in this is that the ruler can by his personal death transform the people that he rules. So Xun went and farmed with people and they no longer fought over the boundaries of their fields. He went to root and, and um, he fished with people and then the fishermen uh, used the right kinds of nets. Uh, all of these stories about his, his, uh, his goodness and his transformative power. With Confucianism, this uh, then is further refined uh, as to say that in terms of humaneness and, and um, rightness, as humaneness is the essential quality of being human, uh, and that being human is the ability to be virtuous. And rightness has to do with right behavior. So these are the, the kinds of terms that compete with ideas uh, that we might associate with justice uh, and a very set of terms that, that derive from the Greek tradition. Um, li, ritual, which started out in terms uh, to mean uh, in, as an idea to do with um, sacrifice to the ancestors, is then redefined uh, from worship to any performative act, uh, including those rituals that are associated with ancestor worship. And the reason that you perform them is that they inculcate a sense of right behavior. Now, within this system, then, the idea of kingship is transformed uh, to mean something uh, to have a moral value. So Mencius says, so this is from, um, from the, 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 the Mencius. Um, and it says, King Xuan of Qi asked, Tang banished Jie and King Wu smote Zhou. Zhou is the last ruler. So Tang is the first ruler of the Shang Dynasty, and he banished the last ruler of the Xia Dynasty, and King Wu smote, meaning he actually killed him, 
uh, Zhou, who was the last ruler of the Shang dynasty. Um, and then he said, did this happen? And so Mintra said, uh, yes, it, it, it's in the transmitted records. So the king says then, is it permissible for a minister to assassinate his lord? Uh, and Mencius replies, to mutilate humaneness is to be a mutilator. To cripple rightness is to be a crippler. Someone who mutilates and cripples is an ordinary person. I have heard of the execution of an ordinary person, Joe. I have never heard of the assassination of a ruler. So what you get then is uh, the vocabulary is the same, but it takes on a new meaning. Kingship, now, you're not a king because you hold the position of a king. You're only a king because you act as a king should act. If you act like a criminal, you're a criminal. You're only, you can be punished. Uh, you have to act like a king and then there will be a change of the mandate of heaven because heaven will recognize the behavior of a true king. And the problem is not that uh, there's, the problem is it's not civil war, it's that nobody is acting as a true king. If you had somebody who was acting as a true king, then all of the people would follow him, including his soldiers. So the armies of the other people will turn to a person who has this charismatic virtue. So if you become humane and you act as a right person should act, then you will become the new king. In another in another pass in passage from the Manchus, King Hui of Liang said, so these um, these are these sure going to different courts, in this case it's the same court, but to 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 advise the rulers. Uh, and in the case of Mencius, he always gets the best of them. It's hard to believe that he actually said these things that they let him get by with it. Anyway, um, he asked for his instruction and Mencius says, is there a difference between killing a man with a cudgel and killing him with a blade? And the king said, there's no difference. Is there a difference between using the blade and using uh, the administration of government, using government to kill somebody. And the king said, there's no difference. And so Mencius says, your kitchen has fatty meat and your stables have fat horses. The people have the look of hunger and in the wilds, there are people who have died for, of starvation. This is leading animals and devouring people. When animals eat each other, people find it repugnant to be father and mother people and to not avoid leading animals and devouring people. How is this being father and mother of the people? So here then we have the king who must act like a king and being acting like a king uh, means to be father and mother of the people, which means that he has to care for their welfare. If someone uh, is just spending all of the wealth of the state on his own luxuries and letting the people starve, then um, he's not king and can be overthrown. So, What we've had is a response to an intellectual crisis. Of course, there were other crises too when you no longer had a theory of legitimate rule. And you get a change of the theory within apparent continuity. So the terms stay the same. 
uh, Wang as King Di, which was an ancestor. Uh, Wang was king, just meaning you had the power, and, and then it becomes having a legitimate power. Di, which was an ancestor, becomes a name for pre-dynastic rulers uh, who were undoubtedly somebody's ancestors. Shang Di um, is still the Lord on high uh, and maintains that position. And he's equated with Tian Sky Heaven and then the ruler becomes by definition uh, somebody who rules, uh, who is son of sky heaven and rules Tian Xia. So you go from a mythical dualism uh, up in the Shang dynasty in which you had the Shang preceded by their opposites. Then you get this idea of a dynastic cycle and then you get a, added to that a period of, before that of sage kings who were true sages and abdicated to the next um, to the next ruler. So essentially you have a lineage rule, then you have kingship with moral limitations, and then you have kingship defined in moral terms. So when you one of the points that I wanted to make in terms of this was that the um, I mean, these recasting of terminology and recasting of narratives is something that's still going, going on. Uh, what The way that it works is that you don't negate what happened before. You just change the paradigm in order to be expressing a new idea. And the expression of that new idea allows it to uh, it, 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 to be current uh, for that current situation. Well, this isn't, of course, um, we didn't didn't quite work uh, in the sense that Mencius didn't um, manage to um, persuade anybody or nobody who was persuaded managed to become ruler of all under the sky. On the other hand, uh, if this didn't work as a way of achieving the uh, of achieving domination over the whole state, it became the basis of legitimate rule throughout Chinese history, and meant that uh, hereditary rule was always leavened by an obligation to take care of the people. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it did. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, we do want to give you a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, just we had those te technical difficulties at the start. So sorry that we're running a little <laughs> bit over. Um, so... Uh, let me pull out some of these questions from chat, and those of you who are watching, feel free to add more. Um, so there was a, a question about the historicity of some of the characters that you've mentioned, um, Confucius, Mencius, and uh, you also, you know, brought up, you know, it's kind of hard to believe that the things that they're quoted as saying are truly things that could be said without them getting you know, uh, reprimanded at very least. So uh, could you take a moment to speak to that? I don't think there's any question that that, that Confucius and Mencius were historical figures. Uh, the evidence is just too great. And the, the uh, text you have now from 300 BC, I mean, that was really, these are texts from the time of Mencius. Uh, whether they could say the things that they did uh, is on unclear and then whether when you get back to the Sha dynasty uh, whether that could be should should be equated with the Bronze Age state that was in power then is is not clear. Um, presumably the stories about Mencius uh, that were recorded not by him if not at the time but by his disciples and over a period of time were stories that were passed on and they were exaggerated and uh, 
were not um, not necessarily true. On the other hand, when you look at the philosophical texts that come up at the period, it makes his what he was saying makes sense in terms of these other ideas like Peng Yu Zhao that was just advocating abdication. He didn't do that. He talked about being a good king. But there were people who were talking about abdicating abdication. And that fits in with what he was talking about. So you can see that he was in some ways responding as a more moderate person to this more radical, these more radical ideas that we didn't know about until 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's it's um, it was a kind of intellectual, a period of intellectual fertility. Uh, for various reasons. One, because there was no central control. And so you had these people in, in various parts uh, advocating different things, and they might not have got anywhere with them, but they were passing, writing their texts down and passing them around to each other. Um, and, and they could go from one state to another. Thanks. Uh, the next question we have is, um... Blue Hans asks, so basically, if a ruler behaves unworthy, it's okay to get rid of him. This seems very cut and dry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, in theory, of course, but everybody can always debate whether a ruler is evil or not. And no matter who the ruler is, you can always say he's evil. And he's been following the advice of his wife. And you find the same things come up. I mean, when after... The, the fall of the Gang of Four, I mean, Mao's wife was vilified in the same terms as the bad, the wives of the bad last kings in ancient times. <laughs> that kind of continuity is not what you expect. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh. so that's the point I'm trying to make is you get mm -hmm. these amazing continuities, but things are also changing all the time. And that's how the continuity works. Um, I actually have a question for you on that line. Um, so, so we hear a lot in sort of, you know, European studies about the divine right of kings and, and that style of monarchy. How does that idea compare with this mandate of heaven, which seems to shift over time? Well, that's the thing about it is that the mandate of heaven was changed so that it wasn't just hereditary. So the divine right of kings, they just went on. There was no idea that if they behaved badly, they were going to be replaced. So all these ancient systems are always hereditary to start with. And what happened in China is you get a political system that allows a hereditary king to be replaced and then another king to come into power. And that's one of the reasons that you have this kind of continuity. You can compare it with Japan, where the power just went out of the hands of the king mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the king lasted all that time. Uh, but this, because of political expediency in 1000 BCE, <laughs> you end up with a system that allows, kind of, uh, uh, allows a change. And then that change is modified with different kinds of explanations. But essentially, you've had an idea of changing mandate of heaven from this beginning until early 20th century. Yeah, um, I guess I I was wondering if there is sort of more of a propaganda of continuity in that. Oh, that's definitely true. That's definitely true because China was not unified most of the time. But the fact is, but the fact that the king was called the sun of sky heaven and and what he ruled the world was called all in, under heaven meant that you always had a concept of the ruler as ruling everything even when you didn't have one that was ruling everything and that's the point i was trying to make about the use of language is so important in terms of how how people conceptualize things and and how history actually works are not 
irrelevant. And we see, I mean, we see competing narratives all around us. And and here you can, and one of the things about doing ancient studies is you can look back to the past and see uh, you you get the long you get the long view and uh, see that some of these things uh, are, are things that happen all the time uh, have happened all the time. Mm -hmm. On that point, you and I firmly agree. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. That was really great. Um, there's a lot of applause in the chat. Um, I think it is time for us to move on to our special section, but if people want to ask more questions, perhaps they can put them in the chat, and, and Sarah, if you want to stick around, we'd love to have you as long as you're here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, um, now going to introduce the moderator for our special session number two, uh, Jenny Eberling. Jenny, if you want to put your video on. Um, Jenny Eberling earned her BA in Anthropology and Religion from Rutgers University and an MA and PhD in Near Eastern Studies from the University of Arizona. They're an archaeologist who primarily works in Israel and Jordan, and she recently co-directed seven seasons of a survey and excavation at Jezreel with Norma Franklin of the University of Haifa. She's Associate Professor of Archaeology at the University of Evansville and Acquisitions Editor-at-Large for Eisenbrowns. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thanks very much for introducing me. Um, I am um, very pleased to open up this special session, Storytelling by Inspirational Independent Scholars. And before introducing our first speaker, I just wanted to uh, tell you all the goals of this session. They are to demonstrate how to pivot into other careers, both alternative academic and other professions, following the completion of a postgraduate degree in ancient studies, and how to balance a separate professional career and family life while still pursuing scholarship as an independent scholar. So the way this workshop um, works is that we'll have many presentations from five independent scholars who will discuss their career paths for five to 10 minutes or so. And then um, we're going to have open Q&A at the end so people will have an opportunity to interact with our presenters. Um, some of the topics the scholars will be discussing today include skills from ancient studies that were transferable to their current careers or job, how to balance how to balance independent research with the demands of daily life, family, and a separate professional career. And then also we're hoping they um, give advice regarding transitioning from academic scholarship to being an independent scholar. So I would like to introduce our first panelist who is Brian Smith. Um, Brian Smith has a bachelor's degree in anthropology and archeology span from the University of Arkansas Fayetteville and has excavated in India, Thailand, and Egypt, where he worked with the Joint University of Pennsylvania, Yale Institute of Fine Arts in New York. Um, Brian received a master's degree in fine arts from the University of Memphis in ancient Egyptian art and archeology span and concluded at the University of Chicago in Egyptology. He is currently employed in the Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies, teaching courses in ancient Egyptian culture, Near Eastern civilizations, and ancient religion, religions. Uh, welcome, Brian. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, everyone, uh, for including me in this fantastic panel. And I look forward to hearing from every one of you about your unique perspectives of where you got where you are. <laughs> um, I guess to add on to, uh, not much more to add on to, um, the biography that you just wrote, Jenny, uh, I am from a small town in Arkansas, about 3,200 people or so. Um, first got interested in um, anthropology, um, primarily through studying animal behavior. I'm a huge animal lover. I, I kind of wanted to go into animal behaviorism. Um, you know, why do animals do what they do? That sort of thing, as I got older, uh, I realized, well, why can't we ask the same applicable questions to humans? Why do humans do what they do? Why do humans believe what they believe, make what they make, live where they live? And so that led me down the path to uh, a couple majoring at the University of Arkansas in anthropology and archaeology. Um, the Egypt bug bit me pretty early. Uh, so I did apply to the University of Memphis, Tennessee, spent two years there focusing primarily on art historical theory as it applies 
to the ancient Egyptian language and the conjunction adjacentness of you know ancient Egyptian um, material texts and what the hieroglyphic inscription says about them. Uh, so that kind of irrevocably connects the two. Uh, then I got accepted to the University of Chicago where I spent two years in the master's program on Dr. Peter Dorman, who to this day, thankfully, is still a very good friend. Um, and so my current project and my current goals, uh, I have been asked by um, the Graham School to teach, you know, upcoming fall quarter, and this is going to be on the art and archaeology of ancient Nubia. And this is a class I've taught only once before with Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, uh, that I was very fortunate enough to teach this class. Uh, I was recommended to teach this class by one of tomorrow's speakers, Dr. Kara Cooney. She actually recommended me for the job. So um, I'm really glad that we're able to engage and talk about these connections that we have. And really, in my experience, it has been not only your performance in and out of the classroom and your dedication, but it also has to do with networking, you know, reaching out to people, um, staying after class, you know, staying after a lecture. If you have a guest lecturer, staying after that lecture, ask questions. That's how I got to go to India and be a ceramicist at age of 19. Uh, with Dr. Gregory Purcell of the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Uh, after that, I went to Thailand and at the age of 20, excavated seven human burials in a Bronze Age smelting site. Um, about that time, that's, um, and I'll wrap up here really quick, I, I promise. Um, that's about the same time where I really started getting uh, interested in ceramic material and pottery. And those of you who have ever worked in the field or know anything about archaeology, you know ceramics and Pottery can be the boon and the bane of an excavation because there's so much of it. Um, and so then I was allowed by the University of Pennsylvania Museum, Yale University team to dig at Abydos for four years and be the ceramicist for uh, various periods of Egyptian history from the pre-dynastic all the way up to the Greco-Roman. So um, linguistics, art history, uh, pottery, ceramics, um, Religious behavior, certainly, I'm fascinated by religion. Uh, kind of goes back to my you know, earlier questions about why people do what they do. And a lot of that is uh, dictated by religious and cultural beliefs. So, um, and Egypt certainly has tons of that. So, um, thank you, I hope I didn't go over. Thanks very much. Brian, um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker then, who is Kyle Johnson. And Kyle Johnson works as a data scientist specializing in NLP. His PhD was in classics at NYU, and he continues to do NLP research in ancient Greek and Latin. Kyle started and co-runs the Classical Language Toolkit, a software library for ancient languages. In 2017, he wrote an affable guide to leaving classics. So welcome, Kyle. Oh, I, I need permission to start my video. Jenny. Okay, let's see. I said the host it's okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. Yep. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on here. I'm very flattered to have uh, been invited. Um, I share probably what everyone here feels is that this stuff is really, really important. This, this, the subject of getting out of school. Um, you know, getting out of grad school, getting out of the ivory tower, um, you know, willingly or unwillingly or some combination of the two. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump to, um, like, I'll be really brief about this. Um, my background was in classics. I was kind of a middle class kid from uh, Western Washington. And I began studying Greek and Latin kind of on a lark in college. And, and I was just really, really, uh, deeply moved by the realization of how small my world was um, and how small the little piece of time of the, the, that I was that I had lived up until that 18 years and it just put a bug in me almost a religious zealotry for classics for ancient studies the ancient world and that enthusiasm took me you know probably most of the way through a graduate student program and then about halfway through, you know, I started off at a Reed College, a small school out in, in Oregon, Washington, and I did my PhD at NYU. And um, at some point, I kind of I I lost the I lost the faith, so to speak. I don't know. I'm speaking this in kind of metaphoric terms because 
Um, I, I suspect members of your audience will will relate to this. And um, and and it was a time of great anxiety because I or at least I thought I had no usable skills. Um, I had no what looked to me like no work history and very little safety net or you know guidance like kind of psychologically or uh, materially financially. Um, I did have kind of a hobby horse when throughout graduate school and really beginning earlier on uh, doing a little bit of what the time was called uh, corpus linguistics and evolved into the field that we now know as NLP, natural language processing, which is a very, very big deal. If you've ever used a spam filter or if you've ever had an email go to spam, rightly or wrongly, you've had NLP you know, touch your life. It's basically the application of statistics, and computer science and um, and linguistics kind of all brought together. Um, I'm not an expert in statistics. I'm not an expert in computer science, but I know enough about linguistics to get me um, adequately, you know, to get me to, to make me an adequate researcher and and and, and worker. Um, so I I began slowly practicing to become an NLP specialist, perhaps some kind of general programmer. Um, I had in mind too. I didn't think I would make it as far as I have, to be honest. And now I'm, um, well, and um, so I'm happy to talk in some detail about retooling during graduate school or during like, you know, one's early professor years work or and or retooling, um, you know, immediately following. I've got, I think I probably made more mistakes than, I made at least as many mistakes as good choices. So I'm happy to lay out those as well. And then if people do have, um, I know this is a humanist, maybe a, you know, a language savvy group. If there are people interested in talking about NLP, natural language processing, data science, uh, kind of technical work, technical work along this line, I'm very happy to, to go down that path as well. So I'll pause there. Is that okay, Jenny? Yes, thank you very awesome. much. That's, thank yeah, you. That's very good. Much. And we can pick up, of course, on all of these things in the more informal discussion later on. Awesome, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Okay, great. So I am pleased to introduce Alex Joffe next. Alex has a PhD from the University of Arizona, and he is the editor of the Ancient Near East Today. And he's also a senior non-resident fellow at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. His recent publications include the essay, New Models for the End of the Calcolithic in the volume, Transitions During the Early Bronze Age in the Levant, Methodological Problems and Interpretive Perspectives and Operation Crusader and the Desert War in British History and Memory, published by Bloomsbury in 2020. He is a co-host of the podcast this week in the ancient Near East. Welcome, Alex. Thanks very much. Can, can you see me? Is this working? I, I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear anything. Yeah, I can hear you. Clearly, so okay, good. very good. Okay, okay. Um, since this is a, an inspirational storytelling session, I will tell an inspirational story. Um, the year was 2003. I had been a few years before fired by a major R1 university, let go, really. And I found myself in the fall of 2003 walking down the side of the Belt Parkway in Brooklyn, between Canarsie Pier and Kennedy Airport, wearing a hard hat and a vest, um, carrying a shovel and a bucket, doing shovel test pits um, in an area that I had already established had been um, created by landfill um, maybe 50 or 60 years before. And I'm a 43-year-old male with, married with two small children. And then it hit me. It was a classic moment. Um, I am too old for this kind of shit. And that led me to, um, that epiphany led me to um, a whole series of, of directions in the aptly named nonprofit world. Um, so I want to, to, in the spirit of inspirational storytelling, I want to express a regret. Not a day goes by over the last 25 years that I haven't deeply, deeply regretted going into archaeology. I should have been a lawyer like all of my friends from high school and college. And yet, I met my wife on a dig 38 years ago. 
and everything good in my life, my wife and my kids and a handful of friends comes out of archaeology. So there's a conundrum, there's a contradiction, and you have to run with it. So let me give you my cynical, optimistic take. For those of you who are leaving academia, you have just left the most corrupt industry that there is. You have been liberated from the fold, that's all. And if you're considering how to continue being an active scholar, the first thing I have to say is, remember, you don't have to do this. If, like me, you're sort of stuck or addicted and you like it, you like that, those ways of thinking and those ways of doing, then let me give you um, a few specific pieces of advice related to the questions that were posed to us. Are there any skills from your ancient, Near East, your ancient studies that you have tr found transferable to your current career and job? Mm, not exactly. Languages are good, attention to detail is good, the ability to research. My one piece of advice is learn to write good and learn to speak pretty. So don't wave your hands around and modulate your voice, have it go up and down. These are very important skills. How do you balance your independent research with your demands of, with demands of life and your career or jobs? To balance your career or your work with life, you first need to get a life, so get a life. In the end, no one will care how many articles you've written as opposed to how much time you've spent with your family or being a good human being. Again, you don't have to do this. What you do have to do is be a good human being. Um, what advice would you give to other scholars regarding transitioning from academic scholarship to being an independent scholar? First of all, your self-worth is not measured by how many books and articles and things you write. I've written three books. I've written 10 or 12 um, monographs, about a dozen reports, 100 reviews, 300 op-eds. I've edited probably 1,000 pieces, 500 for ASOR. That doesn't change my relationship with um, my family at all. In terms of other advice, um, marry well, if you can, get a library card. Um, don't buy books, it's an albatross, it's a bad idea. Don't do reviews, nobody cares, nobody reads them. Don't be an adjunct, it's a sucker's game. You're playing into, again, this corrupt industry. Um, be yourself. If you wanna do this, then do it, you'll find a way to do it. Um, you know, be original as you want to be. Um, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And um, and I think I'll stop there. So thanks. Thanks, Alex. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Laurie Rush. Uh, Laurie Rush is a U.S. Army archaeologist serving at Fort Drum, New York. Uh, Dr. Rush has a BA from Indiana University in Bloomington, my neighbor, uh, an MA and PhD from Northwestern University, and is a fellow of the National Science Foundation and the American Academy in Rome. Her research specialty is Native Americans of the Great Lakes. Dr. Rush was military liaison for return of ore to the Iraqi people and has participated in key leader engagements across the Middle East and Afghanistan. She co-directed advanced research workshops for developing cultural property protection policy, doctrine, and best practices for NATO. Dr. Rush is internationally recognized for her work on military education and operations planning for cultural property protection in crisis areas. She is a research associate of the Smithsonian, a University of Pennsylvania consulting scholar, and secretary of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield. Welcome, Dr. Laurie Rush. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be included in today's session. Uh, in thinking about the skills that I've used for my advanced degree, which as you mentioned is in anthropology rather than ancient studies, uh, for me, I think it's the ethic of respecting uh, the beliefs and views of others and being willing to learn how to behave productively in uh, the cross-cultural landscape. Uh, uh, 
Alexander is very hard to follow. Um, and we know that many anthropologists fail to uh, respect the views of others. But uh, for me, I've really, really tried hard to apply those skills. And it worked well for me in terms of learning to navigate military culture. Becoming an archeologist was a complete accident in my career. So my advice uh, to young scholars is being willing to take even the most entry level job if it looks like it's going to be valuable to you and offer valuable experience. My very first job out of graduate school was at the Antique Boat Museum in Clayton, New York. Um, I was very, very uh, fortunate to meet um, my husband of over 40 years at Indiana Bloomington. He went to medical school on a public health service scholarship. Our agreement was after he paid back his scholarship by being the doctor in an area that really needed doctors in northern New York, um, we would move to wherever I found a job. And that job was at the Antique Boat Museum. Um, it led to an opportunity to inventory collections uh, from the archaeological investigations at Fort Drum, New York. There, two archaeologists quit in the middle of the field season. So the Army came to me and asked me in 1998, would I fill in for six weeks? And I've been there ever since. So uh, I guess uh, my advice is take those opportunities, even if you think it might not be a good fit. And of course, for me, it's turned into this extraordinary life journey that I never would have imagined. Um, having a wonderful partner and spouse enabled us to raise uh, our family of children. And I was also fortunate in that the Army opportunity came along after the uh, I worked from home quite a bit when the kids were really small, um, but they were school age. And uh, by everybody pitching in, I was able then to continue full time, um, hopefully without uh, too much uh, neglect of them. And uh, and then as we became empty nesters, it, it freed me to do more traveling with the military and take many more opportunities that the Army was offering. How do I stay connected? Um, uh, the opportunity to work internationally. And I guess another piece of advice is, even if you never would dream in a million years that you could win something like the Rome Prize, go for it anyway. And uh, and now I stay connected uh, with a willingness to travel internationally and uh, by continuing to teach. I teach for the American University in Rome, for Donau University in Austria, and I genuinely enjoy teaching soldiers. So that uh, has also been an opportunity. And even more important, I've learned so much from soldiers. And I guess another piece of advice would be um, take uh, learn your lessons in the most unexpected um, places. If you had ever told me, a child of the Vietnam era, that I would not only be working for the US military, but really proud to be associated with the 10th Mountain Division. I might not have believed you, but I cannot tell you how much I've learned uh, from the soldiers that it's my privilege to work with. Again, my, my anthropology degree also enabled um, me and provided lots of skills to be the diplomatic liaison for Fort Drum um, and our Native American nation partners, Onondaga, Mohawk, and uh, Oneida nations. So um, your life may come around in circles. And so uh, take those opportunities, get all the experience you can, and then don't be afraid to listen and learn from others. Um, even if uh, I've learned uh, more anthropology from uh, young soldiers than I ever learned in graduate school, it's uh, in uh, sometimes it's in their DNA. And when you get that chance uh, to gain it, to benefit from other people's experiences, take those opportunities. And a piece of advice that I would offer is if you get opportunities to work for the government, take it seriously. Have a look at USA Jobs. You'll be amazed um, at the kinds of careers the government uh, can offer and also the opportunities to contribute. Um, I, my goal is uh, to try and save lives on all sides by teaching respect for each other's cultural property. And I never would have imagined that I would have that opportunity. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lauren. All right, um, introducing our last presenter, Mitch Allen.
who is founder of Scholarly Roadside Service, a scholarly publishing consulting company launched after he spent 40 years as an academic publisher, including creating and running two independent presses with an archaeological focus, Altamira Press and Left Coast Press. Ellen is also a research associate at Archaeological Research Facility at UC Berkeley. He has a PhD in archaeology from UCLA and has taught that subject as an adjunct instructor at five universities. His fieldwork has spanned Israel, Afghanistan, and California. Currently, he is writing up the results of a legacy survey and excavation project in southwest Afghanistan, on which he was a junior archaeologist in the 1970s. Ellen's writings include two authored books, two edited volumes, and over 40 articles on archaeology, scholarly publishing, qualitative research, ethnic dance, and related subjects. He is the recipient of Career Achievement Awards from four scholarly associations. Welcome, Mitch Allen. Thank you, Jenny. Hopefully you can all hear and see me. If not, someone let me know quickly. Um, this this uh, project has always kind of worried me that this is supposed to be inspirational. Uh, when I can look at my career, it seems to be more like coincidence, good luck, and hard work to have joint careers in scholarly publishing and archaeology. But uh, I'll give you the story, and I'll, you, you can decide for yourself. Uh, it was 1976, and I was at the University of Michigan as a graduate student in Near East Studies, and I had the grad student blues. I was ready to try to do anything else. Uh, what further exacerbated the problem was that school ended on May 1st, and on May 2nd, there was a Michigan snowstorm. And for a California boy, that was enough. I was I was out of graduate school. Fortunately, I had an uncle who was in had a small publishing house in Los Angeles who had always invited me to come back and go work for him. So I decided to do that. When I got back there, I found out he had no money to pay me. So I started looking for jobs while working at a record store. Uh, among the and of course, publishing was on my brain. So I applied for various publishing jobs in Los Angeles. I applied to Penthouse. And I imagine I probably wouldn't be here today if I'd gotten that job. But I ended up uh, applying for a job at uh, for in marketing at Sage Publications, a large what was then a small but now a large social science publisher. Uh, they said I wasn't qualified, which was quite true. But they had an internship program, and fortunately, they did because I decided to take that internship at. Uh, starvation wages, kind of like being a graduate student again, and ended up uh, working at Sage for the next 25 years. Um, my first day of work, they also gave me choices. And again, here's another fortunate coincidence. They said, well, you can go out in the warehouse and learn how to pack books, or you can share an office with the CEO, and we'll give you a calculator and you can figure out how to, uh, you can help him do financial analyses of the profitability of the various things that we do. Well, I figured, you know, working in a warehouse, sharing an office with a CEO, it seemed to be a pretty easy choice. And in fact, for the next year or year and a half that I shared an office with him, I had the, a, a learning experience about scholarly publishing that's the same as the first year of anybody's graduate student degree program. I did well enough that he made me his assistant marketing director in a couple months. And, I, and uh, four years later, I switched to being an acquiring editor, finding books to publish, and I stayed doing that for the next 15 years. But what was interesting, and it should be relevant to those who are interested in getting in publishing, because Sage did not publish any archaeology, I had no connection with the field whatsoever as far as my day job. Uh, I was a very good sociology editor, family studies, criminology, education, social work, you name it, anywhere else in the social sciences, but they did not publish archaeology. So I left my archaeology career behind. And in fact, what I became was a generalist. I could tell you a little bit about almost any subject in the social sciences at that time, and probably even so now. Um, I describe my job as being a professional dilettante. And if you want to think about your level of expertise in a very small area, which is what most scholars do. This is the exact opposite of that. Um, after uh, 20 years, I uh, got Sage to start me up in my own little publishing house that they paid for called Altamira Press, being part of a, a corporate giant. And finally, after 10 years, that was no longer interesting. And I started all over again with Left Coast Press, which was run and owned um, by myself and my wife who is also a archeologist, by the way. Uh, in those later two jobs, I did publish lots of archeology. span I had the opportunity to decide what to publish, but I didn't for that first part. Uh, after in 1996, I, I was ready to retire. I sold Left Coast Press to Routledge where all the books are. So, in, so I had a 40 year career as a professional, professional publisher and I'm now a consultant on and off for various academics, publishers and scholarly organizations. 
in the middle of all this, I decided I did want to go back to, to archaeology, and I rejoined graduate school at UCLA in 1984. It took me 13 years to get a PhD as while I was working full time. I worked on the Ashkelon project, and my PhD is based upon that. I had a very patient advisor, Elizabeth Carter at UCLA, who after 10 years said, you know, Mitch, you're just playing around. If you're ever going to finish this, you need to find some time in your life to actually write a PhD dissertation. I had all the notes. I had all the analysis. I just hadn't sat down and done all that. So I negotiated with my company, with Sage, and they gave me two months off, uh, unpaid, of course. And in two months, I wrote 400 pages. My dissertation was done, and I became an archaeologist. Uh, since then, I've taught part-time at several universities, uh, write occasional articles and make presentations like this one, uh, more about publishing and archaeology, the links between the two, than about the research projects that I had, simply because this is an area that I know really well. And when I retired, I actually went back to this project that I was working on when I was at the University of Michigan, which was a, a, a survey study in southwest Afghanistan. And the third book from that is now in press at Edinburgh University Press. I never thought this as being an inspiring story. Most of the time, my question was, why are you doing this? And the answer is, yes, balance is very hard to keep. Um, you work very hard and doing both of them, but you also need a lot of help. I had a lot of help at UCLA with by Dr. Carter and also the head of the archaeology program there. I had cooperation from my bosses at SAGE who allowed me time off to do field work and allowed me time off to write a dissertation. And most important of all, I had I had cooperation from my family. Vita, an archaeologist, understood that I needed to be gone three Christmases in a row doing field work when she had two when we had two small kids at home. The kinds of skills that archaeologists that archaeologists specifically and anthropologists more generally have are really useful in publishing, actually, because I've described publishing as being an ethnography of, of scholarly groups, and so all you in that one anthropology, cultural anthropology class you've taken, pull out all those notes again because all that stuff is valuable. Uh, studying the culture of, ac of academics, asking dumb questions about social workers and what they do and what they learn and how they, uh, how they read and what they read. Being an outsider, learning how to communicate in their language. Networking, being able to find out who the key people are who can, in your case, as a publisher, publish books for you, but even those who will just give you advice on who else to publish, younger scholars coming up is all very valuable. Good writing and editing skills that you have to learn as a scholar is very useful. And in fact, anything you've ever learned is useful in some fashion or other. I took one undergraduate class in African history, and then someone came to me on a for a series on African archaeology. And I could actually talk about the cultures that he was getting books on because I had actually had one undergraduate class and I actually had read the textbook in that class. For you who are, most of you who are of a younger generation than I am, the fact that you know how scholars operate in the digital age is really crucial. You know how you access information. You know how your library works. You know how these large uh, data uh, sets actually work. And those things are absolutely crucial for being a publisher, particularly in the, uh, uh, in the 21st century. There are a bunch of uh, up advantages and disadvantages going to publishing, but we can get into that when we have our discussion if you want to do that. Um, but I think one thing you have to accept, though, and one thing that it took me a long time to accept was you're never as good at either of those jobs, being a publisher or being an archaeologist, than if you'd only had one of them. I will never be a great archaeologist. I was never a great publisher. But by doing both of them, I was, I got to be okay on each one and I got to do both of them. They, they balanced each other out very well for me and fit very well in my life. It may or may not work that same way for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch, that was great. Thanks to all our presenters, they, this was fascinating. Um, I'm sure members of our audience here um, have lots of questions. So. To make this a little less formal than it looks right now, because I just see this almost solid black screen, I would invite our presenters to, to turn on their um, video if they don't mind. And then, of course, others who are participating in this workshop are you know, invited to turn them on as well. So it looks like we're all, we're all together. Um, so when folks have questions, why don't you go ahead and put those in the chat, and then I can read, read them aloud. And let's see how this goes. Who wants to begin? Or if you want to be even less formal, of course, you can, you know, raise your hand, jump in and ask a question. That's fine, too.
I have a general question. Um, let me just ask this first and then I'll, and Heather. Um, I just wanted to find out if, um, just among our presenters, just to start with, if everyone here kind of went directly from high school into college, and if they did not, if that had some sort of impact on their decisions, maybe in the in the future, I'm thinking like, you know, if people are sort of indoctrinated as we are, you know, we tend to be to, you know, go through high school and go directly into college, and then what, you know, kind of thing. I mean, if that had any kind of impact on their decisions to, to go in different directions after that, after they had finished graduate school. I don't know if anyone has any. I have a high schooler, so I'm thinking about this stuff a lot and what she's going to do in the next few years and how she's not going to go into academia. So I'm wondering how, you know, if any of you have any, any stories to tell there or not really. Just telling her to travel, you know, just like travel, go get experience, do other things before you jump into this. And then, you know, the expectation is that you're just going to continue on with it. Yeah, Brian. Uh, to address, uh, I believe it was Heather's question. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Oh, this is just me. But yeah. oh, just you. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought there was a Heather that I didn't see. In the... Yeah, no, Heather's. Yeah, the okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I went, I went directly into undergrad um, from high school. Um, and not to dismiss uh, my small southern roots, I just needed to get out of the town. Yeah. And um, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I, I knew that I had the marks in high school with um, being an artist, um, being in AP English, being in AP History, World Civ, you know, that kind of thing. So I knew math wasn't my thing. So I did know that I had some good launching point in order to engage with um, an undergraduate program. And uh, that being said, a lot, de depending on what you decide to major in, and a lot of people don't decide what to major in until their junior or senior year. Uh, sometimes, you know, that's up in the air, even when you get into a graduate program, you're not really sure exactly, you know, what to do. I would still say stick with what is more comfortable to you. Uh, none of us, I mean, we've already all admitted this, you know, none of us know everything about history or ancient studies or, you know, and, and that's to me the kind of um, exciting thing about this field is that I'm still learning. I'm 51 years old. And I still like to learn. I still like to read. I set aside, you know, time to do work for my classes, set aside reading for pleasure, and then, you know, change the litter box or go grocery shopping or, you know, you know, the, the regular mundane daily things that we have to do. Um, but yeah, ju jumping directly into undergrad, I'm not going to say that that was necessarily advisable. I think, you know, kind of going back to what Mitchell had said, it was possibly even more coincidental than it was. It, it was kind of a match between coincidence and what I brought to the table. Um, I was able to, to go to archaeological field school and nap flint stones and learn that technology, you know, for kind of experimental archaeology. Uh, got to work with the technology of, um, you know, early, early DOS scanners to um, scan broken bits of ceramics to, uh, give an estimate of the volume and circumference of certain pots uh, that we were finding in the ceramic assemblage of Eastern Oklahoma. So I learned a lot of very valuable tools. Now, just because I, I may not have used those later on in grad school, but at least I'm aware of them because there are people in ancient studies, archeologists, uh, social historians who do use those tools. So I think it's important to be able to understand what they're used for and how they work. Thank you. Yeah, Alex. <clears throat> um, I in the in the 1970s, suburban kids of a certain social class went straight to um, college, and in my case, that was a, a hilariously bad idea, which really was um, driven home after my first semester when the dean. Um, told me that I would be kicked out if, um, if I had another semester like that. Um, had I joined the army, really anybody's army, um, that would have been a much better idea or gone to work on a kibbutz or gone back to work in the factory where I had been working or, the, or the re one of the restaurants where I'd been working. Um, so, it, I would certainly commend, I would commend the idea to, to any, anyone, any parent 
who has a has a child approaching college and the the utility of college in general is far more questionable today than it ever was right. um and uh you know when i have a plumber in my house they make a hell of a lot more money than than i make and that doesn't mean that they're any less intelligent or necessarily well read or thoughtful than than I am or anybody else's. So I think we're I, I think there are a lot of class-based expectations that we are um, victims of or we victimize ourselves and those they should be rethought. And the same thing goes with graduate school and the same thing goes with expectations regarding career paths. In graduate school 40 years ago, we all thought that yes, um, we would be the ones who would actually get the jobs as future faculty members. And on a statistical basis, that really wasn't true. And it's even right. far less true today than it was 40 years ago. And, um, but the, the process of, of delusion that the institutions foist on you and the process of self-delusion that individuals say, you know, it's not, it's not going to happen to me. I'm the one who's going to do this. It, it's, it's, it's not reasonable. It doesn't work that way. Break the mold. Um, break out of these patterns of thinking. I echo that. And also, I also went straight from high school, uh, straight through college, right on to graduate school. Um, and for students who've taken that path, don't be afraid to switch dramatically in terms of your specialty or, or even field when you realize, like I did after my first year of graduate school, that I had chosen the wrong subspecialty and that I was going to need to make dramatic changes to finish the course of, of my career. And in actuality, back in the 70s, archaeologists were still excavating Native American human remains. And the first time I was asked to do that, even as a youngster, and a youngster I'm currently proud of, I realized that was wrong. And as a result, I realized I had no future in human osteology uh, in the American Midwest. So I had to I had to change. And I think that willingness uh, to to uh, have the courage to make that decision um, really saved um, my career ultimately uh, and my graduate uh, program. Okay, Mitch. On the other hand, if I had gone into that interview at Sage Publication and had not had a year or two of graduate school behind me, I'm not sure they would have ever offered me what they did and never have put me on the career path I ended up on. I think it really is it's situational and it also depends depends on whether you like the academic world. If you like universities, like hanging around people who study and read and write and stuff like that, um, there's very good reasons to be around there. Even if you end up doing something as an alt ac career and not as a university professor, understanding that culture and understanding the way that world works is really crucial. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely invaluable. And if I, if I may comment on, uh, I believe, Laurie, uh, you had said something about the um, excavation or inhumation of uh, First Nations populations. I had the same experience when I was 21 in Thailand. Um, I was out in the cornfield digging up post holes where, you know, these elevated houses would have been, and it ends up these late Bronze Age people were burying their dead underneath the houses. And the next day after we first started clearing out, and I'll be quick, that first started clearing out the first two or three burials, the very next morning, just before dawn, um, my, my entire crew were a native Laotian, ethnically Laotian Thai people. And the very next morning, there was a huge fistful of burnt out incense stuck in the side wall. So they recognized these as their people, you know, despite the millennia, despite religious differences, you know, what have you. Um, so it's, yeah, it is, it is still a problem on, um, not only repatriation of human remains, but also uh, material culture. You know, I mean, we're all probably very well aware of the Elgin marbles and the bust of Nefertiti, and you know, all, all of these other, all of these other things that history gives to us. So it's, um, I, I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Uh, that that sort of difficulty. Thanks. Okay, Heather, you have a question. 
Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for this very interesting panel. I'm Heather Rose Marin, and I'm uh, zooming in from California. So after um, majoring in classics undergrad, I um, working with nonprofit organizations and then went to law school and practiced law for a decade. And now I'm circling back and interested in re-engaging in classics and antiquity and, and ancient studies. And so I have a question for the panel in general and then a specific question for Kyle. So um, for the panel in general, um, as you switch careers and I was kind of weave back and forth between different fields, different professions, how do you um, how do you handle questions from the folks in your main profession, for example, publishing for Mitchell, when you say, I'm gonna go back and get a PhD in archeology. span So I'm just interested in hearing how you've navigated those conversations with folks in your quote unquote main career as you re-engage with ancient studies or perhaps go back and get an advanced degree. So that's one question. And then for Kyle, your, um, your comments reminded me that in World War II, a lot of classicists were involved in the intelligence community because of their very, um, you know, strong skills in decoding and translation. And I'm wondering, you know, is IT kind of the new version of this? I mean, is, is, is there something about studying Greek and Latin that's like well, like transfers well to coding? Well, I'm so, so curious of your thoughts on that. So, you know, a, a very brief answer, you, I, you, you remind <clears throat> me of this, I want to know more about it. Um, I appreciate the question. Um, really brief answer. Um, you know, my world of NLP um, has been, you know, billions upon billions. The reason why the, my discipline of NLP exists today is because in large part because billions upon billions of government fiat have been pumped into state-sponsored espionage um, for the purpose of you know listening to listening to Pashto cell phone conversations or listen you know scanning listening to this very conversation that we're, we have right now for naughty keywords um, you know email surveillance surveillance of every form and it turns out that. Um, then in my world, this is kind of the dark side of my world, but you know, maybe it's a necessary evil one can say is that um, that that yeah, that this technology, this is where this technology comes from. And the the discipline has been shaped by, you know, there are all these kind of tentacles in the great in this in the area of computational linguistics, NLP. It's like a big, imagine like a big tree. All, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a very um, it's a very rich tree of you know just subdisciplines. Um, but, you know, lots and lots, if you pump a trillion dollars into like a couple branches, it will sort of distort the field. Um, so that said, you know, maybe, um, you know, there's probably something people who like linguistic puzzles probably like math and programming. I, I, I don't know if this will, I, I'm not very proud of this, but to be honest, I never really felt like I read Greek or Latin, but I'm more like I decoded it. This is probably just how I am. So anyways, you give me something to think about. I'll follow up maybe if you have some citations. Uh, let me just interject here that um, at least uh, 15 or 20 years ago, there was, and there probably still is, a very strong cadre of classicists inside the National Security Agency um, who are doing these kinds of things. And that if you do have very good foreign language skills in any foreign language. The intelligence community is going to be interested in you. I was offered a, a, a job, which unfortunately never panned out, um, consulting for a, a, a consulting firm that was training intelligence analysts um, in, in Hebrew. So they wanted me to give a series of lectures in, in Hebrew, and they said I could name my price. And I said, okay, I want $1,000 an hour. And they, for one reason or another, that, that connection, damn it, never, never really worked out. On the other hand, my interactions with the intelligence community, slight though they have been over the last 20 years, if you have exceptional language skills, even if you have like, okay, pretty good language skills, there may well be a job for you there. Right. And um, 
you, the individual, can decide whether that's something that you want to do. And, you know, there are other, there are other stories about that as well. But, you know, intelligence and high school teaching are, are things that, um, you know, post-academic um, graduate students should be seriously thinking about. In answer to your question, Heather, um, 90% of those social work and education professors had, had no idea that I had an academic degree of my own. That was, it just was not relevant. And even when I became a publisher of archaeology with Altamira Press and Left Coast Press, I was publishing mostly North American books. And only if it was relevant to the discussions of those books did the fact that I had a degree and could speak with authority, uh, some authority, uh, ever enter into the conversation. And, and it's another, th another piece of that whole being a publisher is that it's not about you. It's about the writer and the author and what they are trying to accomplish and your ability to help them. So that your own personal background, if it's ever relevant to pull out the fact that you have a degree, um, that's the only time it's relevant that you, that you need to sort of show some authority. Otherwise it's all about them and not about you. And, and uh, the fact that I had a degree in archeology span and was practicing archeology. span Brian, did you have also a comment to Heather's point? Uh, yeah, just just a brief comment. I'm I'm certainly not any sort of modern, you know, World War II scholar. I wasn't really aware all that much about classicists helping to break codes. Uh, but I would like to point out the Navajo were using codes and code breaking during World War II, and of course, you know, they were using their own language in conjunction with English speakers in the military to break these codes that would eventually help us successfully fight against uh, you know, the powers that be uh, during the time period. Um, second note, really briefly, I'm terrible at math. Terrible, like C minus in college algebra, terrible. But whenever I was in the field in ceramics and I was the ceramicist, having to analyze and group together all of these types of ceramic fabrics and shapes and sizes, you know, and handles and things like that. I had, there was too much information. I ended up creating a damn algebraic matrix. I, I almost failed algebra, but I ended up using math out in the field. So um, I think my, my, you know, initial comment whenever I was introducing myself is, you know, really kind of follow along the path of what you're good at. And find out what else you're good at. Um, you know, kind of, kind of to uh, Alexander's, you know, point. You know, having to work in just, just Alex, please. It's just Alex. Oh, just okay. Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, I was the manager of a cheese and wine shop for four years, so I can talk about ancient Egypt and you know social history until I'm blue in the face. But I can also serve you an excellent charcuterie board. It's very important. With wine accompaniments. It's very important. And which, which gives you the greater pleasure? They both do, honestly. I was, I was glad to get, whenever I was at the restaurant, the restaurant has now since closed, so I was let go. Um, but whenever I was at the restaurant, I was engaged. My mother was a caterist. She owned her own business for like 27 years. So I was, I've been around food pretty much all of my adult life. Uh, so when I was at the restaurant, I was fully invested. When I came home, it was just nice to just not be in that environment because I was exhausted. And then the next morning I'd get up and teach class or I'd get up and, you know, read or study or make notes or, you know, whatever the task may be. Um, I'd like to go back to Heather's original question too, where she was um, asking, what does she tell her colleagues um, if they question her choice of going back? Um, and part of it is life is short and we should be doing our dream. Um, the other is that um, some of our biggest allies in terms of all the issues of repatriation uh, and saving antiquities, we're working with lawyers every day of the week. Um, it, you know, archaeologists can provide all kinds of expertise. Um, we can work with military partners, but at the end of the day, if something's going home, it involves a lawyer generally. So, um, and, and, the um, difference between war and criminal behavior is getting less and less and less, sadly, every day. Um, and so, again, I think, um, you know, we're going to see the importance of having lawyers we can call on who have 
um, multiple forms of advanced expertise. And so I think it's fantastic that you um, have, have a plan to go back uh, into the classics. Thank you. Thank you right. for these amazing responses. Thank you, Heather. Um, David, do you want to go next? Thanks, Jenny. Um, thinking through all, the, all of this and, and seeing this panel and all of your really fascinating life stories, um, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of you, aside from Kyle, are all, we're all uh, trained as archaeologists or, and working in the field as archaeologists. And I have to tell you, you get out in the world a lot more than you do when you're a text person. So me being a text person, all you do is sit in a room all day long. Sometimes you have real texts to look at, but a lot of the time you don't. You just have books and you've got a few people around you. So that's even more isolating and you have less life, real life experience and real world experience out there with other people. Um, but I want to change this, I'm hoping, a little bit to use all of your experiences and ask a question of how students who are interested in pursuing um, a field of ancient studies, of pursuing graduate study in ancient studies, how can they set themselves up as best possible to have a dual path? Because that's my vision now for how things have to be. Everybody going to graduate school has to be able to think of themselves as having a career path and a scholarship path. And that's, it's, it's, you know, it's awful if that's not how it is. And now I'm thinking about myself. I actually was a database admin for eight years before I went back to school. I don't even think of myself that way, but that's, but it's the truth. So I did have that in between time and I did have the um, real world experience to be making an active choice to be going to graduate school. But I'd like, you know, each of you to ring in a little bit and tell us how you think um, younger students, particularly in college can make this decision in the way where they're, really trying to position themselves the best possible, both in a career trajectory and in a scholarly trajectory. I'm, I'm willing to go first if, if that's okay. Um, I really encourage uh, students with questions like yours to consider working for the government. And, um, and folks that are interested in that possibility I would start haunting USA Jobs, which is the US government website. And you can um, rig it to send you the job announcements that have any relationship at all to an area that you might be interested in working in. And so for example, if I had it to do over again and I could stand to live in an urban area, I would consider of all places defense intelligence agency, because if you're an archeologist or you're interested in the ancient world, um, imagine having access to all those satellites that you might actually be able to move to look at a place in the world that you're interested in. Um, and um, people talk about the deep state, but we have colleagues in the deep state who have done some amazingly wonderful things that no one will ever know about. Um, the advantage of um, looking at USA Jobs early in your career is not only will it provide job descriptions so you can get a sense of, gee, would, is that something I might be interested in doing, but it will also have all of the requirements to be eligible. And sometimes the requirements are surprising in terms of exactly which university courses they want you to have in your resume. So once you can start to see those lists, then you can actually make choices. Oh my gosh, um, to have this intelligence agency job, I need a GIS certificate or I need um, you know, Latin, basic Latin, or there may be um, specific things in there that you can really help yourself while you're still um, in, in either an undergraduate or a graduate student to make sure that you'll have all the requirements so that when you are ready um, and that dream job comes up, you'll have everything you need. So that's one tidbit of advice I would offer. In scholarly publishing, uh, all of the brain work takes place on university campuses. And if you're on a university campus, the opportunity to do th things that are publishing related are very, very common. Uh, journals are based at universities. Uh, like yourself, Jenny, you have, you have a series that's based 
where, where, you're ba- where you are. And graduate students become part of your team to be able to do these things, which gives you skills, not only in the academic side of what you're doing, but also in the publishing side. Uh, social media marketing, uh, copy editing, design, all these kinds of things can happen within the university because they're, and even if it's not where your own university career is, if you look at any university job listings, there's all kinds of publishing related kinds of jobs within you that take place inside universities. And of course, if the university is funding you, they want to, and is supposed to be giving you a job to find a job that can be both publishing related and uh, still allow you to have some money so you can continue your academic track. Those things help. So um, I would very strongly, and, and once you get those experiences, those experiences are highly transferable outside of the university if you end up in a professional publishing house like I did. Um, but you can stay inside the university too and still do both. So they're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And someone else want to take that? David's question? Yeah, Brian. Yeah, um, I'll just add, um, I can't remember, it was like, Two, three weeks ago, I was watching um, a series of Egyptology clips, and there was a young um, archaeologist who um, had even actually admit, admitted that when she was in undergrad and grad school, that she had no plan B. You know, so that, that shows in you know, extraordinary determination and like, you know, blinders on, this is what I'm going to do. But it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. I mean, there are plenty of other skills that, you know, everyone has that can be utilized in a satisfactory way that can learn you, earn you a living wage, right? Which is kind of one, kind of one of the big deals, um, you know, to pay your bills or feed your cats or what have you. Um, the other thing that I would say is, uh, goes back to you know, my earlier comment, which helps a lot. I'm not saying to be reliant or dependent on this to you know, those young people interested in ancient history studies, but is networking. Um, I have yet to meet a particular professor who is known, uh, on knows who he is, um, but I was recently added, asked um, last year to write a festschrift for him, a celebration of his career. He and I are friends online, but I've never met him in public. We just have an online friendship and then an outside source anonymously asked me to contribute to this celebration of his career. So, um, and we only know each, know each other through Facebook. So it's not like I'm, you know, posting academic online pictures. It's mainly because of my cats. Um, but uh, yeah, that kind, of, that kind of, you know, interpersonal networking, knowing someone who knows someone who knows someone has definitely worked out for me. It's not going to work out for everyone, but at least try. Kyle, did you want to weigh in also? A very small, so David's question all of a sudden reminded me of some a very small practical piece of advice that I give um, to graduate students that I occasionally mentor to, to leave the academy. And one of the big ones I have is to have, the advice is to have one resume. Because as you try to distill who you are and what you want to be, how you want to represent yourself, how you want to, you know, how you think of yourself into maybe one or two pages. It's really difficult, and mm-hmm. um, but that's extremely worthwhile. And um, and then when you have these split, you know, I've got my academic resume over here, and then I've got this other stuff for some kind of marketing manager job over here. You become sort of schizophrenic, and you know, kind of trying to juggle two personalities or two people. You're two people to the world. I, I think it kind of reflects, I think Alan said, what Alan, you said, or Alex rather, about uh, kind of being true to yourself and uh, just, or just being yourself rather. Um, that if you, if you try to think of it like, if, uh, my real recommendation is just try to think of yourself as you're this kind of a basket full of, I'm a basket full. If you saw my bookshelf, the most like random jumble of books. Nobody in the world has a jumble of books like I do. I'm a total dilettante. And that's my, you know, it's my personal little jumble. And that's who I am, the, you know, the good and the bad of that. So, um, but in, um, I have a real confidence in knowing, here's my, you know, I have a resume, it's a jumbled mess. um, And, but that's, but that gives, but I have a a very firm foundation of, of knowing at least where I come from and who I want to be, so professionally speaking. 
So anyways. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. All right, wanna take another question, um, Austin. Yeah, thank you. Um, Heather and David both kind of asked what I was thinking. Um, I'm in that place of planning um, a backup plan, but also trying to get into a PhD program. And um, I'm looking at doing software development. So Kyle, your um, experience is very close to what I was thinking. I was interested in Hebrew, um, ancient languages, textual studies, and then now I'm taking software development classes and uh, seeing how those two worlds come together. So my question was exactly actually what you addressed. Navigating those two different personalities, I feel like going crazy. One week I'm like super into this one field, next week I'm super into this field and kind of feel like going crazy. I, I do have two different resumes. Um, I, have a, I have the answer for you, which is to have yeah. a project, have a portfolio piece, build a website. This is what how my open source project um, really began as a portfolio piece. Have a portfolio piece where you're using, let's I'm just make a website about, make a website that does and practices all the tech skills you, you want and need and fill it with content from the ancient world, ancient studies, whatever the heck it is you want to be doing, uh, linguistic stuff. If you want to work with me on my project, we need a Hebrew scholar. So, um, so in that way, you can show this off to the world. There are very few scholars who program. It's really, it's, it's essential skills in this world today, I, I believe personally. And that, um, and that people who, when you go in, if you were to go interview for jobs or at work as a consultant, people are, you're gonna stand out because you're gonna, you're not just gonna have like a resume. Like, yeah, I worked at Adobe for eight months and you know, as an intern, okay, great, who hasn't? but rather you have this brilliant little website in this niche field that nerdy people are going to love. And um, so short answer is have a project. Okay, Make perfect. It. That's what I'm planning. So that's, that's yeah. really encouraging. Thank you. Great. Anyone else want to respond to Austin's question? Any other perspectives? My, my general question is navigating those two worlds, having working we want this academic career so bad, but then also having a plan B and you need to work in that field as well. And how do you live in those two uh, fields at the same time? Yeah, Brian. So I'll ask the opposite question. So why go, so let's say you, so why go back? Why go into this late? Let's say later on, slightly later on. Why jump back into this world when, honestly, if you're a if you're a person who's a well read and who can who's learned certain skills to think, what do you need the the next? Why why if it's not going to lead to a you know other than personal satisfaction? Why would a person want to jump back into a, a place that ultimately might just lead to potential debt or years of hardship for very little gain. I, I don't mean, and I don't mean to be skeptical. I just tend, I tend to be skeptical, but I'm really curious um, given the trajectories of walking away from, of not having that direct field and going to other areas of work. Being, being a retired guy, I'm older than most of you. Uh, when I retired six years ago, most of my friends who retired at the same time had to find places to go travel, I had to go find things to do, had to learn, you know, take cooking classes, had to uh, learn how to serve, whatever they did. I went back to a field project that I had done 45 years earlier that had never gotten written up. And I've been working on that for the past six years and it has engaged my life and basically ruined my life completely because I've done nothing but that since for the last six years. But I've got to say that if I didn't keep those two tracks alive, uh, I would not have been in a position to be able to do that. I, I, I can't speak to going back to school. I, I thought about it, but I was actually, I had, you know, I was in my forties and I was, I was too old. I had responsibilities. Um, but I always felt the uh, need, the compulsion, the interest in being a productive scholar. So, you know, going back, and, and, and here's my philosophy. Going back many, many years, when I was uh, uh, finishing graduate school, I looked around and I saw what people were publishing. And I said to myself, there's so much crap. Why not some of my crap? 
And that's been my guiding philosophy for the last, um, well, 30 plus, 30 plus years, because it's not rocket science. And, you know, I know a lot of these people and they're not rocket scientists by any means. Um, and one of the challenges for me has been to write in a lot of different areas. So my last book was about, um, was about a uh, historiography of World War II. I found an angle that was interesting that nobody had ever written about. Um, you know, I write, I, I've spent 10 or 12 years writing op-eds for strategic studies, journals, and things because just had ideas that people didn't have. I've written about, you know, modern history, ancient history, political science, environmental security, intelligence reform. Um, and, you know, if you have a certain amount of stick to and a little bit of patience, you can place these things. Um, you'll never get a job <laughs> in it, uh, but you know you can contribute to the stream of to the stream of consciousness that is um, the invisible college of of knowledge. Um, and it's actually much more. What, what goes on outside of the academy is, in many respects, much much more interesting. Um, in the think tank world, in the policy organization world, which has real world impacts. So, you know, I can actually say that on one occasion, I moved the needle for American foreign policy. So, you know, which is neither here nor there. It's not, you're not going to put that on my tombstone or anything, but it was an interesting sort of uh, uh, incident. And it proved that, you know, the people who specialize these, in these things are not geniuses, for one thing, because if I can do it. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, everybody should be able to, to contribute. And so if you're interested, then go and do it. <laughs> I don't know about spending tons of money to get a degree in it. That is, uh, and, and jumping through all of those hoops, that strikes me as a very dubious idea. Um, but if you can get your stuff published, then, you, um, then, then you're right up there. So. I, I would also, um, I think there's a huge fallacy in the disciplines of the classics and definitely in anthropology, that somehow if you choose or end up in um, an applied area of your discipline, that somehow you failed, that only the, right. the huge success stories are the ones that become professors in it. Um, we have so many distinguished colleagues who've established careers outside the academy. And really, I often feel sorry for my colleagues that have never uh, left the university because they have missed so much of the real world. And uh, and they're they and and you can now tell um, that that experience is missing in their lives because uh, their views tend to be. Uh, odd and narrow. And it's just it seems like their lives could have been so much richer and their contributions so much greater. So don't let anyone convince you that leaving the academy is a form of failure. Actually, I think it's a form of greater success. I agree. So does one then need a PhD then to engage in all these things that you all have been talking about? I mean, publishing and participating in all sorts of different kinds of projects and research and things like that. I don't know. I mean, everyone's coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives on this, but I'm, I mean, I, I, have, I only teach undergraduate students. So I, you know, I'm tenured, I'm an associate professor, um, but only I teach BA students. So, um, you know, they come to me asking for recommendation letters for graduate school. And I, at this point, I'm not writing letters to recommend students for PhD programs, only for master's programs. If they're able to finish a master's degree and then they're seriously, you know, committed to doing the PhD and can find funding for it, then I'm happy to recommend them, of course. But um, it's difficult. I feel like we're just, you know, sending people who don't really have any other kind of 
you know, plan B, backup plan, alternative plan, different kind of route planned out, uh, you know, to, to heartache and sorrow and debt and, you know, all these things that I see so many people experiencing. So I wonder if, you know, you all, what do you think about this or what do you do? How do you counsel students, younger scholars? Just a quick, a quick aside, my little project, and this will sound very, very arrogant. I, I think my little software project's the most important ancient studies endeavor out there. It's one of them. That's me being uh, a bit, uh, it's a little bit of bluster, but I really believe that. I'd say, you know, a, a bit, it's probably 50-50, the contributors I get writing really good revolutionary software. Um, I'd say half of them have PhDs. Half of them are just, you know, they're just nerdy guys that, you know, most of them are guys who are, um, who have a burning passion to do this. You couldn't, you couldn't, you, they'd be doing this no matter where you put them in the world, no matter what walk of life, they would be obsessed with this. And in terms of impact, be it, and be it teaching, in my case, software, publications, articles, which I kind of, you know, I, I, I'm a little skeptical of the value of publications, frankly, sometimes, but I know they're important and nece they're a necessary evil. Um, there are a million ways to, um, you know, to get out to, there are a million ways for one to make demonstrable contributions to, I love the expression, the, the you know, with the invisible college. And, uh, and one quick point about, um, about you know how do you how do you counsel an aimless an aimless or valueless directionless 22 year old 21 year old and i think you know i i'll give a, a, a an answer that's totally unhelpful is that you know i think there's a deep frankly spiritual sickness in our society um and that we would ever think of seeing so many brilliant the best of our best are aimless directionless valueless unrooted um it's, it's, you're looking at, to ask the question is the right question to ask. I think about this, I worry about this as a father all the time, um, but you're looking at it, this is just one facet of a really horrible monster, so. Thanks. I, I, I wouldn't suggest that anybody goes um, to graduate school really, <laughs> so, and, and certainly not unless they give you a, f a full ride. Um, you know, there's, what is it? $1.7 trillion in, in student debt, which is suppressing family formation and people buying their first homes and, uh, and all this kind of thing. And it's, um, it's really not, it's really not worth it. It's not, it's not that important. And you're feeding, and I don't, again, I'll go back to, you know, where I started, you're, you're feeling, you're feeding a corrupt institution, you know, ac academia is being is is and has been looted by its management for the last uh, two decades, and um, you know that that's why contingent faculty, which is a bullshit term for you know peace working, um, is is the thing. And yeah, there are a few superstars who get paid decent salaries or fantastic salaries, but. Um, Mostly it's a middle-class vocation at this point. And, um, you know, and my perspective is I know hundreds of, I know hundreds of people in academia uh, from my perspective as an editor. And um, I think I can probably count the number of them who are happy and satisfied on one or two hands. Um, it's, a, it's, it's brutal and unsatisfying in many, many key regards. And you can have those moments of satisfaction and, and flow in the classroom. And that's great. And you can have those moments interacting one-on-one -on -one or in the field. And that's, and that's great. But that's not really what it's all about. And um, the question is, can you have enough of those kinds of moments coming at it from a different perspective, coming at it from a different vocational base where you know, you're running in wine and cheese shop during the day and you're learning and writing and thinking at, at night. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I spend my days doing many other things and I spend my nights reading about um, 
military history and prehistoric textiles and actually writing this stuff up and getting it published. So right. it can be done um, if you want. Yeah, to, to go to Alex's point and also Kyle's and um, Jenny's original question, I think from my perspective, it kind of gets to the heart of how do you define success? How do you define being satisfied in the work that you do? Alex, you had an excellent point. Literally sweating in a cheese shop, you know, serving wine and tasters and making catering trays. But then I would go home and I would relax and read, sometimes until two o'clock in the morning, and then do it all over again. Wasn't a healthy lifestyle. Um, but I don't have children. My husband and I don't have children. Uh, we live in a very nice condo. We can afford it. Um, he's dreaming of plans of buying a single family home out in the suburbs. Don't necessarily agree with that. I think that we're fine where we are. Maybe get you know another condo somewhere. But um, to me, satisfaction or success even is not necessarily defined by uh, the monetary rewards. As long as I can live and you know the two of us can be remotely comfortable, um, I think that that's satisfied. And if if you know that's that's middle class satisfaction. I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm not, I know I'm never going to be, um, you know, Howard Carter or, you know, any other great archaeologist. Uh, that's not what I want. So for me, it was a very early decision in my academic career to know exactly what I want and to exactly know what I don't want. Um, I don't want a single family home in the suburbs. So Jen, they're, just, they're okay. Uh, well, they're okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not dissing anybody who has one or who has a family or kids. I'm just saying it's just not for me. Uh, I wanted to get to Barbara's question now that we just have a couple minutes left. So that's all right. Go ahead. Actually, Barbara. what I wanted to say, because there's a thread from very things people have said, you know, don't get the PhD. Well, those of you who know me from my time in Jordan, even though my dissertation was on cylinder seals of Syria, I would never have gotten that job to work in Jordan without that dissertation. And right. for those 14 years, I had the opportunity to mentor lots of people and to engage in things beyond just academia. And unfortunately, I had to have the PhD. So saying to people, don't get it. But I also did have a backup plan. I mean, I actually, while I worked on it for 25 years, I worked at a law firm. I did this, I did that. I was actually teaching. So to, I would say Brian's point, not having kids, is an advantage because you don't have that same pressure, uh, I will admit. So it's sort of a luxury to finish, but to make sure that people are realistic about what they want out of it is really what I think you're all saying, is right. that you have to know what choices you're making in life to make it happen. Thank you. Well, and, and as anthropology and archeology, span I can't speak for the linguists, but as anthropology and archeology span become more and more applied, um, to be at the top level of those fields, if you want to run and ha handle a CRM firm, or if you want to be a consultant and get large grants from the federal government to study healthcare or education or anything else, that calling card of having a PhD makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, if Depending on what other paths you might take, if you're a middle person at one of those uh, applied anthropology consulting firms or you're a, a, a crew chief on a CRM project, you don't need one. But if you if you want to be on at the top of those fields, you do need one in order to be able to get the legitimacy in order to, for people to take you seriously. Do we have uh, one more question from Abby? Oh. I think that might be the end. Yeah, go ahead, Abby. Okay, it wasn't really a question. Um, I was going to say that in answer to the original question of how to, of, or an, an original question of how do you deal with having two very different things going on, I, I think we we tend to, with academia or with graduate school, you, you get so enmeshed in it that that takes over your whole life and all of your interest and and you kind of expect that from what you do. And, and one option is to just have a day job that uh, you don't take home with you or, be a, a high school teacher and have a couple of months off in the summer and go do interesting and, and intellectual things then and re-energize your brain for the rest of the year and, and just have by having very separate things, but one of them being very time defined, then you can do what you want intellectually with the rest of your time. And, and that's, that's its own kind of freedom, I would guess. Thanks, that's a great point. 
and we're just about at time, maybe even a little over time. So I want to thank everyone very much for this. This is a great conversation, and I appreciate all the presenters and other participants who are here today for your time. So thanks very much, you all, and on to the next. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm going to step up now, and we're going to say goodbye for today. Thank you everyone for all of your wonderful participation today throughout the day, um, this wonderful discussion we just had now and all of the wonderful presentations we had today. And we look forward to seeing you back again tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, have a good night. All right, thank you, good night. Thank you, take care, thanks very much.